Hello, everyone. Welcome to the course, Introduction to SQL. And this is the first session of the course. It's an introduction to the course content, instructor, and uh, some of the prerequisites. So when students come to Udemy, they generally have a lot of questions. With so many class to choose from, which one is right for me? Does it have the right content I want to learn? Do I have the required prerequisites to take the course? And this lecture is aimed to answer these questions so that you can make better decisions on the course, whether you want to choose it or not. So let's talk about the course content first. Why SQL? And the answer is simply because it's popular. What you are seeing is the data set from Indeed, the job seeking set. From 2015 to 2019, the top 10 tech skills seeked by employers. And guess which one is number one? Of course, it's SQL. You can see that. And recent years, is a popular. Python is popular. AWS popular. And Java has been popular as the de facto computer language. And look at the, the difference between SQL and these languages. SQL is steadily the first. And SQL has been number one skill for a long time, even before 2015. And just a matter of fact, in all of computer languages created or invented in the 1970s, SQL is the only one that is still in popular demand. You have probably heard about something like Fortune or Cobo. All these are SQLs uh, uh, that were created at the same time, around the same time as SQL. And nobody is using that. Uh, that's not the right word, but uh, only a handful of people are still using those. But SQL is still in mainstream and still popular and strong. And in the foreseeable future, SQL is still strong. So that's why we want to take this course for introduction to SQL, the data foundation. Something about an instructor, which is my, me myself. I'm a long time data warrior. I have been in the data management and the data engineering field for more than 20 years. Um, I started as a report and the ETL developer, then gradually becomes a data architect and the data project lead. I received a master's degree from Virginia Tech in computer science. Currently, I'm also serving as a junk professor in Columbia University and the City University of New York and other institutes. So I teach introduction to relational database and SQL, which is the same course in both universities to undergraduate students and to graduate students which happens to be the target audience of this course too. I would expect you to be the equivalent of a second year or third year undergraduate student of a computer science subject area, or can be a graduate student that's seeking for, let us outside computer science area, but seeking for knowledge of a relational database and SQL. For example, those students I have, generally come from a statistics or analytics domain. And in recent years, a lot of uh, data science students will also take the SQL course too. And also you can be a professional who just want to know better about relational database and SQL. So all these are po po potential students of this course. And of course it's up to you, but the one thing in common no prior SQL relational database knowledge required. And talking about the course content, we are going to go through quickly the relational database definition, the relational model, entity relationship model, and normalizations. This brief introduction laid the foundation of SQL and tells us why sometimes SQL behaves like this or like that, why SQL is defined this way all because of the relational model that is the underlying the founding stone for SQL. And then the bulk of the content is in SQL, the structured query language, 
we will go use the Oracle Live SQL as a practicing environment. And uh, in some of the lectures, we are also going to provide PostgreSQL instructions to tell you the difference between Postgres and Oracle. However, the SQL introduced in, the, in this course is the NC standard SQL. So whatever you learn here, the majority of that is portable to any relational database platform, including Postgres SQL, including MySQL, SQL Server, and some others. All right, this is so much is for the course content. If you, after this session, you feel this course is right for you, just go ahead to the next, next lecture. I will see you there. Okay, let's start to talk about introduction to relational database. So what is a database? The Wikipedia definition of database is an organized collection of data, generally stored and accessed electronically from a computer system. So there are two parts to this definition. The first part is an organized collection of data. It's a place to store data. This is the most important part. And the second part, it says it's generally stored and accessed elect electronically. Modern day databases are all electronic. So as far as data is concerned, what you are looking at is a piece of census file, which is from late New Kingdom of uh, ancient Egyptian time. It's about 1000 year BC. So ever since the very beginning of civilization, we human beings have been using data a lot. Like in this census file, it's basically a list of houses and their owners. Someone wrote this down on a piece of papyrus, and someone else collect this, deliver that to the pharaoh's archive. And apparently this pharaoh's archive is a place to store and organize the storage of data, which is one of the ancient databases. Of course, there's another the part of the definition that the, mod, that the modern databases are electronic. And this is one of the earliest data processing system, the IBM 1790, which was uh, developed in December 1959. These are one, this is one of the earliest data processing system. And ever since then, we have been facing the same challenge again and again over and over. The challenge is how to present the data sets the real, real world data sets in a computer. If you think you have a piece of papyrus with house, the house owner and their the house and their count of their cattle, how to store that? Modern data is definitely com more complex and larger than these collections of papyrus. We have to use a formal design and modeling technique to better present this data sets in our system. So before 1970s, it was a pretty much a trial and error time. We used a file system for data storage, but there's a lot of problem with this uh, approach. There's basically no clear definitions, no clear relationships between files. It's hard to manage. I personally work on some conversions of those uh, existing legacy file system into modern database. And it's uh, really a pain to go through the definition of each file and the record because for those, uh, for those uh, systems, there's no clear definition or distinction between each file and the rec records it contain. The same file can contain different uh, de definitions, different records. And uh, it's a layered la and a layered approach. So it's a hard to manage, hard to develop, and hard to maintain. Also, this file system approach causes data duplication. And sometimes the, because there's no dependency defined, clearly defined, it causes data loss. And also there are security concerns <coughs> around this uh, file system approach. So in 1970, Dr. Edgar Foucault 
from IBM proposed the relational model, which has two points. One, even the most complex data sets can be represented as relations. And two, relations are operated through relational algebra. So basically what, it, uh, what he proposed is a mathematical model, a mathematical layer between the real world problems and the computer implementations. We don't, we, we need no longer arbitrarily lay, create file and dump data in. Instead, there will be a formal process of identifying real world entities, uh, real world relations, put this into a mathematical model and use this uh, mathematical in between to create a database system. Why this is important? Because relational model can be systematically, consistently, and logically represented in databases. It has a mathematical theory behind it, which is the relational algebra. It's simple to develop and implement. It's consistent in results across different platforms. And it can be applied to almost all business scenarios. So database that is based on Dr. Cox's relational model is called relational database. They organize data into one or more tables or relations of columns and the rows. And ever since Dr. Cox raised this, uh, created this uh, relational model, 90% or even say 99% of the databases invented was a, a relational model, a relational database. Most commercial or open source database system today are relational. Some of you have already heard some of those names, like for commercial database systems, like Oracle, SQL Server. For open source systems, like MySQL and Postgres. All these are very popular. And this class is all about relational database. We will go into through the definition of relational database. We're going to give a brief introduction on how to design a relational database. Then we will talk about the main tool of relational database operation, which happens to be SQL. Talking about relational database design, how to create a relational database? We already said relational model contain, uh, is a mathematical layer in between real world and the database and the, the computer implementation of database. So there are two arrows here. We need to map relation, uh, real world into relational model. Then we need to map relational model to database. Accordingly, there are two steps in the relational database design. The first design is a logical design. Through a systematic process of database modeling, we map real world questions into a logical model, which contains a collection of relations. The result is a logical model. The second step is physical design. We will map the relations in a logical model into database objects such as tables. The result is a physical model. We will go through this, uh, the, these two design steps in the next few lectures. I will see you in next lecture where we will talk about logical design. In this lecture, we are going to go through the steps of logical design and in particular, we are going to talk about entity relationship model, which is the design method we use for logical design. So what is entity relationship model? It's the most popular logical design model of uh, relational design. It's an enhancement on the general relational model. It divides relations into two categories, entity and the relationship. It defines how entities and the relationships interact with each other. It provides a systematic way of mapping real world objects into an entity relationship model. 
So what is the entity? Entity is a noun. Basically, anything existing in this world that you describe using a noun, it can be a person, a place, a thing, or event. For example, student is an entity. A course is an entity. An instructor is an entity. Or like a wedding event, it can be an entity. Some place, like classroom, can be a place, can be an entity. Each entity contains the attributes. It's a, each entity basically have a properties of their own, and these properties are called attributes. For example, a student can have an ID, can have a name, can have a date of birth, can have an address. A course can also have an ID at the name, like introduction to SQL. It can belong to a department, to a computer science department. It can have a location, whether it's in a certain room of a certain building or it's online. So all these are entities and their attributes. However, we of course cannot draw a picture of entities every time we mention that. So what we created is a, a shorthand representation of each entity. In this case, we will just put entity name first, followed by parentheses, and we put their attributes inside of this parentheses. For example, a student, a student in the shorthand representation will start with the name student. And then in the parentheses, we are going to put all their attributes, name, ID, date of birth, and address. Similarly for course, it will be course starting with the name. Then in the parentheses, we have ID, name, department, and location. One thing to note here is there are different attributes that have the same name in different entity. For example, name. Students have a name, course have a name. How do we distinguish them? The way we distinguish them is by adding the entity name in front with a period. So it will be student.name or course.name, which will tell us which attribute we're referring to. This is called qualified representation. So, so much this is for entity shorthand representation. Now, <clears throat> talking about relationship, what is a relationship? Relationship is the association between entities. It usually is a verb. Whatever you can use verb in the real world, it can be described as a relationship. For example, registration. A student register a course. So in this case, it will be a relationship between student and the course, and the name is registration. So we will put registration as the relationship name and use a parenthesis to enclose the two entities to signify that this uh, relationship of registration is the relationship between student and course. Of course, as you look at this, uh, the previous example, the shorthand representation of this relationship, you will notice we put all attributes of both entities in the relationship. But then the question is, do we need all these attributes of an entity, uh, entity in the relationship definition? How many attributes do we need? For example, do we need a student date of birth in the registration? Is the student going to change his or her date of birth just because he or, uh, he or she registered in my course? The answer, of course, is no. Date of birth is something belongs to a student. It does not belong to registration. Then how do we better represent this entity inside the relationship. We only need a, a handful, a small set, a subset of the attributes when we represent each entity 
either in the relationship or in somewhere else, right? So the question becomes, how to identify an entity instance? How many attributes do we need to represent an entity? That's a topic, that's a very key topic that we are going to cover next. It's called functional dependency. <clears throat> it's, it defines the relationships between attributes. So X, attribute X, we call it functional dependent on Y if and only if each X value is associated with precisely one Y value. For example, <clears throat> ID is functional dependent on name. <clears throat> we have a student ID and then immediately go into the school registrar, you will know the student name, right? However, if you know the student name, given that student may have, uh, multiple students may have the same name, you may not know which ID you should use, right? So if you have some student called Eric, do you know the ID? You probably will get two or three in your department. That's not a function dependence. And then on the other hand, we have the function de determination, which means whatever column will determine the other. It's a similar idea, just a different direction. So we talk about candidate key. What is a candidate key? If a set of attributes can functionally determine all attributes in the relation, this set of attributes functionally de determines the relation. What does that mean? For example, if you have student ID, do you know student name? Yes, you do. How about date of birth? And how about address? And in normal situation, you would say yes and yes to all these questions. Fundamentally, as long as you know student ID, you know everything about the student. And that means <clears throat> if you have a student ID column, you will know the whole entire entity of student. In this case, we call this set of attributes the key of this relation. So student ID is the key of student. And also, you can have multiple attributes in the key. For example, in most cases, you need to use the combination of state and your driver license number if you ever need to use that as a key. In this case, both attributes form a set of attributes, and this set of attributes, of two attributes, becomes a key. So the definition of candidate key is set of attributes such that the relation is functional dependent on this set of key attributes, which makes sense, right? And the second one is what we call the minimum rule. There is no subset of the attributes for which one holds, which means if you give me a set of multiple uh, attributes as a key, all these attributes are necessary. A quick example is you can have student ID and student name. And because ID already determines everything, the combination of ID and name will, of course, indeed also determines everything. But here, name is not necessary. You only need ID. So the combination of ID and the name, although it can functionally dependent on, on the, uh, although it can functionally determine the relationship, the relation, you don't necessarily need it to be the candidate key because name is optional. Only when you have the minimum set of that column ID, that becomes a candidate key. So we're talking about a primary key. It is, if you haven't heard this before, you will hear that a lot when you're handling SQL and the relational database. Primary key is basically the best candidate key. And this definition is based on assumption that there are, might be many different candidate keys. For example, to identify a student, 
you can use a student ID. You can also use his or her social security number and uh, use a name plus address. Usually, the same address, in the same address, you won't have two people with the same name. So name plus address can also functionally determines that student. But all these candidate keys are not created equal. For example, address. The problem with the name address is they are all characters, they are all text strings, and they are very error prone. How many times did you make a mistake in typing your address or even your own name when you submit a web ordering form? I know I'm guilty of that. I always type in something wrong. And because of this, name and address is not the best, best thing to use as a key. ID is much easier. So is social security number. And in fact, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, most of the government agency and the financial institute like insurance companies, they do use social security number as a primary key of their record. However, in recent years, with all these uh, internet breaching security thing and all the privacy concerns, concerns as well as all the legislations, people are steering away from using social security number and trying to use a random key instead of a social security number. Social security number right now is only used where it's absolutely you have to. An example is at the list here, Hicken versus MBI. So basically these two are two ID columns used by the US government's uh, CMS, Center of Medicare Service. It's basically the, <coughs> basically the uh, federal agency taking care of all the Medicare stuff. They used to have a ID column called Hicken, which is a social security number plus two digit. So if you see this Hicken, you will immediately know the first nine digit is the patient or my member's social security number. So because of this, this is actually considered a serious security concern because if I got your paperwork, I will be able to know your SSN just by snitching into your mailbox. So Hicken, uh, so CMS later on start to move away from Hicken and to uh, MPI, which is a randomly generated string to represent each member. You can Google this uh, Hicken versus MPI and get some interesting insight into it. So it's, this is the primary key, how we choose primary key, <coughs> and we usually use ID. And the way we represent this primary key <coughs> is to use underscore in a shorthand representation. Like here, we have a student and we have ID underscore, and of course, ID underscore, which signifies these are the primary key of an uh, entity. Sometimes when you do your ho homework or in your uh, in SQL preparation, you use a text file and it's not possible to do underscoring a text file. In this case, a commonly accepted solution is to use a star to enclose the attribute. There will be student star ID star, and this will signify this is the primary key. And let's go back to, you know, with all this uh, attribute uh, functional dependency and the uh, key definition, let's go back to relationship. How do we represent the relationship? Relationship is created when you're putting two entities together, right? We, put the, we get to back to this point again. And now that we know each entity is represented by its key, you can use the primary keys of both entities in the relationship and the re primary keys only to define this relationship. For example, in this registration example, because it comes from the relationship between student and the course, you only need to put the primary keys of student and course, which is registration, student ID, and course ID. 
the combination of these primary keys automatically become the primary key of the relationship. So that for in this uh, relation uh, registrations case, the combination of student ID and the course ID forms the primary key of this registration. And the re re relationships can also have its own attributes. For example, registration can have a registration ID, can have a staff name, whoever did the registration and the registration date and possibly a deposit. These are called descriptive attributes or relationship attributes, but they are not the primary key. The primary key should be and only should be the course, the primary keys of all the entities. So once we are able to identify a relationship and represent it in the shorthand representation and putting entities together, how are these entities related to each other? And this is actually defines the type of relationships. For example, department and course. In all the school I've been into, each course only belongs to one department. I never seen any course belongs to different uh, multiple departments at the same time. So course, each course has only one department, but each department of course have a lot of courses. In this case, we call them the relationship one to many. One department have many courses. And it sometimes the extreme of one to many is one to one. For example, like in the US, each state have one and only one state capital. And each state capital only belongs to one state. There's no state capital that becomes the, the capital of both of two states or more. So this is one to one. And of course you will start asking, is there many to many? And uh, we just go through this, the registration. In the registration, a student can register multiple courses and the multiple courses will have, uh, each courses will have multiple students. Like uh, introduction to SQL can have general, usually uh, when I teach it will be 20 students to, to 30 students. That's the class, at least I hope so. I hope uh, that there's at least one student attending the course, right? So this is many to many. But then how is relationship determined? How do I know whether this is one to many or one to one or many to many? The answer is you need to go to the business, go to actually how it works in real world and do some business research. Then you need to go to do some data discovery. For example, in the state, state capital is a case. Anyone have uh, some certain kind of uh, education in the US, you pretty much know all 50 states and you know their capital. So you know it's a one-to-one -one based on your, your knowledge. But that's because the data is relatively small and uh, it has a finite number. What if uh, it's a state uh, student and course one? Then you need to start a business, uh, business and make an understanding of how it works. And then you go to the data, get a small sample set, analyze this, and the determine it's this many to many, confirm it's many to many. This process is called data discovery. And um, last thing about the, uh, in, this, uh, in this lecture is uh, the distinction between relation and the relationship. It's a very confusing topic because the name is similar and uh, they are usually used in, in the same context. So they have a similar name, but meaning is different. So when students start learning, this is one of the things that they always get confused about. And I won't blame you if you do the same, you feel the same way right now. But remember, relationship is just one type of relation. Relations includes both entity and the relationship. Entity relationship model is a refined version of relational model. It's an enhanced version. It has more rules, more distinction, but entity and the relationship are two particular types of relation. And the 
Relationship and relation are two different things. Of course, because entity relationship model is probably the most popular relational model, we will talk a lot about relationships. And you need to know relationship is a type of relation. It signifies, it defines the interaction between entities, which is another type of relation. Hope this makes sense. And uh, I will see you in next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to go through physical design of a relational database and show you a quick example. So the physical design as a second step in the relational database design is a relational modeling process and it's not related to entity relationship model. Let me repeat this again. Physical design is a second step in a relational database design. It's not related to entity relationship model. It's a relational model process. But because entity and the relationships, both of them are relations, so they follow the same design process. We just do not make distinction between entity and the relationship in this step. It will be the same design principle applied to other non-entity relation models, if there's any. But still, because entity relationship model is the most popular relational model, we will not talk about other models in the class. So how do we map relation in relational DB? Once you have completed the logical design, you have a series of relations, being it entity or relationship. You want to map them into objects in a relational, a relational database. Relational database by its name is designed to best represent a relational model. So they are designed to have a series of two dimensional tables. Relations in the re relational model are directly mapped to each two dimensional tables. And each distinct instance of a relation becomes a row in the table. For example, the entity student is a relation. It will, will be mapped to a table called something like student or students or student table. Each student, the information of each student, ID, name, these things will be mapped into one row in the table. And the attribute of the relation, for example, ID or name, will become the column of the rows. And if you imagine a two-dimensional table, something similar to an Excel spreadsheet, you will foresee, you, will can, you can see some rows and columns in this table definition. And each row represents a distinct instance of the relation, uh, each student, and each column represents an attribute of the relation, like a student ID and student name. All tables are two-dimensional. All tables are sets of rows with the same columns. Remember this, it's the same column across different rows. Different rows have the same column structure. Each row must be unique because duplications will provide no new information. And each column has its own name and the data type and is the same across all rows. So for entity, one entity is mapped to each table. And then attributes, as we talked about, are columns. It will be student, for example, in the student table, we should foresee to have student ID, student name, date of birth, etc., etc. whatever you define in the entity. For relationship, there's also one relationship per table. Remember, each table is a relation, and because entity and the relationships are both entity, uh, both relations, each entity, each relationship will be mapped into a table. And uh, we talk about primary keys. The primary key about relationship is the combination of primary keys of all the entities in this relationship. 
So what will be the relationship columns? It will be the keys, the primary keys of the entities. And also we will have the relationship attribute, the dis descriptive attributes. Now one exception is that if it's a one-to-many relationship, they can usually be merged into functional dependent entity table. For example, there's a relationship between department and the, and the course. But if you have a department ID with a, teach, with a course ID, usually you can push the department ID column into the course table. So the course table will have a department ID, which in fact is a relationship between course and department. But because it's one too many relationships, we usually just merge them. So I will just briefly mention it here, and we will not talk about this anymore. But once you are, when you are doing advanced SQL, uh, database design, this is some consideration you will run into. And each column has data type. The data type de defines what value the column can hold. It can be integer, it can be decimal, or text or date. And the difference between integer and the decimal is decimal contains decimal points. Integer, of course, is just a whole number. So let's quickly go through an example of relational database. This is PG admin, which is uh, stands for Postgres admin. It is a relatively full scale management tool for a relational database. The relational database here is a Postgres SQL. And uh, as I show you the dashboard, you can see it can sense information like uh, server sessions, tuples in, tuples out, block in, in out. Although you may not know what it exactly means, you can pretty much guess that means some data, data flowing in and out, uh, hardware and software ish considerations. So this is, uh, like I said, it's a full blown, full scale management tool. It's way too advanced and it's complex and it's a database specific. For these reasons, we will not cover them in this course. What we are concerned about is just in showing you what the relational database may look like. So in this relational database, what we call test data, you can see there are a whole bunch of tables. We already defined course, instructor, student. For example, if we opened up course and have columns, defined as ID, name, instructor name, tuition, right? We can also view the data. So that's how this table or how this entity is stored. The course entity is mapped to the course table, which have four columns. Each column is an attribute. The ID, which is the primary key. It's a name, a course name. It has an instructor's name, and it has its tuition. Tuition is uh, apparently a number, a, a numeric value. So it also happens to have four rows. Each row is a course, uh, like instruction tool of force taught by Obi-Wan Kenobi, and uh, possibly a throw choking 101 from Darth Sidious. So all these are the, uh, how you map an entity or similarly a relationship into a relational database table. And from here, you also see there are much more in the relationship uh, database, which we are not going to be covering in this course. But if you take advanced database design or specific database management class, you will learn. So much for this course, for this lecture. I will see you in next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to talk about normalization. So we have talked about logical design and the physical design. 
we have a talk about how to design a relational database. But uh, just as in any other design, there are good designs, bad designs, and ugly designs. And based on my 20 plus years of uh, database man data management practice, I can, I can confidently say bad designs can happen, do happen, and will always happen. And they happen a lot. Why do we don't like bad design? Because bad designs make it difficult to use the database and increase the, the cost of usage and ownership. So improving bad design is a highly skilled and well-paid job. It's called data architect. If you want to take on this highly skilled and well-paid job, you'd better learn this normal, normalization process really well. Let's give an example of the bad design. We have an invoice, a student registration form from a company called Data Force Academy from a galaxy far, far away. And you can see this is a regular everyday registration form. You have the student ID and name, his address, invoice number, date, uh, and date. And for this particular registration, you have a course ID and name listed. For each course, you have a course ID, name, instructor, and tuition. A quick way, quick and dirty, and really dirty way of designing this design, uh, this database, is to put every information from this registration form into one table. And that's what you get. You get, uh, Student name, address, city, all this information, registration related information into one row. But for this particular registration, as there are multiple co uh, courses, you put them into repeating groups like this one and two for each registration. For each registration, you have multiple courses. And the way we write this in shorthand representation is by use of parentheses inside the entity. This course information in parentheses is inside registration and it's repeating. The issue with this design, while I'm cleaning up, is that Oh, actually two issues. The first issue is called repeating groups and the other is called duplication of information. So the rows containing repeating groups, each registration have multiple courses. Why this is an issue? Because as we talked about relationship, <clears throat> about the relational modeling, each relation each repeating group is a sub relation inside a relation. So every time you process the registration relation, you need to do further processing. You need to go into each sub relation and handle that as it, as it is another relation. It's not an atomic instance of relation anymore. Thus, it loses the fundamental advantage of relational modeling. It's not a relational modeling anymore. That's the issue with repeating group. It's uh, fundamentally wrong, fundamentally de deviate away from relational modeling. Another issue is duplicated data. So you see here, for the same student, we have address and the city and the state and zip. We can also have another registration here for if we have this for the same, same student, Luke Skywalker, then the address, the city, the state, and the zip will all be the same. This is the repeating of information. Why this is a problem? Because in this case, 
the same operation must be performed in multiple locations. If Luke moved to like, Yoda's house, Dagoba, then we need to update this address for each and every row. And in this case, it's just one table, so it's relatively simple. But in the real world, the same information can be spread out to different tables. If you want to update all of them, that's a performance hit. And if you forgot, if you forget to update one of them, then there will be data inconsistency. So wherever you are reading the data, it becomes, it will affect the result of your data. We handle these two issues by going through a process called normalization. Normalization is the process of structuring a relational database in accordance with a series of so-called normal forms in order to reduce data redundancy and improve data integrity. Now let's explain this in, the, in a little bit further. Normalization is based on normal forms. There are a whole set of uh, six to eight normal forms. Exactly how many depends on how you count. These normalization forms, each of them is a rule in which if a table meets the rule, and it will achieve a certain level of desired property. Multiple levels of normal form exist. A higher level of database normalization cannot be achieved unless the previous levels have been satisfied. I know it's a little bit uh, too abstract, but think about normalization, normal forms as a rule, as a letters of rules that you have to climb one step at a time. You become first normal form, uh, first normal form compliant. It will give you certain prior, certain property that your data is not as bad. And as you go further, go to second normal form, you will achieve another set of properties that your data becomes cleaner and cleaner. Eventually, there are like six normal forms that you can do, but usually third normal form or a, ver a variation of third normal form, which is BCNF, they are good enough for real world applications. And that's what we are going to teach in this class. Anything beyond BCNF, we're not going to talk. So normalization is generally achieved by decomposition. Decomposition is the process of breaking up or dividing a single relation into two or more. The reasoning is as the relation has fewer columns, its functional dependency becomes simpler to handle and thus we can avoid some of the complexity and the redundancy caused by these uh, complex dependencies. We were starting from first normal form, decompose the, uh, uh, the relation into first normal form compliant. Then we can work on this to achieve second normal form, then third normal form. In next lecture, we're going to go through the process and I'll see you there. In this lecture, we're going to talk about normalization forms Basically, it's a process how to do normalization using normal forms one by one. So let's start by talking about the issue we discussed on the original table. We are going to use the same table we, 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 we demoed in last uh, lecture, the Data Force Academy registration form. And we talked about the issue with the repeating group that we have multiple courses in the same registration. Now, <clears throat> first normal form is a rule set up to ensure tables does not have repeating group. And what it says is the value in each column of table must be atomic. For example, in the previous example, the course name, introduction to the force, and the moisture farming 101 
there are two course names in this registration. So this column is not atomic. That breaks first normal form. What can we do now? We do that by decomposition. We will break up the break and repeating group by breaking the groups into separate rows. Each repeating group will be a separate row. But the new primary key will be the original primary key plus the embedded entity's primary key. So this example, registration, originally we have a student ID or student name, and we have a course, and we also have a registration, then we will break it up. We will break the parentheses. Let me, do, let me try to mark it. So we have this repeating group, which is here. We will break each course into a separate row. So that here, there's no more parentheses. There's no more parentheses in here. Of course, this parenthesis is actually the, the one for registration. But we break course out, and for the new table, the student name is the original key and plus the key for the repeating group. The combination of these two attributes are the new primary key for this entity. Once you achieve these, you will have an atomic value. You have an atomic value in each row for this column. Make sense? Okay, let me clean up these drawings again. And uh, let's go to the next page. Let's talk about partial dependency. What if the primary key is a combination of columns? Just like the one we have is student name and course name. These two are the primary key. So it's a combo, combo key, but then some columns are only dependent on one of the columns, like it shows here. Address. City, that's a repeating group we talked, uh, that's the redundancy data we talked about. All these four columns are dependent on still name. They are not dependent on course name. Meanwhile, instructor name and tuition are functionally dependent on course name. They have nothing to do with student. Whether the student is a Luke Skywalker or they are, the instructor will be the same, the tuition will be the same. This is what we call partial dependency. Some columns are functional dependent on one part of the key, not the whole key. So the issue is they are repeating for each row of that student. So here, we see the repeating group with the redundancy caused by partial dependency. How do we handle that? We use second normal form to handle that. In second normal form, first of all, you must be in first normal form. And then every non-key attribute must depend on the whole key, not just the part of it. Based on the example, I think, I believe you should uh, have a good understanding of that. And of course, because it's determined by part of a key and whole key, if your key is already one single column and the first normal form, then it's automatically a second normal form. Then how do we, uh, how do we make sure a table is uh, in second normal form? We decompose, we decompose it by breaking up the partial key and its dependency into another relation. So, but the key columns still must remain in the original table. So what's happening here is, we have this course and its re 
dependencies. We also have the student and its dependencies. We break this student and dependency into a separate table, thus removing the functional dependent, the partial dependency, as well as course into a separate table, removing this partial dependency. But in the original table, after these address fields and the instructor fields are gone, we still need to keep the student name and the course name, which is the original primary key. By removing the partial dependency, this table, these three tables now achieve second normal form. So if you look from here, from a shorthand representation part, it used to be student name and a whole bunch of dependencies. course name and another two dependencies. And we break it out to course. We break it out to student. And uh, whatever remains in registration, student name, course name, which is the original key, primary key. So this is how we'll achieve second normal form. Now, how do we handle this type of uh, dependency? Let's say in course name, there's also another column called the instructor affiliation. For example, Obi-Wan Kenobi is a Jedi and Darcidius is a Sith. What if, what is the relationship between instructor and instructor affiliation? Apparently, instructor name will determine instructor's affiliation. And here, we have a function dependency between course name and instructor. We have another dependency between instructor's name and instructor's affiliation. The second functional dependency, which is dependent on a non-key column, is called transitive functional dependency. The issue is apparently you can see here that the word Jedi repeats itself for every time that Obi-Wan Kenobi is showing up. And that's why, that's what we need to get rid of by applying third normal form. Third normal form, for a table to achieve third normal form, it must be in second form, normal form first. And then it has no transitive dependency. In this case, we will decompose by breaking up transitive key and its dependency into another relation. But the transitive column must still remain in the original table. So this is how we do it. We have instructor and just name and affiliation, which is the transitive dependency. We break it out as its own table, but the transitive column still must be remaining. By doing this, we have a third normal form compliant table. So here you can see that the original instructor, instructor affiliation goes to here. But the original course, course name plus the instructor is still there. That's how you do normal, third normal form. And when we talk about third normal form, a lot of times you will also hear something called boys called normal form. Boys called normal form is an enhancement of third normal form. The official definition is all non-trivial dependencies are on table key. 
triple here means it's self-referencing. And when will this happen? It will only happen when there are multiple candidate keys. There are multiple compound candidate keys. Each candidate key consists of two or more columns, and there are multiple uh, multiple com combination possibilities to form key. This is a very rare scenario. So boys called normal form address of this issue. And uh, if there are no compound candidate keys, or there are only one set of candidate keys, voice, normal, voice called normal form is equivalent to third normal form. So it's an enhancement of third normal form in a, to a particular scenario. We will use the term third normal form to reference both normal forms in this class. And it's actually the same convention in many, many other classes and the books. So we talked about the one, two, three, three normal forms. We talked about how to break up a bad design by using decomposition into a fairly well design. Let's quickly review what's the, what are these about. And if you want to remember that in the fast way, remember first normal form, each table has a key for all dependencies. There's no repeating group, it has a key. Second normal form says dependency is on a whole key. And third normal form says all dependencies are only on a key, not on some transitive column. So has a key, a whole key, only on a key. That's what these three normal forms are all about. That's how you break up a, a, a table or a relation into finer pieces. But sometimes you may want to combine relations into larger pieces. This process is the opposite of normalization and is called denormalization. One good example of denormalization is the address field. We all know in the regular address field, you should have a state, you have a zip. And uh, if you think about the relationship between zip and state, a zip can functionally determine the state, right? As long as you know the zip code, you will immediately be able to tell which state it is. It's a one too many. So if you want to, based on third normal form, then this is actually is a trans transitive dependency. <coughs> In the address, you should uh, just use a zip, and then you should create a zip state relational table which pointing to some state value for each zip. However, a regular, a common practice is still to put zip and state in the same address record. Just like uh, in any address table, you will still have address, city, state, and zip. There's no need to put state per se out. The reason are twofold. One, Denormalization, normalization may cause performance issue. If you, for each address, run a query to get a state based on zip, there will be a performance hit. And two, the other reason is that state and zip is a relatively smaller combination. You won't save much by creating this zip and state. The saving is small, but the cost may be bigger for each row. That's why we do a denormalization and it's a commonly accepted practice to have a zip state, both of them inside a address block. There are other reasons that you might want to do denormalization like in a data warehouse or in a NoSQL database. But these are all beyond the the topics covered in this course. So we will leave, leave them to you. If you're interested, feel free to go ahead and read some documentation on them. Otherwise, I will see you in next lecture. In this lecture,
we're going to talk about entity relationship diagram. Entity relationship is an easy and uh, clean way of designing a database. However, in a modern database, you constantly have hundreds, if not thousands of entities. And the relationships between these entities can be quite complex. So people have been always trying to find a better way to clearly present these entities and the relationships so that it's easier for user to use. One way is this what we call entity relationship model. It uses rectangle to represent entities and use the lines between rectangles to represent their relationship. And uh, in addition to rectangle and the line, we also use line style or line marker to represent the type of relationships, whether it's a one-to-one, -one, one to many many to many This idea was raised by Dr. Peter Chen in 1976, and that's what he shows in his program, in his uh, our, our presentation. You have uh, entity department, you have an entity employee. Their relationship is represented by a diamond in between them. And the type of a relationship is marked by the words here. So this is his original design of an entity relationship model, a diagram. And if we apply this diagram to our design, we will have a student rectangle, a course rectangle, a registration diamond in between, and uh, we will put the MNN or NNN here to represent that, to, to indicate this is a many-to-many -many relationship. And uh, we will put attributes of each entity and the relation into eclipses, circles connecting to this entity or relationship that it belongs to. So this is a clear representation of the relationship entity and the relationships we, that we have. However, it's also a little bit complex. There are too many objects flying on a diagram. So people have been working on simplifying, the different ways of simplifying this original diagram. One variant that we have is to put all the attributes inside the entity, the entity, the, the rectangle, like course ID, course name. They put it inside. And there are more further simplifications. For example, a very common way of doing this is called arrow diagram. It simplifies it further by removing the relationship diagram, uh, the diamond shaped. I use arrow to indicate relationship type, thus removing those one and n markers in the, arrow, uh, in the relationship lines. So here we have a student. Again, we have a student and we have a course. And this arrow indicates this is a many-to-many -many relationship. It's similar by like in the original diagram using a M and N. And here, one side there's an arrow, one side there's no arrow. So this is a one-to-many relationship. Now, be careful on the direction of arrows. Many books use this way to represent one to many. Some, like in our case, use the other way for one to many. And because both book, well, both, uh, both usage are in different books, it can be get really confusing. And that's why we are not going to use them in this course. What we are going to use in this course is what we call crawfoot diagram. It uses a crawfoot like this to indicate 
one to many relationship. So here, between student and the course, it will be many to many. Whereas in, between instructor and the course, it will be many and one, or the other way around is the one to many. So there's no confusion on that. And the, the one remaining part, that, so that's why we will use this diagram in our course. But there's one issue with relationship attributes. If there's some attribute for this relationship, for example, registration ID, you can actually insert a rectangle here and call it registration. Let me make it clear. You can put a rectangle here and uh, says that's the registration. And here, then here, in the, inside this registration, you can put attributes of this registration. So this is how we draw crawfoot, how, how we do this um, entity relationship diagram. Let's quickly do a demo. Clear that. Okay, so I'm bringing up a Microsoft Paint. If you want, you can definitely use other tools. There are many different tools like uh, Irwin or SQL Developer Modeler or Lucio Chart. They can all be used to creating ERD, the Entity Relationship Diagram. Um, in this case, it's because it's very simple. I'm just going to use a diagram, uh, a paint. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to create a rec uh, rectangle. Oops, I think I need to clean this up first. And I'm going to signify that I will do a text. The first one is student. I have a, somehow it's underlined. I don't need this to be underlined as this is actually the, the name of the, act, the entity, but I want to bold it. And uh, student ID, of course, is the key and the uh, student name. And this time I don't want it to be, on this because it's just a regular attribute. And I'm going to, put a uh, go back and uh, put a diagram and uh, by moving this inside this is the student entity now let's do another diagram which is course. I'm going to put course, and this one has to be bolded as the entity name, course ID, which is the primary key and need to be underlined, and course name, which is a regular attribute. Now let's draw relationship between them, it will be a line. And somehow I will also draw a crawfoot. Looks like uh, I have a flag. Certainly not the best best drawing in the world, but uh, I think you get the point. So this is the simplest the crawfoot you can have, and uh, just by keep on doing the same thing, 
you can expand expand this uh, <coughs> drawing over and over, and uh, there are easily many different uh, ER diagram samples online. You can look, take a look and see how they are drawn. All right, and this pretty much finishes our lecture on entity relationship and the relational model and entity relationship. Uh, starting next lecture, we are going to go inside SQL and uh, we will see you there. In this lecture, we are going to give an uh, introduction to SQL. So SQL is the abbreviate for Structured Query Language. It is the standard way of a relational database operation. It can create, maintain, and drop tables. It can insert, update, delete, and query table, the data from or to data table. It's descriptive, not procedural. It, unlike procedural language like Java or Python, it does not tell computer what to do. It tells computer what it wants. I want to get something. I want to get something done. But how to do that is up to computer. It has an ANSI standard. It's same across different vendors. So whatever we learn in this class, although we will use Oracle Live SQL as the environment, 99% will be applicable to other DBMS. There are two types of SQL statements. One is data definition language, also called DDL. Another is uh, called data manipulation language, DML. As the name suggests, the data definition language is uh, create, and drop, or alter table structure. The manipulation language is about data. It will insert data, delete data, update data, and the select data for your, for your reference. So these seven are the most important statements of SQL. Create, alter, insert, select, update, delete, and drop. We will cover each of them in the following lectures. We will use Oracle Live SQL for all demos. It's a lightweighted relational database, mostly based on Oracle and it's compatible with most databases. And we will note when there are differences. So let's talk about DBMS as we are going into the, we are getting to a point where we're talking about Oracle, which is uh, some kind of a data, database software vendor. And Oracle itself can also be referenced to a DBMS, database management system. The DBMS, is the software that interacts with end user applications and the database itself to capture and analyze data. So the key here is it's the software. One, it's a software. And two, it interacts between end user <coughs> applications and the database itself. And the database itself here means the data stored somewhere. Remember we talked about the definition of database it's a place to hold data. DBMS sits between this place of holding data and the user applications and bring data back and forth. So this is the architecture diagram. We have on top, uh, number one is a computer server hardware. And uh, DBMS itself is a software running on top of this hardware. Also, the database is also a storage on this hardware. So DBMS will read and write to this database. And meanwhile, you and me as user are sitting on in front of our computers using different software like Python application or analytical applications connecting to DBMS. DBMS sit between us and the computer server or database itself communicate 
between these two components. That's what DBMS does. I hope this explanation is clear enough. Let's go to the next page and talk about applying this idea to Oracle Live SQL. Oracle Live SQL is offered a free service offered by Oracle. Oracle runs a server in their Oracle Cloud, and the Oracle also provides the DBMS software running on their remote server. This part, these two parts, is completely Oracle. And the end user is you. You will use a web browser connecting to this DBMS and the run Oracle SQL. Whatever you need to run, Oracle will, DBMS will accept it and run it. That being said, how do we run this Oracle Live SQL? There are two tasks. First of all, you need to register with Oracle. And second, you will log in and run sample SQL to confirm the registration. So I'm bringing up a Google Chrome and I'm going to search Oracle Live SQL here. And Oracle Live SQL here, you can click on, click on this link, which will quickly which will bring in the login page. So this is the login page. And if you already set up an account, you can click on here, you can type in your username and password and sign in. If you don't have an Oracle account, you can create an account. Let me click on the create account button first, show you how to register. So the create account page is up. You need to enter just like uh, many other web registration form. You need to enter your email address, password, country, a series of questions. Once you enter and you click on create account, in a while you will receive Oracle's uh, registration form, uh, registration email, where you need to verify your account and the login insight which I believe all of you are familiar with, and I'm going to skip this part. I already created my own Oracle Live SQL account, so I'm going to log in, and I'm going to show you the interface. So this is the Oracle Live SQL interface. Once you get inside, maybe you are on home page. You can click on SQL worksheet right here. right here, make it more obvious. This SQL worksheet, you'll click here, and uh, it will bring you to the SQL execution page. Then we quickly type in some SQL. You don't need to know, I will cover what it means later on, but it's just how it works here. ID int. And you can click on actions. and then you can run from here. That's how you run the SQL. <clears throat> now, once you are able to run the SQL, we can, we, we, we will base all our discussion later on on this Oracle Live SQL. And uh, from here, we will see you in next next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to give an introduction to PostgreSQL and uh, provide you with a brief on how to install it on your local machine. Um, the reason I bring up PostgreSQL is because we have, um, I have a multiple classes. I'm teaching the same courses to different students. Um, in, in several of the classes, I use Oracle, Oracle Live SQL and in some of them, I use PostgreSQL. It depends on school policy and, uh, uh, and basically whatever is available from the school. 
I use Oracle Live SQL in the whole teaching because it's easier and it's simpler. But for other students, they may be needing to use a PostgreSQL. So I will give a quick introduction on PostgreSQL, its architecture. In the next lecture, I will show you how to install PostgreSQL in your local machine and how to run the test sample SQL there. Uh, if you are not using Oracle, uh, if you are not using PostgreSQL, you can feel free to skip this part as well as the next lecture, which is the installation part. So we go through DBMS just now. Uh, what is in a DBMS? In particular for PostgreSQL, we are going to install the DBMS, the PostgreSQL service on your local machine. Your local machine is going to be the computer system hardware and the database is going to be stored on your hard drive. The DBMS, which you will install very soon, is the PostgreSQL service. And again, you are the user and you are going to use a series of applications, including your Python code to connect to this PostgreSQL service. PostgreSQL also provides you with an out-of-box tool, management tool and query tool called the PG Admin, which will help you a lot in, in, in running against PostgreSQL service. And next lecture, we're going to talk about how to install PostgreSQL on a local machine. And I will see you there. So let's talk about how to install PostgreSQL on your local machine. First of all, let's launch a Google Chrome and let's search for PostgreSQL download Windows. Of course, uh, I choose Windows because this is the local machine I have. If you have a Mac or Linux, you need to choose that accordingly. So now we have Windows installer, that's the one that I'm going to click on. Oh, let me clean up, clear. And now we need to choose the download the installer link. So once you get inside this page, there's a whole bunch of PostgreSQL versions with a supporting OS. And of course, the one that we are interested in is this. So I'm going to click here. It's loading and uh, I believe it's downloading right now, right here. Right here, it will take, oh, it's already done. I was about to say it will take a while to download, but this one is uh, pretty fast today. So let me, let's wait a little bit. Okay, it's almost done. Now let's show it in folder and kick off the execution. Let's run it. As you can see, it will take a while to launch, but uh, as long as the mouse is spinning, it's coming up. Now, it depends on your system. In Windows, sometimes it will ask you to install some Visual C++ runtime library first. In that case, just uh, agree, choose agree and install a component. Eventually, it will lead you to this, uh, the, oh, it's actually coming up here right now. I was not expecting that, but yeah, just uh, let it run, the Visual C++ component, and eventually it will lead me to the PostgreSQL setup screen. Okay, that's the screen that, uh, that we start from. We choose next, 
And these are the standards that we are going to use. And uh, here you can see there are multiple components. The first one, of course, is a PostgreSQL, it's server itself. This is the DBMS that we are going to use. The second one is PG Admin 4, which is the management tool that comes together with the PostgreSQL. And that's the one that we are going to use to interact with the PostgreSQL locally. And the second, the third and third, uh, then for stack builder and the command line tools, we're not going to use these in our, in our class, but uh, feel free to just, uh, keep them. And now let me get rid of this and let's start next. And you will be asked for a data. Data directory is where PostgreSQL stores its data, it's a database. And here you will be asked to provide a password for the database super user. Each database has a super user and by default is called Postgres. Um, here you are asking to provide a password for this Postgres SQL. Uh, because this is a demo, I'm going to just use Postgres. Postgres. Oops, I think I type it, make it a typo. Progress. Okay, now I'm going to go through and remember this super user's name and password are both Postgres. And port is uh, by default 5432. Use the default locale, all these are default and uh, you can go quickly go through the settings, make sure they're all correct. And now you can start installing. Okay, it started installing. I am going to pause the video and uh, I will be back when the installation is done. So the Postgres SQL installation is completed. Now here you will have a Stack Builder <coughs> set up a checkbox. You can feel free to keep it if you want to set up Stack Builder, but in this course we do not need it. So I'm going to uncheck it and click on finish. So once uh, we click finish, In the Postgres SQL part, Postgres SQL part, you can launch something called PG Admin 4. This is the management tool we are going to use to connect to Postgres SQL. Now, Postgres SQL itself, the DBMS, is already set up. It's uh, up and running in our local machine now. All we need to do is to connect to it, and this PG Admin is the tool to use. So it will take a while for PG Admin to launch for the first time. I'm going to pause this again until it finished the launching. Okay, so PG Admin 4 launching is completed. It basically launched a browser, a new tab in Chrome, and the point that to local machine, to local host, it's a 50131 port. And this is how we start running the administration part of uh, PostgreSQL. Now it is asking you for a master password. This password is for PG Admin, for the management tool. It's different from the password we, we entered when we set up super user. When we do the installation and set up super user Postgres, we, po we, we input a password Postgres for that user. And this one, the one currently we have, is the password <laughs> for PG Admin. For this purpose, we will set up a Postgres 2. We want to make sure it's the same so that it's easier for us to remember. Of course, I can do this only because this is the course. This is for, uh, there's no security requirement. In your own system, you'd better have some good password and make sure it's a protected right. I'm gonna click OK. No, I don't want to save it. And now you can see it's a regular object browser and uh, panel site. Click on Postgres. So this time, we need to enter the password for the user Postgres. 
this is the server user's password. So, but as I said, we choose the same, which is the Postgres, and we want to save the password. Okay. And you can see a lot of things here. All the administration stuff, all the administration management things, and login users, and table space. This is more for data storage. For uh, <coughs> All you can see here is for the database the DBMS management system, there's a lot of things to happening, but they are outside the scope of this course. We're going to ignore those, and only to create our own database here. We want to create a database. So right now you need to right click on the database and choose database, cre create database. And let's call it test data. And click on save. So now that we have this test data, again, right click on test data and choose query tool. You need to right click and choose query tool. Once query tool is up and running, we can do some quick SQL to make sure it's running perfectly. So I'm typing in a series of table uh, SQLs to make sure Postgres SQL is working properly. Let me start running. Table created. Let me insert into test values one. And I highlight and I run. Now let me do a select star from test. Highlight and uh, I probably haven't show you where, how to run. It is here. Once you highlight a SQL statement, click here and it will start running. Now let me run this select and it returns the proper value. And the drop table test. I will highlight it and again, I'm going to click on this button to run the SQL, drop SQL. And now it's dropped. So we can see the SQLs are running fine and the whole Postgres database is running perfectly in my machine. In this lecture, we will finally get into SQL, get hands wet, in by creating create and drop statements. As we talked about this at the beginning, relational database is all about two-dimensional table. All the entity relationships and the relations basically are mapped into two-dimensional table inside a relational database. So SQL operation is all about table manipulation and data manipulation where data stores in the table. And to, to make this happen, the first thing needs to be happening is to create a table. And of course you can reasonably imagine the last thing will happen in the SQL life cycle is to drop table. And these two are the things we are going to talk about in this lecture. So here is a quick sample of create statement. If we have an instructor a relationship or instruction table, where you have the instructor name as the, as the primary key and the instructor affiliation as the one of the attributes, when you translate this into create table, or should I say when you try to implement this shorthand representation in SQL, that's the SQL you are going to write. You are going to write create table instructors, instructor name with some kind of a data type. We talked about data type before and primary key. You need to define the primary key. 
So let's look at the syntax, the exact, exact syntax of create statement. It starts with the keyword create table and then followed by the table name. So here we have the create table instructors, then followed by parentheses. What's inside the parentheses is the table content. If you remove this part, the table content part of instructor, oops. if you remove the highlighted part, all you see is create table instructor parentheses. And then we will insert table content inside this parenthesis, which will include column definitions. It will come first. You have one column called instructor name. You have another col the column called inf instructor affiliation, followed by other table properties. And uh, the one that we are going to cover in this class is primary key. You will need to define the primary key, which is instructor name here. They are enclosed in parentheses and they are separated by comma, but there's no comma for last content. One thing I always see students, one issue I always see students make is that after the last content, they add a comma afterwards, which is wrong. And you do need commas in between different table contents. So this is the table, uh, table content definition. There are multiple ways of defining primary key. You can define the primary key as column constraint, constraint. So instead of writing primary key at the end, you can put create tables instructor. And for this instructor name, you add the primary key afterwards. This is useful when primary key have only one column. For single column primary key, you can directly after the primary key definition, after the primary key column name, and after the data type. But it has to be before the comma. So it's a between the data type and the comma. That's when you add primary key. Another issue I always see students making is they will define instructor name char and put a comma, then put primary key. That's wrong. A column definition is one integrated part. You need to write column name, data type. If it's primary key, add primary key. Remember there's a space in between and put a comma. Of course, if it's the last column, then no comma, like here. So this is for single column. You add the primary key directly afterwards. But if it's a multiple column, if a primary key is multiple column, or you simply want to, don't want to write the primary key after column name, you can define primary key as another part of table constraint. That has to be after all the column definitions. Column definitions comes first. As an after column definition, you add primary key, you put a parenthesis to enclose all the primary key columns inside. The order does not matter, but you need to include all of them. You need to include all the key columns, and there's this primary key ahead telling DBMS that you are defining the primary key. So let's repeat. In the create table statement, you do create, you write this keyword, create table first. You put a na table name, use parentheses to enclose table content. In the table content, you start with column names and their data types and separated by comma. Then you add this primary key constraint which has a parenthesis enclosing all the primary key columns. You need to define the columns first before you, you need to define the columns first before using them in the primary key call, uh, the definition. 
you do not put data type in this primary key definition. So <coughs> this is the table column, the table content definition. You can also use this constraint for single column primary key. In that case, you just put a primary key, parenthesis, key, and parenthesis, in, uh, close parenthesis. But if you are doing a multi-column primary key, you must use this syntax, putting primary key as a last, uh, right after the column definition. And remember, there's no comma after this. Common mistakes. For multi-column primary key, a lot of students put two primary key column constraints. Like here, ID1 primary key, ID2 primary key. This is wrong. Another common mistake I already talked about, adding a primary key, adding a comma after the last table content. And another one, yet another one, for single prime, uh, single column primary key, put a comma somewhere in between, or put a primary key in front. Basically, a bunch of issues with where you place different components. It will be table name, column name, data type, primary key, if any, then comma. We will use some examples and hands-on sessions to help you understand. But now, <coughs> let's talk about in general, how do you convert shorthand representation to create statement? If you already have a shorthand representation, remember the table name will be relationship name. So you will use entity or relationship name as table name. Then you will use attribute name as column name, as in each column definition. Each attribute is one column. Of course, you need to add the data type to each column. And uh, finally, you add primary key constraint to either primary key columns or the primary key definition at the end of uh, table definition, table content definition. And uh, do remember to add comma to the end of definitions, except for the last one. And once we know what the create statement is, it's easy to understand what the drop statement is, which is uh, simply remove the table from the database. You drop a table, you put a keyword, drop table first, then followed by the table name. And remember, one drop statement is for one table. I see students writing drop table, table name one, table name two, table name three, separated by comma or by parenthesis, this is wrong. You can have only one table in each drop statement. So let's quickly do some demo. <coughs> I'm bringing up Oracle Live SQL, and this is the starting screen you will see, and uh, let's go to SQL worksheet. I'm going to use uh, the same instructor example. So this is the create table instructor where you have the instructor name, you have a primary key, and you have an instructor affiliation. <coughs> so I run, I, by clicking on the run button, Right here. Oops. Okay, right here. Let's go. Oops, not the best painting, but here. This is the run button. I click on this run button. Let me clean up my mess first. But now let's click on run button, and you see it's running, and the table created. Now, after I use it, let's try to drop table. And I will drop, the, click on the run button again. 
and the null table dropped. If I try to find this uh, instruct table or maybe step from, you will, you will run into this very soon. We will introduce this is select very soon. But if I run, it basically tells me table does not exist. There's no such, this such table because I already dropped it. So this is so much for table creation and a drop. <coughs> In our next lecture, we are going to go into further detail on the ta naming table, ta naming standard, and we will run more create. Oh, before that, let me show you another convention, which is the multi-column primary key. So right here, we have the same create table, registration, and remember registration is between student and the course. So it has a multi-table, multi-column primary key. We need to enclose it inside the parenthesis, put primary key, and have it here. Now we can start running, and the table is created. Let's try to do some of the mistakes. Let's try to pre-reproduce pre some of the mistakes we had. For example, what if I add a data type here? It tells me invalid statement. This is wrong. Now, what if I put a comma here at, as, uh, at the end of a statement? I run it. It says invalid statement again. Now, when I remove, if I do not have a primary key, you also need to remove this last comma. There's no comma. If you still have this comma, when you run it, another invalid identifier, but basically it's what you, 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 <coughs> what you will find, an uh, error message. And uh, last but not least, let's try to create a multi-primary key definition which we mentioned just now. Now I have a primary key after student ID and the primary key after course ID. And I run it. It says table can only have one primary key. If you define a column as primary key, you cannot define another. This is the number one mistake happened in create table statement when there are multiple columns in the primary key. So, so much for registration. Let me drop it and we shall go to the next lecture. Table dropped. I will see you in next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to go through the naming convention of Oracle Live SQL and uh, do a quick demo. Now, when you create a shorthand representation of an entity or relationship because it's all written on text. It's uh, meant for human beings to read. You can name that whatever you want. You can name using special characters. You can have space. You can have single quote or double quote. But when you translate a shorthand representation into create table SQL statement, there are certain restrictions that you need to follow, certain naming conventions you need to follow. Oracle have the same restrictions on table names and column names. It has to be less than or equal to 30 characters long. It must start with a letter. It can contain letter, number, and underscore, but it cannot contain space or any special characters. When I say special characters, the most important thing to remember is those characters on top of your numbers, your numbers in on your keyboard, like a question mark or dollar sign or exclamation mark. You cannot have them. But one thing to note is all these tables and columns are not case sensitive. So some valid names include 
student underscore ID, teacher underscore name. And uh, because it's not sensitive, you can have student all in lowercase or all in uppercase. And you can have a student ID without underscore. You can have N1104 underscore reservation. You can even have a my name underscore 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 underscore. Although most people won't name their their, their corner this way, but it's a uh, completely valid. Some invalid name. You cannot have a student space ID. You cannot have teacher underscore salary underscore dollar. Dollar sign is not valid. You cannot have a 2020 sales goal because it starts with a two. And uh, this uh, apparent issue is that this column name is too long in Oracle DBMS. So these are the invalid names to try to avoid. Try to name your column name and the table names as uh, accurate and as uh, standardized. Let's do a quick demo in Live SQL. And note that in this uh, demo, we are going to create tables that we use for the Data Force Academy. And we will use the example. These are tables for our future SQL demo. And we add some information like course name, season name, and actual tuition to the registration table for instructional purpose. So when you see later on, when you see the registration table, you will notice it's not really third, third, third normal form compliant, and not because we intentionally use a bad design, just because we, uh, it's easier for us to demo. Okay, now let's go to Live SQL. Let me bring up Google Chrome and type in Oracle Live SQL. Get inside. And I will press the SQL worksheet link to the left. And this is my sign in. So we have this SQL worksheet. And I'm going to copy and paste the scripts I, that I have written. Four create statements and the four drop statements. All these scripts are in course material and in the GitHub repository. So you don't need to type them in. Now let's go through this quickly. We have this uh, single column primary key. And it is also a single column primary key, but for demo purpose, I put this into a primary key constraint. And similarly, primary key, single column, column constraint for primary key, and primary key, multi-column primary key definition. And then no comma after this, no comma after this. And I put create table all these, basically all these SQL keywords in capital just to make it look better. But indeed you can do create, EA, uppercase, lowercase, all these will work. And similarly, instructor name, you can have uh, all caps, it doesn't matter. So let's create a table first. Now, before I, I run this, if I, without highlighting any of the statement, and I run the, the I, I click the run button, as we stated before, run button here, and it will run, Oracle Live SQL will run all four create table statement and the four drop table statement in order to only run some part of the SQL, I have to highlight the SQL statement I want to run. For example, if I just want to create the instructor, I need to highlight it and press the run button. One table created. Now, also know there's this semicolon. SQL statement will ignore all the space and the line break in between different components. So I can have this create table instructor all in one line. There's nothing stopping me from doing that. 
and Oracle will be able to tell that it's one good statement. But if I do not have this semicolon, Oracle will not know whether this statement is the same as in one block statement chunk as in the next one. That's when you need to use a semicolon to separate statement from statement. It's not a part of SQL, but it's a best practice when you have multiple statements. Remember to put a semicolon after your statement to mark the end of your statement so that your next statement will not get confused. So let me try to, I need to drop this instructor first so that it's not going to give me an error message. Now, I'm not selecting any of, I'm not highlighting any portion. So when I click on run, it's going to run four create statements, then four drop table statements, all in the batch. And here it is, four create, four drop. If I highlight all these four and create the tables, now the tables are created. If I then go to the schema, uh, let me change the color of my marker. So it's uh, more bright. Schema part, all right? Then I will see the tables I just created. Course, instructor, registration, student. Let's use the instructor as an example. You can see here, this is how Oracle stores the table and the column definition. You have the instructor, you have the instructor name and affiliation. All of them are stored in uppercase. No matter what case I type in later on in my SQL statement, I will, uh, Oracle will convert them to uppercase and find the match. That's why we say it's not case sensitive, right? Now, one thing to note is that Oracle Live SQL is a free service provided by Oracle and it, it comes a restriction that it's session by session. If I log out right now, all these four tables will get lost. Also, if you stay here idle for too long, Oracle may close the session and remove all your tables. So make sure when you're typing something, save it to your own text file or whatever you are comfortable with. Don't keep it here. It won't keep whatever you typed in. It won't keep whatever you created either. So let me try to log out and show you what's happening. Hopefully you are not going to lose whatever you have done in the future. Now I'm logging again. Now let's go to schema and there's nothing because in between different sessions, Oracle cleaned up everything I have, uh, everything I have created. All right, so, so much is for Oracle, uh, or live SQL execution, this demo, and all the create statement and drop statement. Let's uh, talk about, the, that's in the next session, we are going to talk about simple insert and select. I'll see you there. In this session, we are going to talk about the naming convention of PostgreSQL and uh, make a demo on PostgreSQL. Now, PostgreSQL and Oracle are very similar. So if you have go through the Oracle portion of this naming convention demo, you will see almost the same thing. PostgreSQL has the same restriction on table names and column names. What's different from Oracle is uh, instead of 30 characters, it has the limitation of 31 characters. The names cannot be more than 31 characters. It can start with a letter or an underscore. 
it can contain letter, number, and underscore, but it cannot contain space or any special character like question mark or dollar sign or exclamation mark. One difference is that the PostgreSQL can have what we call the quoted name. If you put the, the name in double quote, then basically you can have whatever you want in the name, dash, dollar sign, or space. And you can also start the naming, start the name by number or characters. And uh, this becomes case sensitive if you use quote name. If you don't use quote name and use the regular one without quote, then it will be case insensitive. So some valid name similar to Oracle, we have a student underscore ID, student underscore name, student ID. And the, the only difference is the underscore good name underscore in PostgreSQL. I'm not putting quoted the name here because basically you can put everything. So every name will be a valid name. There's no point of listing that out. I'm just putting unquoted name, traditional unquoted name. Invalid name for unqu uh, unquoted name, student ID with a single, with a space, teacher salary dollar with a dollar sign, 2020 sales goal, which starts with two, a number instead of a letter. And again, this column name is too long in PostgreSQL DBMS. Let's do some quick demo in PostgreSQL. The difference this time is that we are going to use um, what do we call the PG admin for? This is PG admin for. This is the management tool. Basically, it's a tool um, DBMS management tool provided by PostgreSQL. If you have go through the installations, the PostgreSQL installation part, you should already know how to start it and how to get to this page. Now, to run SQL against a database. You see this, I'm, right now I'm putting my mouse on test data and I'm right clicking. It give me a right click drop down menu where I'm going to choose query tool. This is a tool I will be using to run SQL against SQL, um, PostgreSQL. I'm copying my statement, SQL statement here. Remember, I'm using the same statement that I use for Oracle. And that's the beauty of having an NC standard, that the same SQL can be applied in both DBMS and even more. And similarly, similar to Oracle Live SQL, if I just run SQL right now, without uh, any highlighting anything or selecting anything, it will run all four create statement and uh, four drop statements all in one batch. So I'm going to click on this button. If you can see, maybe this time it's too bright. So I'll change that to a blue sign. Right here, that's the run. And I'm going to clear my drawing so that I will press the button. And you can see PGAdmin only returns the result of the last statement you run. Although we run eight statement in one batch, it only returns the information for the last statement. So what you need to do is you can highlight or for create statement, press one. Now all statements are created, all four uh, tables are created. Let's open up test data, go to schemas, public and uh, check here. Right now it shows tables is uh, empty. But that's because I haven't refreshed that. Now if I right click on tables and click on refresh, you will see the four tables get created. An interesting difference between PostgreSQL and, uh, and Oracle is that although both are case insensitive, the way they store the data they store the names are different. Oracle store the names all in capital K, uppercase. Postgres store all these in lowercase. This does not matter if we are running SQL from PG Admin or Oracle Live SQL.
But if you run the SQL through in Python, from Python or R, through a JTBC driver, it will matter. I have students running SQL again and again, keep on uh, complaining cannot find a table because in, his, in her SQL statement, she actually put a, a uppercase letter in the table name. Although it's the same table name, the uppercase made it, made it impossible for Postgres SQL to find the table. So remember, you can do whatever case you want in PG admins the interface, but if you are running SQL against the Postgres SQL through tables, uh, through JDBC connection, you need to use all lower case. That being said, I still can do all the things with the key, uh, SQL statement. I can do lowercase drop. I can do a mixed case. I can do all uppercase because I'm using the query tool, which knows how to translate these, uh, these uh, table names. So now that if I highlight all these four and start running, drop table, all of them finished successfully. Now let's go back to table, right click on table and refresh again, and all of them are gone. So, so much is for Postgres SQL demo. Um, we will talk about more SQL statements in, in the following session. I will see you there. In this lecture, we are going to talk about simple select and insert statements. Now, we already know how to create table and of course drop table, but uh, just by creating table, table is still empty. You need to open up table, insert the data into table. And then once you insert the data, you need to select it out for future usage. When you create a table, when you create the data, put that into table, and uh, stored it in the database. That's the whole thing that DBMS is doing for SQL. So how do you insert data into a table? The simplest form of insert is insert data with a column list. Each insert is a row. It starts with a keyword, insert into. Then followed by the table name. By doing running this insert, you are going to insert the row inside. So you need to specify for this row, what's the value in each column. You do this by adding a column list enclosed in parentheses after table name. So it's an integrated part of table name and column list, similar to the shorthand representation. Then you specify a values uh, keyword and put a parenthesis and the values should be inside this, this uh, parenthesis. Column list in insert statement, they don't need to be in the same order as table definition, but column list and the value list must match with each other. If you still remember how we define instructor, in the create table statement, we actually have instructor name first. And the second one was instructor affiliation. But if you are actually inserting using a column list, then as long as this Jedi matches the affiliation and Obi-Wan Kenobi matches the in instructor name, then you are good to go, you can insert. You can insert without column list. If you just put the insert into table name and the value value list, it's, a, it's doable. However, in that case, the value list must match the column names and the and order defined in the table create statement. For example, here, you will be inserting into instructors, name first, affiliation next. And if I have uh, more columns in this uh, instructor table, I must submit all the required value too. So once you insert it, you can select them out. The keyword here is select. 
you want to select which column you want to see from the table. If you want to select multiple columns, you separate them by comma. And again, no comma after last column. So last column here, there's no comma. It just uh, keep on doing commas, column, comma, column, until you finish all the columns you define. Now, column names can be long. So if you are selecting columns, you don't need to, it's similar to insert, you don't need to be in the same order as how it was created. You can specify the column names and the value will show up in the order as selected. And if you don't want to type in all the column names, if you're happening to be selecting all columns, you can use a asterisk, a star sign, means all columns and the default order as defined in the table create statement. So you can use a select star from instructor. It will show you instructor name and instructor affiliation. You can also mix star and column names together. For example, here, you can have a select instructor name and star from instructor, but remember to bring in comma between them and the no comma after the last column, which is the star. You may wonder why would you do that? Why would you choose instructor name twice? For a single table selection, this actually doesn't, <coughs> doesn't provide much value. But in the future, we are going to go through how to run <coughs> SQL against a multiple column. At that time, you may want to selecting some columns from one table and selecting everything from another. That will be proved to be valuable. So let's do some quick demo in Oracle Live SQL. First, we talked about insert, right? Let me quickly type in some insert statement. And as you can see, we have affiliation first, instructor name second, but uh, each one matches each one. So let's run. And now let's select from, oops. I accidentally pressed, yeah, I accidentally pressed the return, return button on my keyboard. That's why there's this SMS message, but it's not going to affect what we're trying to show here. So I'm showing you what's inside the instructor now. I already inserted something before. I have Obi-Wan Kenobi as Jedi, Anakin Skywalker as Jedi, Yoda as Jedi, and uh, this is the one that I just inserted. Kigong as a Jedi. And remember we used um, affiliation first, but when we select, we're still going to get Kigong first, the name first, right? But now if I ever try to use this to do a select, use this column list, guess what it will happen? It will show me the affiliations first, followed by the names. And we can also use uh, insert without the column, without the column list. In this case, it will by default goes to instructor name first, which is the defined in the, in, in the create statement, then by affiliation. Let me run the insert. Looks like I have been keep on pressing the enter button again and again. So let me select star from instructor and see whether the previous insert was successful or not. Press on run. And the King Skywalker is there. Or maybe I think I make a mistake because I shouldn't have 
I already had Anakin Skywalker, and it's not allowing me to insert multiple times. Remember, in the very beginning of the relational model, we said we cannot have two rows with the same value, especially for the primary key. Primary key must be unique. And this is what's happening. It's stopping me from inserting Anakin Skywalker again. So how about I try Luke Skywalker? I will run it by default. One row inserted. And now if I select star from instructor, you will see both father and son in the table. Okay, so so much is for simple insert and select. Starting from there, we can dig into some further details of a SQL statement. Namely, the next one we will be talking about is data type. I'll see you there. In this lecture, we are going to go through different data types. So we talked about data types of a column. It defines what value a column can hold. For example, if you are trying to put a string value into a decimal, it will definitely give you error, right? This is uh, pretty intuitive. But now, how are these data types defined and how are they matching with each other? That's what we are going to talk in this lecture. Most common data types, including these int, decimal, text string, characters, or date. Now, first let's talk about int. Int is an integer number, it's a whole number part. You can see them as a quantity of items sold, number of days, number of uh, students. You won't have uh, like half of a student, right? And regularly, it will also be used as a primary key because int has the lowest storage cost and highest performance of all data types. It's a pretty self, uh, self. It's pretty straightforward to use the int, but there's something to remember. Why is that you should uh, place that? You should not place it inside the quote. Um, so and you should not use comma. For example. 12,345, if you are regular, <laughs> writing that in regular English expression, you will put the comma between two and three, but in the SQL, you shouldn't do that. It will just be a single string, one, two, three, four, five. There shouldn't be any comma. And you shouldn't have decimal points, it's a, which is a self-explanatory. Now, a little bit further complicated is decimal. Decimal has two parts, the whole number part and the decimal part. When you define that, you define a precision and scale. A common mistake made by students is they confuse precision with the digits of decimal of a whole number. In fact, precision is the total number of digits in the whole number, in a number, including both whole number and decimal place. But scale is the decimal, number of decimal digits. So if I have a decimal seven underscore uh, seven comma two, that means the whole length of the digits is a seven with a decimal space of two, which leaves five, five digits for my whole number part. What if the scale equals to zero? Yes, you can define scale as equal to zero. Then it will be the same as integer. It's commonly used for things like a currency. In that case, scale will be two and uh, for percentage. Common mistakes for decimal. Don't add quote. Quote is reserved to our characters. Don't add comma. One, two, three, four, five. No comma in between. A little bit tricky here. It will overflow if you try to insert a number whose whole number digits are greater to the precision minus scale. And we talked about this in the last previous slide. Precision minus scale. The result is the number of whole digits you can have in this decimal column. If you are inserting some number whose whole number digit is more than what is defined 
as a precision minus scale, you will have an error. Like uh, decimal seven two, seven minus two is five. So you can have five that's a whole number of digits. If you try to insert one, two, three, four, five, six, point seven eight into this decimal seven two, you will have an overflow error message. On the other part of the, on the other end of the balance is the loss of accuracy when number of decimal space digits is greater to scale. For example, if you have one, two, three, four, five, six point three eight, which have two decimal digits, you try to insert that into decimal seven zero, which have zero decimal digits. Oracle or other DBMS will try the best it can do. For in Oracle's case, they will to run up, they will run it up. In some other DBMS, they will just remove, they will wipe out the digital part, the decimal digits. It depends on the DBMS, but basically, either way, you are losing your accuracy. The problem is, this will not result in the SQL execution failure. So you won't be able to tell by looking at the SQL execution law. You have to pay attention to it yourself, monitoring the data, and that's the only way to resolve it. So let's talk about text. Text strings, sometimes called strings, sometimes called characters, are defined as char or varchar in SQL. They are single code delimit delimited string. For example, city. You include, you enclose them with a, with a single quote, then it becomes a char. Now, single quote is used to delimit or enclose the string. It's not a part of a string itself. And once you put single quote around it, it's case sensitive. Lowercase city is different from uppercase city. And if you want to put a single quote inside the string, you use two continuous single quotes to represent one single code. Tags are widely used for all sort of text, name, address, anything you can think of. It can be used for primary key too. For example, in our instructor table, we actually use instructor name as the primary key. However, when you use this, make sure you understand that it comes, with a, it comes at a price for performance because selecting the text is slower than selecting int and the other operations too. So you can use them as a primary key, but be aware of the performance hit. One thing interesting is uh, how about social security number? Or in some state, if the state that the car license plate is all numbers, should they be char or should they be int? Either way, it's, uh, it's workable. But if you use social security number, as the integer, someone's social security number may be starting with zero. Then when you compare, they, there might be missing equation because there's a zero. So this is something to pay attention to. In general, the general guideline is that if a column cannot be summed up, it should be text. In social security, this, uh, social security numbers case, who will add up the social security number of students in class? For what? There's no reason to do that. It should be taxed. So there are two types of tax definition. One is char, one is var char. And the difference, of course, is the the VAR. VAR stands for variable, as in variable length. So varchar can have a variable length, but that does not mean it can go from zero to infinity. So when you define char and varchar, you supply supply the definition with an end with number in the parenthesis. For example, char parenthesis ten or varchar parenthesis ten. The difference here is. Database will fill in spaces for the rest of the char characters. So if I put a Jedi into char 10, what actually uh, exists in the column is Jedi 
J-E-D-I, plus six spaces. But uh, in Varchar's case, it will simply be J-E-D-I. There's no space added. Many students thought Varchar means you can have uh, as many characters as you want. You can put a Jedi is good, this is bad into this Varchar 10 field. This is wrong. You can only put up to 10 characters in this column. But if your data, if your text is less than 10 characters, Oracle will not add space after that to make it 10. Whereas in chart 10's case, Oracle will add up spaces to make everything you fill in 10 characters. But what's the diff usage of difference? Because of this variable length character, it's a uh, var charts are useful for columns that are that may have variable table uh, data, for example, name or address. And for char, we can use a fixed length. They can use be used for fixed length characters, like car license plate, driver ID, or in some cases, some ID. And common mistakes, forget single quote. You have to have single quote around text. Or use double quote, that's wrong. You have to use single quote. Double quote is just a normal character. Or use wrong character of quotes when copying from rich format text editors, such as Word or Outlook. This happens to me a lot because a lot of students, when they submit their homework, they run the SQL in some SQL editor, which uh, is a plain text. They copy that into Outlook and send this. When they copy the single quote into Outlook, Outlook automatically convert it into some kind of uh, unidentifiable character. And when I try to run their SQL, I get the error message. So this happens a lot and pay attention to it. Outlook, or word can sometimes switching the, the, the character space or single quote or double quote. Make, make sure you are submitting the right format, the right character set. So now let's do some quick demo. In Oracle, in Oracle Live SQL, let's first by doing the insert, again, all the codes are in course material and uh, in, in GitHub repository. So we do this insert into course values. Now this is the course ID, which is the int. Let's see what will happen. And also this is tuition. Tuition is a decimal, seven two. We are inserting a integer here. Let's run this and see what will happen. It's ran, then let's select from. I'm highlighting that, so I'm only running this once. This statement, I'm not running the insert in two. And here is this experience in the dark side provided by General Moti, actually. It should have been General Moti, I'm sorry. Um, you can see this, this is 12. I put a 1234, 12.34 here, and the Oracle will run it up. If I have another one, like 13 for five, six, four, and run it again. This time, because it's 13.64, it's actually run it up to 14. Experience the tar side. Now, one thing to note, very interestingly, is it's not sorted. As you can see, the sort there's no sorting in the select select result. This is the important topic that we will cover later on. For now, just keep in mind that the result is not sorted. 
And I have this uh, experience, found the interesting experience where some coworkers send me a list of dates and ask me why we are missing some date, some some data in the date. And uh, I look at it, and immediately I know what's going on because he forgot to sort the value. He only see the top few and happens to be uh, broken up and uh, missing some dates. So he thought, oh, we are missing some date, but which is not true. By, by sorting the result, he, uh, we were able to identify that all dates are there. And how to do it? We will be talking about this in the later session. So, so much is for the interaction between int and the decimal. And you can see that uh, int can be converted. Decimal can, when decimal is loaded to int column, Oracle does a high roundup. Some other database may be doing just a simple truncate. And uh, for decimal, if we, for loading inter, integer value into decimal, they will just load as is. Now let's talk about decimal precision. We're well, inserting into course values 101, how to blow that star into pieces by Luke Skywalker, my favorite topic. Now, remember this tuition is seven two, so it can only contain five decimal, uh, five whole number digits. What will happen if I run this? It give me an error message, value larger than specified precision. So Oracle will not allow you to do that. Now, what if I do one point, one, two, three, four, five, which will meet the requirement, but I have a six, seven, eight, which goes beyond the two digit, two decimal digits specified in the definition. Oops, did I just clear it? Okay. I, let me try to run this. Oh, I think I accidentally pressed the Control Z button, which uh, get, which may remove all of my change. But now I change that to one, two, three, four, five dot six, seven, eight which goes beyond the scale by the not a precision. Now the data is loaded and let's see that from course. And let's see our favorite topic, how to blow that star into pieces. It says one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. So you can see that Oracle rounded seven, eight up to eight. And you are losing some, some precisions here. And there's no error message when we run this insert. So you have to pay attention to this in your real system and think of it, whether it's possible for you to lose the precision when you design your database. All right, now let's start talking about decimal. We will have some other courses, some additional courses where in the tuition area, I put a 50,000 as what I'm going to write in a English sentence with a comma. So now if I run this, what will happen? It says too many values. And the reason it give me too many values error is because it's comma. Oracle thought that our data is first value, second value, third value, fourth value, and this is the fifth value. Apparently this is wrong, but that's how it interprets comma. So what you need to do is remove comma and you run this. Um, I'm not going to run this because it will be a simple select, but there's another topic that, what if I put a single quote around here? Will Oracle be able to identify this as the decimal? The answer is yes. And you can see the introduction to the force, Obi-Wan Kenobi, 5,000. 
it was the Oracle was able to identify. So what's happening is Oracle and some other DDBMS, they are trying their best to guess what you try to do. It sees that you are trying to insert a value into, you're trying to insert a, a value into a decimal, um, decimal column. So it's trying to convert this value into decimal. This is something that uh, it's uh, smart enough to do, but you should not rely on it. Because if you can do it once, it can make mistakes too. So if I put R2D2 here, um, we will talk about what kind of mistake can happen later when we talk about where cross. That's where this uh, issue is uh, more apparent. But for now, let's remember this is wrong and you shouldn't do it. You should uh, always put a decimal as is without single quote. Now, if I accidentally, knowing its tuition, I still type in R2D2, what will happen? I will run it and I get a mess error message, invalid number. It is not a proper number. Oracle try, note that it's not saying invalid data type because Oracle is trying to convert this into a number and it cannot convert. That's why it, the error message says invalid number, okay? And uh, with all this for decimal, let's start text with a lighter note. What if I use a double quote instead of a single quote? And we know, all know it, we will run into an error message, but what is the error message? It's a column not allowed here. Why column is not allowed here? It's basically thinking this is a quoted name. It thought this was a column, but this is beyond the discussion of this, the, the, the discussion of this class. So all you need to take away is that you should use single quote, not double quote. So much is for general tax handling. Let's also go through some quick char and the bar chart comparison. If we go to schema and look at the table instructor, schema, instructor, there are two columns defined in instructor. One is instructor name, which is a bar chart. Another is affiliation, which is a char, bar chart 20. Now, remember this, this can be interesting. Maybe I, I can, what I can do, I will copy this paste that into SQL worksheets so that we can either, we can make a comparison. Mm, looks like uh, Oracle Live SQL is a little bit slow now. And in order to hide some information to avoid execution, you can put a two dash in front of a row and Oracle will treat this as a comment. So we have a instructor name and a instructor affiliation. Now that I will copy, I will insert the value into instructor. We all know it can have only, it's a bar chart 20, right? And how about a Jedi with a really known name? There will be a mere message saying value too large. So bar chart does not mean you can extend the chart as long, as, as wide as possible. If it's defined as 20, it can hold up to 20. You cannot go all the way to a Jedi with a really no, low name. Now, what, can, what about char? It's similar. Anakin King Skywalker says, I don't care which side I am in. And also notice, there are two single quotes here, which stands for one quote. So if I run that, same error message. But if I just put I don't care, or I don't, what will happen? Or maybe not the King Skywalker, but the Han Solo. Doesn't really care, right? You run this. So that star for instructor. Tor. 
run the, oh, typo. Fix the typo, run that, and the bus auto, you see, I don't, and it's single quote. So we successfully uh, escape the single quote by putting two single quote together. So another interesting thing is we talked about how many chars, uh, for chars, we will have space in behind. So this is Jedi and this, according to what we said, there should be 10 space after this. So let's see, I'm moving my mouse on top. One, two, three, four, five, six, and no more. I'm trying to, I can no more. If it, for hand solo is I don't, I, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there should be three left. One space, two space, three space, that's all. Um, but if you look at the instruction name, which is the variable, which is the, Bar chart. You say Han Solo, nothing after. You say Luke Skywalker, nothing after. You, you try to, I try to very hard to make my mouse over and over and drag and, and show. There's simply no space after a bar chart string. So, so much is for text and the decimal and all the data type. In next session, we're going to talk about a um, very interesting topic, which is now, and I will see you there. In this lecture, we are going to talk about now. What is now? Uh, so we, when you define data, you constantly run into special values that uh, simply does not exist or you just don't know. For example, mid name. Not every people have a mid name. For those who does not have a mid name, the mid name field is empty. It's not like um, an empty string. It's just simply nothing exists there. Or home phone. Sometimes uh, people don't have home phone, or either because they just don't have one, or because they want to, they, they don't want to expose their home phone to the outside world. So when you collect home phone from someone, maybe you will just get an empty. It's an unknown or non-existing value that you should need to specify inside your database. But how do you make sure you understand this is, not, this is empty? It's a represented using the keyword N-U-L-L, now. And it's case insensitive. It can be lowercase N-U-L-L, it's same, still meaning the same thing. But in our class, we will always put it into uppercase so that it's uh, easier to identify. Remember now, it's not zero. It's not empty string. It's not the string now by adding two single quotes. And all these are common mistakes made by beginners. So let's talk about what is not now, what cannot be now. Can a primary key be now? Like student ID. Apparently you cannot, why? Because primary key, by definition, should be able to clearly identify the, the whole entity, right? So if you have a now, what does that mean? You do not know the key, you do not have a key, you are missing the key. What can you get from a missing key? You cannot determine anything of the entity. So primary key cannot be now. How about some, something that is not primary key, but uh, based on common sense should not be now? Like emergency contact number. You should always have an emergency contact number for any student. Having a now in that field is a, uh, is a violation of school policy. In this case, when you define an emergency contact number for a student, you the better define that as a not now field where people just cannot put not now there. In order to create a student, the student the record, you have to put a value to enforce this school policy. 
So what you can do is adding a not, not now, adding these two words, not now, in the column definition, when you create a table, it has to be between data type and a comma. You can have one not now for each column, and you can have multiple columns with a not, not now constraint in one table. If you do not put the not now after a column definition, the default is, is nowable. You can have a now in that field. It's like a mid name. Yes, you can have now, but the first name, it should be not now. And the uh, primary key is automatically not now. That's the only exception to this default. How do we insert now into the column? When you do insert, you can either insert it by missing out column names. For example, if I do not specify instructor affiliation, then in this insert statement, I'm telling DBMS to put now into instructor is affiliation. Or I can just put the keyword NULL as the field value. It will provide the now in that field too. But remember, you cannot insert into not now. You cannot insert a now into a not now columns. We will explain this by use, running a series of state of SQL. So let's switch to Oracle Live SQL. And I'm going to have a bunch of inserts. So first of all, this is the inserting value of Lars uh, without affiliation. I can also insert into instructor name, uh, maybe cancel, also without affiliation. So both can work. Oh, I already inserted the instructor just now. I believe I, I insert something like this. So let's just how about Jaja Brinks. So now another row inserted. Let's do a select star. And let's look at the two rows, Alvin Lars and the Jaja Brinks. You get now here, you get now here. Both can be get, uh, insert. Now, what if I put an instructor affiliation? Values, neither, neither Jedi nor uh, I think it's uh, only 10, so let's just put neither. Will it give me an error message? And the answer is yes. And what is the reason? It says clearly, cannot insert now into instructor, instructor name, because instructor name is a primary key and you cannot insert a now. Uh, of course, we didn't specify, specifically insert now into it's just a name, but we are inserting a row. And in this row, we only specify instructor affiliation. So the other columns, the missing columns, like instructor name, we are default, we are telling DBMS to insert the now. That's where we get this cannot insert now into error message. All right, so much for now. Now, now is an interesting topic by inserting and, um, and selecting is not as fun for now, but uh, it will get more tricky and more interesting when we start to talk about conditions where now equals to or not equals to. That's uh, where all the fun part of now comes in. And I will meet you in next, next uh, lecture, which we will talk about select in further. I'll see you there. In this lecture, we are going to go through some very useful features of a single table CLS statement. So first, let's talk about, let's give a quick review on what we have learned about CLS statement. CLS statement is used to retrieve certain columns from a table. 
And if you want to retrieve all columns in the default order that was specified in the create statement, you use the asterisk or the star sign to indicate you want all. What we didn't cover is that in addition to retrieve columns, you can also retrieve column computations. For example, from a sales table, if you pull quantity times price, that gives you sales. But of course, the question is then, what is the, the quantity times price mean? You may know that, but the, whichever, whoever reads your SQL may not understand. That's when we have a column alias. You can rename a column or specify a name of the expression using the AS, the S keyword. That will be select some computation as an alias. And uh, when DBMS runs this SQL, it will provide you the, with uh, total sales, um, the table alias title, the column alias title to the computation. Let's show this in Oracle Live SQL. And I'm going to copy and paste my SQL statement from the code block. So first one, I'm showing you how to do a calculation, which is simple. Tuition times uh, 1.1, assuming this is a proposed 10% increase in tuition. And that's the one that I run. But um, as a user, you look at the definition and you said, what does the tuition times 1.1 mean? And by specifying alias, we will know this is the current tuition and the one to tuition times 1.1 is a proposed new tuition. Let's run this. So this is a proposed tuition and this is the current tuition. We will see the difference. And of course, if you want to do minus or plus or whatever division, you can do this too. So much for Scylla alias. Another very useful feature, or in my opinion, is the most important feature, is a where clause. You can use where clause to provide you a criteria to filtering, to filtering out a certain, to filtering the certain rows that meets your criteria. For example, if I'm only interested in the instructors that is affiliated with Jedi. I would like to say, I want to see all the instructors with the instructor affiliation column equals to Jedi. And that's when you use the where clause. You add a where keyword after the table name, followed by a condition. In this case, it will be instructor affiliation equals to Jedi. Um, to explain a little bit more on how, where is it executed, let's talk about select, how select is executed. In fact, when you run the select, DBMS does a very tedious and very boring thing. It will go through each row to pick whatever you ask it to pick. For, for the select operation, each row is performed once. Let's talk about something that uh, may be counterintuitive. What is the result of the following query? See that this is a test from instructor. Now we already know we have four rows in the instructor table. Is this select going to return us four, four this is a test or only one? I will give you five seconds to think about it. Then let's go to Oracle Live SQL. One, two, three, four, five, and five seconds is up. Now, let me copy the SQL over and uh, let's run it. It gives us four, this is a test. And this example shows us how select is executed in the backend. Database, DBMS goes into this table, perform a select, this is a SQL for each row, once, twice, three times, four times, and the provided result four times in the row, uh, in, in the table. You know what I mean when I say in the row. Okay, so this is uh, how select is performed. 
DBMS will go through each row and apply SQL action, such as select to the rows. Now, talking about where, it's exactly the same. DBMS will go through the table, row by row, and check the condition for that particular, for the current row. If the row meets the condition, it will perform select. If the row does not meet the condition, it will discard the row. It will not take any action. For example, let's say I have two rows, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Dasidius. DBMS will go into the first row, Obi-Wan Kenobi, application is Jedi. Okay, meet the criteria, select it. The second row, Dasidius, application is this, doesn't meet the criteria, doing nothing. Let's, let's explain this again using, uh, oops, using Oracle Live SQL. So I'm going to select instructor affiliation. Pro instructor. And we already know it will give us four rows, right? What if I add where instructor affiliation equals to Jedi? And what will happen? Before I run it, let's explain. And it will go through first row, the affiliation is Jedi. So yes, we will select it. Second row, affiliation is Jedi, we will select it. Third row, affiliation is Jedi. Yes, we will select it. Three rows so far. Fourth row, affiliation is this. We are not going to do anything. We are not going to select it. This row will not show. So by running this SQL, you should see three rows. And that's exactly what we get. Now, the question will become, showing three Jedi may not be found. What if I, what if I just want to see one Jedi? If, I, if there are multiple values, I only see it once. Once is enough for me, right? And that's what a select distinct is used for. It will make sure each row, each value only show up once. For example, I can select distinct Instructor affiliation. I will add a distinct keyword right after select. Remember, select distinct itself is a keyword. There's no question mark, no single quote, no parenthesis, no nothing in between. You just type the whole word select distinct. Of course, there should be a space between them, but yeah, this is select distinct. So we'll run this and expecting that only returning one Jedi. Yes. So this is how it works. Each row column value can repeat. If you choose multiple columns for the select distinct operation, the column value can repeat, but the combined value of a row will only show up once. Let's give you an example again. So still for instructor table, I'm going to, I'm going to select this thing, instructor name and the affiliation both. We already know that instructor name is distinct. This row is distinct in the row value. This row is distinct in the row value. The keyword, Je the, the word of Jedi shows up multiple times. Right, but because the row value, each row is unique, it still shows up multiple times. It's not going to show up only once. So this is what the select distinct mean. It's selected in a distinct value of the whole column list from this table. So this is the, oops. This is the interesting topic about select distinct. Remember, this select distinct itself is a keyword, so no parentheses or quotes. I do see students add, uh, add quotes around distinct, distinct, and guess what? Oracle think this is just another value, another char, another char string. And the, the distinct operation was not operated. So we talked about so much about select and uh, in previous classes, we already showed that 
the result of a select is not sorted. If you have been seeing sorted results, that's a coincidence. You are just getting lucky. If you want the data to be sorted, you need to specifically using order by class to, to tell DBMS, I want the result sorted in the order I want. You will add this order by class to the end of the SQL statement by typing in the keyword order by followed by columns to sort the data set. I believe you have noticed that we are saying columns, that's a plural. So, which means you can sort it by multiple columns. You can specify the sorting order, either it's a descending or ascending. Ascending is the default. By, by, by typing ASC, you are specifying this to be descending. Typing ASC after the column, word, uh, column name. And uh, by typing DESC after the column name, you're specifying that should be sorted descending. If you have multiple columns involved, each column can have its own ascending or descending. And in this case, column name and uh, sorting order is the one component. Another column name and the sorting order is another component separated by comma. Again, no comma at the end. So some, some quick points we talked about. It's always at the end of the SILA statement. It can use any columns in the data set, not necessary in the SILA clause. Like in this example, I can only use, uh, I can only select instructor name. I don't need to select course name. I can still sort it by both columns. I can even just select tuition and still order by instructor name and course name. Whatever shows up in a select statement has no relationship with uh, order by, uh, order by columns. The only thing is applied to uh, by order by is the rows. It's not a select columns, okay? And you can have multiple columns. Each can have its own sorting order. And the important part is the order of the columns determines the sorting priority. Whatever comes first has the highest priority. We'll show you all these with a series of SQLs in Oracle Live SQL. So there are a whole bunch of order by statements, SILA statements with order by. The first one is of course, we want to sort a course table by instructor name. Now, <coughs> I'm sorting by instructor, and by default, I'm sorting ascendingly. So you, that's what you see, D followed by O, and uh, OB followed by OW, and uh, O followed by Y. This is sorted by instructor name. However, when I look at the course name, inside OB1 Kenobi, two classes, L comes before I, this is descending, whereas in Yoda's two crosses, B comes before D. This is, uh, this is ascending. That means course names are not sorted. If I decide to sort first by instructor name and second by course name, you can see that Yoda, because this time we specify instructor name descending, Yoda comes first. Inside Yoda's two courses, B comes before D. Then inside Obi-Wan Kenobi's two courses, I comes before L, which is the ascending order we specified. Now, you may notice that for this uh, particular moisture farming, M is actually uh, higher in the order or, it should, uh, or in the plain English, it should be coming after I. Still, we see this I introduction after moisture, M. That's because Obi-Wan Kenobi in the sorting order is after instructor Oven, Lars. So the sorting is first by instructor. Only when you have the same instructor, then it goes to the second level of sorting, which is course name. Beyond, between different instructors, 
the course name are not sorted. So, so much this for select distinct. And the last point we want to make is to show you that you can also sort by calculation. Like for example, if I want to order by tuition times 1.1, I can do that. You can see that, yes, it's sort of ascending. Now, of course, you can, you, can, you can start wondering, why would you do a order by tuition times 1.1? Because it will be the same as order by tuition, which is true. This tuition time 1.1 is more for a demonstration purpose. But if you have a larger table, which has more columns like the price and the quantity we talked about in the total sales table, you may want to sort by quantity times price as for the total sales. So in this case, this uh, order by computation feature will be useful. Okay, so much is for select. Uh, we talked about these things, we talked about where clause, and we talked about order by. And as we go through this uh, column computation, computation, there's another interesting topic that how do you do further processing on column values? And uh, beside the regular arithmetic calculations, we also have some advanced features, which will be, uh, which is achieved by using functions. And that's the topic we are going to cover in the next lecture. I'll see you there. In this lecture, we are going to talk about row level functions. And row level functions actually exactly is uh, what it, the name supply, uh, suggests. It's uh, going to get applied to every row being processed. Um, this includes a lot of uh, calculation, computation, and uh, conversion functions. For example, for daytime, there's uh, frequently a need to convert between data, different data format. Uh, for example, the US format, the international format, and the United Kingdom format. <coughs> Also, there's a string functions. You want to convert everything to uppercase, everything to lowercase. You want to measure the length of the string. You want to concatenate different strings. All this can be achieved by using row level functions. So let's go to Oracle Live SQL. Let's first talk, first talk about the date function. Um, first thing to note is that uh, there's a lot of different functions serving different purpose and nobody can remember all of them. What you can do is doing what our technical guys love to do, Google. So let's, for example, let's search Oracle date functions. And uh, you will see a lot of date and time functions. Add date, add time, convert, current date, current timestamp, you can pretty much assume what this means, day name, day or month, I guess these are pretty self-explanatory. Self um, if you have any questions, if you want to find, uh, to look up certain function that uh, meet your need, just to Google it, check the vendor's uh, support uh, documentation. Now, let's go back to are simple functions. We will use these simple functions just to demo how to use those functions uh, so that uh, when you need, you know how to use it, you know how to, uh, how, where to find them, and that should be good enough. So let's first select star from registration. In this table, we have a date, for, a date field. And you can see the registration day is, is uh, displayed as 10 October 19, which means October 10th, 2019. That's a default date format for, <clears throat> for Oracle Live SQL. But this may not be the default the time format for a lot of other systems. Other system may be showing something like 10. Let's say, I will try to use something that will not be ambiguous. Let's say January 23rd so that the Oracle will not mistake 23rd as the month, 2019. Okay, if I try to do select from registration, where registration date equals to 
2019, what will happen? Because Oracle does not accept, because Oracle by default use this uh, 23 Gen 19 format. It does not understand that this 01 slash 23 slash 2019 is actually a date format. You have to use this 23 dash gen dash 19 for it to recognize. And this time it will work. But of course, there's no data found because there's no such data. Now, what if my computer system, my upstream computer system, returns the data like this? And this is a pretty common US, uh, US format, right? You need to use a function. The most, one of the most useful function in date format conversion is to date. Now this to date is an Oracle standard. Other DBMS, like PostgreSQL or SQL Server or MySQL may be using some other tools, other functions. You need to check your vendor's function list to get an idea on how to use them. But how, how to format is a database, uh, database specific. The idea of using this function is universal across different platforms. You will still have the same function name. You will specify the column. You will specify um, the, <coughs> the, the format, the date format. So these are the universal. So here I'm going to show MM. DD, this month, month, day, day, Y, 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 Y. So in this case, I'm telling Oracle, convert this string to date and use this format. How do I know this? I already checked that from Oracle manual. That's how I know how to use this function and you should do this too. Now let's run this. And this time it gives us, oh, no data found. What if I use a 10? October 10th, it should return me two rows, which is correct. All right, so these are, these are the two date functions and there are more, as you can see, there's something called sysdate, which will return you the current date. If I just try to do a sysdate here, I think it shouldn't, I shouldn't use a parenthesis. See, it's, it's showing me the current date. And uh, by making this mistake, you can also see that even the most experienced database warrior, database guru can make mistakes when going into these uh, functions. The only way to avoid it is not to avoid it, is to try and error and to Google the function, this function manual. All right, so this is so much for a date. Now let's talk about char functions. We were asking how to do select upper case and lower case. And this is the function Oracle use to convert. And I think most of the SQL, the DB platform use either upper or U case. Something like that, but again, make sure you check your your uh, vendor's manual to know which function to use. So I'm selecting this for upper and lower. I separate them into two different uh, SQL, but in fact, I can also put them into the same SQL statement. Now, if I run this, oh, we only have one uh, one student so far. So it's Luke and Luke himself. And also you can do a distinct if you want. In this case, because all, there's only one row, so it doesn't matter. It will just be select distinct. Remember select distinct is uh, one keyword. Put this uh, into uh, in the chunk, followed by the, the column list. So, so much is for our demo for function. It's a short one, but does not mean it's not important. In fact, it's one of the most important features that you will use day in and day out. Because when you use SQL, of course the regular arithmetics, the plus minus the divide, uh, the multiplication 
will not satisfy all your needs. You will you need to use a lot of function. Uh, but um, on the other hand, the function usage is relatively simple. You just go to the menu, understand how it works, then you can use it as free. Before we close this, before we close this session, let's talk about another character manipulation, which is not a function, but more like operator. This is the concatenation. How do you put two strings together? Um, I know there are students trying to use a, mod, a, a plus, which theoretically makes sense, but uh, unfortunately Oracle does not accept it. So you need to use this double bar, which is the one on top of your reverse slash key. Double of this and uh, you can concatenate by using this operator. So you are putting Jedi with Obi-Wan Kenobi, Jedi with uh, Akin Skywalker, and this with Darth Sidious. And note here, because Jedi is, uh, because uh, the affiliation is, uh, <coughs> is uh, a char, char 10. So you actually have 10 characters in this string, and the six of them, a space. How do I get rid of the space? We use a function. Function would be called trim. So you remove the space ahead and after, before and after, and they give you Jedi, column, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Yoda, and King Skywalker. So these are the concatenation and uh, some of the string character operations. And uh, in next lecture, we're going to talk about aggregation function, which is uh, also functions, but uh, not raw level, but on uh, aggregation level. I'll see you there. In this lecture, we are going to go through aggregation functions. We have already go through raw level functions which process row by row. For each input row, we will generate one result. Aggregation functions operates to a selected data set. It provides statistic information of the selected data. So it's going to be working on a set of rows, a number of rows instead of one by one, and uh, returns one value. Aggregation functions include sum, average, which uh, is read as ABG, max, min, and the count. So sum, average, maximum, and min, they, they are just what they, describe, they are named for. They calculate the total or average or maximum and minimum of the data set. We also have a count function, which includes more information. There are three types of count functions. First is the count of a column name. So if I'm counting, for example, instructor name column, we will count the number of rows where a value exists in this column. So it will count all the rows where instructor name is, it has a value, not now. Remember, this is a count of row. It is not count the value, the distinct, uh, distinct value of, of uh, instructor name. Another count function is count star. It will count the number of rows, regardless of the value in any column. Even if there's a now, it will count as one row. The third type of count is count distinct column name. This time, the count will count the unique values in the column. For example, count, ins uh, count distinct instructor name will count the unique value of the instructor names in the data set. We talked about count star versus count column name, and we talked about count column name will count every value, every row that has a value, and count star will count every, uh, every row with a value or with a null. 
in general now are ignored in aggregations. Any calculation on the null value results in null. And this is not only limited to count. The same case for sum, maximum, minimum, and average. The only exception is count star, which will count every row, including those with a null. So let's use a Oracle Live SQL to demo the course. So let's look at the Oracle Live SQL. We'll first go through some examples of uh, sum, average, and the minimum and maximum. It basically returns actual tuition for uh, the sum of actual tuition, the average, and the minimum and maximum. And note that minimum and maximum can be also apply applicable to char columns. And the average and sum apparently only here works on numerical values. Now let's look at some example of the count star and uh, count column. In our particular case, we actually don't have a course without instructor. So count, the count star and count instructor name will return the same value. Let's try to insert a value. I'm bringing up, this is the create and drop statement and I'm going to insert a value without a instructor name. So now I'm inserting, oh, we shouldn't use this uh, primary key. It has to be unique. So we have one more column, one more row. This time count star will return everything, including, uh, including the one with the uh, now instructor name, but count instructor name will return all the values except for the, the, the row with the now in it. That's what, I, that's what we were just talking about. Count star returns seven rows, including the one with the uh, now value and count the instructor name returns all six occurrences where instructor name has a value. And how about count a distinct instructor? We have four distinct instructors. I believe Obi-Wan Kenobi and the Yoda show up twice. Now let's look at how nouns are handled. Let's create a table and insert some values. We have a minus one, 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 two, three, and now in this six rows. So this is a new table and uh, how about we select sum? If we do a sum, it should go through adding all these up together. One, uh, minus one, 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 two, three, and it should return six, right? Now, how about average? The sum is six and six divided by six should be one, is that right? Let's run these two sequels. The sum is six, which is correct, but the average is 1.2. What is the reason? The reason is the last row is a null. So this row is ignored. We're actually calculating five rows, uh, the, which with a sum of six. So six divided by five rows returns 1.2. That's why it returns a 1.2. The minimum and the maximum, apparently minimum should be minus one and maximum should be three. To note that now is neither the maximum, minimum nor the maximum. It is not considered in any of the calculation. So it's neither the max, uh, maximum nor the minimum. Now let's look at average. And then let's look at count. And I believe I, I seem to have two same, same columns here. But count star and should count every row, including those with a now, right? So we have six rows here. And count ID will return count of rows 
where the ID value is there. That should return us a five. And if we are counting distinct ID, it will be minus one is one occurrence, one is occurrence, two is occurrence, three is occurrence, and now is not considered. So it should be four. Although we actually have uh, five values, minus one, one, two, three, and now, now it's not considered. So we only have four for the last count distinct. And that's exactly what you should get, six, five, and four. Okay, so much is for aggregation functions. I'll see you in next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to talk about how to change the table data. So as it happens, when you enter data into the table, you may make mistakes. You may miss a field, you may miss some word, or you may have made a typo. How do you handle these data mistakes? How do you correct them? There are general three approaches. The first of all is the, the toughest is uh, you drop the table, recreate it, reinsert. That basically deletes everything from the old uh, error table. But then if you are just making uh, made one mistake out of one million rows, that's probably what you want to do. The second, the second approach is the delete row, then reinsert that row. And third one, maybe you want to update the value. We already talked about drop, create, and insert before. So this time, for this session, we are going to talk about delete, insert, and update. So first, we review what is the insert statement. Insert statement, we talked about you insert into a table with a column list. Then you provide the values you want to insert. Each insert handles one row. Well, that's a single insert. And uh, for this row, your <coughs> database will enter the value list matching to each column based on your decision. So this is a single row insert. You can also do a bulk insert from other tables. You can do an insert into some table by selecting values from another table. And of course, here you, the second part of this uh, statement, select where, this basically is a separate SQL statement of its own. So you can treat this just as a, if it's a simple, separate independent select statement. And you can apply where, you can apply different uh, select column list and the co column computation too. The only thing required here is that uh, whatever you select in this column list has to match column list here. The, the number of rows, the data type, all must be matched. <coughs> now, of course, just like a single insert, you can also ignore this uh, column list. However, if you do that, the select column list will must be returning all columns in the target table in the order that listed in the create statement. So let's talk about delete. <clears throat> when you want to delete a certain row from a table, you run the delete by delete from keyword followed by the table name. Then you follow by the where clause or to specify which row you want to delete or which rows you want to delete. Every row that meets the Boolean expression here will be deleted. If you don't specify a where clause, it will delete all rows. And remember this, someone missed this, uh, made this mistake, delete all rows from the table. So this is delete. And the where clause here meets the same criteria, same format as the where clause in select statement. And if you can also imagine how this delete is executed. Database will go through row by row if the where clause condition is met. This specific row will get deleted. For example, let's do a little bit of Jedi purge here. We will do a delete for instructor where instruction affiliation equals to Jedi. Then that which means we will go through row by row. We see Obi-Wan Kenobi, 
instructor evaluation equals to the Jedi, we will apply delete to this uh, to this uh, the, the role. Then we also in the same fashion we delete Yoda, delete Anakin Skywalker. When we run into Darth Sidious, where instructor evaluation equals to this does not meet our condition, we will ignore this role, which means in this particular case, it's not deleted. It will remain in the role. So the next effect of this delete from statement is to delete every role. All role whose uh, instructor affiliation equals to Jedi will be gone, and only whoever is not Jedi, either it's this or a nun or something else, remains. So, once you delete a statement, then you can insert the data back by using an insert statement, just like what we discussed before. This is the second approach. The third approach we talked about is to simply update all rows meeting the where condition. So you will use the keyword update followed by a table name to specify which table you want to update. Then you need to put a set. This keyword specifies the column list and the value, the column, the column name and value pair that you want to apply. So you will specify column name one equals to value one, the column name two equals to value two, et cetera, et cetera, separated by comma. Eventually you will have a where clause, which will indicate which role you want to update. Is that everything from the uh, instructor affiliation equals to Jedi? If you do not have where clause, then similar, similar to delete or similar to select, all rows will be affected. You will update all rows. For example, here, you want to update instructor, set instructor name. That, uh, whenever instructor name equals to Anakin Skywalker, we will change the instructor name to Darth Vader and we will change his uh, affiliation to Sis. Right? Makes sense, right? And uh, these two column name and uh, value pair will be this one and this one will be separated by a comma. Update can also be uh, performed by calculation. What we do, what I mean is, if you want to change a value based on the previous value, for example, if I want to have a 10% increase to the actual tuition column, I will do the same thing using update keyword, registration table name, set keyword. I will set actual tuition equals to the previous actual, actual tuition times 1.1, which is a 10% increase, where course name equals to something. Or maybe because uh, Anakin Skywalker has changed his, his, his affiliation, we want to invalidate his class names first for now. So we'll set this as null. And the note here, you can either set this as a calculation, a null, a fixed value, or any other column. So this is the beauty of update. It allows you to do a little bit of calculation of uh, inline editing that you can dynamically change your data. Okay, let's try to work on some SQL examples in Oracle Live SQL. First of all, let's create a table, instructor new error, just to demo our, our points. So we talked about inserting into this table with the existing table from instructor. It's existing data from instructor and four rows get inserted. Let's see what is there. Selected, you see all four rows as we discussed before. Now, if I want to delete from this table without the where clause, guess what will happen? Four rows get deleted, as stated here. Okay, so let's try to do an insert based on column, column list. 
again, we are selecting this abbreviation instruction name. And like we said before, these column lists do not necessarily need to be in a default order, but it has to be matching whatever is specified here. So although instructor name comes first, we can select abbreviation first as long as is uh, abbreviation shows up in this column list first too. So let's run this. Four rows inset, inserted. Let's do a select again. And this, everything is fine. Jedi is in affiliation, Steve is in affiliation, and all names are only name field. Now, you can also do a select in, uh, select by instructor name only. I'm not going to run this because it uh, actually will in, com be in conflict with uh, whatever data I have. But guess what will happen if you do this? Actually, I will run this because it will give me an error. Because select star from instructor will provide you with two rows or with two columns. And here you are only specifying one column. So Oracle will recognize the difference, the mismatching, and tells you, you you cannot do it. Is there too many values? Because you get getting two values here. Okay. So now let's do a delete from uh, actually it should be instructor new error where affiliation equals to Jedi. Guess what will happen? Three rows, three rows with affiliation Jedi got deleted. Uh, let's see, let's start, clean up a little bit first. So let's start from your error and see what's remaining. The only thing remaining is the <coughs> is uh, the one that the instructor affiliation is not Jedi. So let's do a little bit update. This is the SQL we show in the PowerPoint where instructor name equals to Anakin Skywalker where we will update the instructor name and the affiliation. Run it, one row get updated and Let's run this and uh, see what the result is. We have Darth Vader here with this. So this uh, table is uh, properly updated. Let's also do a quick run of uh, tuition increase. It should be throat choking, I believe. So I'm updating the registration table, set the uh, tuition to 1.1, which is a 10% increase. And where course name is called throat choking, which is uh, definitely helpful. Oh, there's no such table, such course. Maybe it is checking. I think I made it. Let me, let me confirm what is there by checking the record. Ah, I'm missing C here. So let's quickly check what is in the registration table. Select star from registration. Did I input the property then? Oh, because I didn't put the correct, correct data inside. That's why SQL statement was not able to find the proper row. But if I choose to increase the tuition of this introduction to the force, one row get affected, and now 
it has an actual tuition of 198. Remember it was 180, right? So this is so much is uh, how do you correct data mistakes? You can either drop the table and recreate it and uh, reinsert, which in my opinion is the most violent, most extreme way of doing things. And you can also delete the affected data and uh, reinsert it. You can also update by running the update statement. And uh, it's even actually beyond update, uh, changing the mistake, because sometimes it's not a mistake. You just want to change the data. Like in this case, you want to increase the tuition and update can help you with that. So we are going to talk about how to change table structure in the next lecture. In this lecture, we talk about changing the data, but what if you want to change the data structure? We will talk about this in the next lecture and I will see you there. In this lecture, we are going to talking about how to change table structure. So we talked about how to change data, data, uh, table data in previous lecture, where you can update or reinsert into a, the row, into a cell in the row. But uh, what if you want to change the table structure, the table content, meaning that you want to have a, new columns or new definition of columns. For example, the tuition was decimal 72. What if I want to increase the tuition and I, now I need to have a tuition of A2? Or maybe I want to add a column, some kind of a type for instructors. These are table structure changes. That is adding a column, modifying column, um, possibly dropping column. Well, there are two ways of doing that. One is you can drop the table, recreate it, and reinsert it. Another way is to use the auto table, a statement called auto table. The auto table, you can add or modify by using the keyword auto table, table name, then followed by modify or add, and followed by new column definition. Now, this is Oracle syntax. The PostgreSQL syntax or some other DBMS is a little bit different. In those uh, DBMS, you will have to say add column instead of just using add. And similarly, if you want to drop a column, in Oracle, you put a drop column, which we are not covering here, but you need to know for dropping column and for other DBMS, you need to check the vendor's manual on how to do it. What we are covering here is Oracle's way of adding and modifying columns, which starts with the keyword auto table, followed by the table name, then followed by keyword add or modify. Then you follow that by new column definition. Adding column is simple. You just add whatever column definition is. For modify, you can either change the data type or you can change the now property, whether it's a not now or now. You can also change them both in one single statement. You can do this modify, actual, tuition, decimal, not now, right? So let's run some Oracle Live SQL to prove our point. First of all, let's say just, I want to modify the actual tuition to decimal A2. That's the scenario we've talked about at the very beginning. Table altered, alter table, registration, modify. So if you check the schema now, in the registration area table, Actual tuition now is number A2, right? Now let's go back to SQL worksheet and uh, try to alter table instructor by adding an instructor table, uh, instru instructor type. 
Oh, I just ran it. So basically, there is already a instructor type column there, and I already put the instructor. Now let me on the table by drop column of instructor type. And because if I want to drop, I do not need to specify the data type. You are dropping that, right? You don't concern what the data type it is. So I will drop a column column dropped. Now let me add it back. So table authored, the dropped column is added back. Let's select star. So you can see that the first time in you add instructor type, it's all default to now. That would be interesting to see how you want to modify is to chart 10 and not now. And if you guess, Oracle will edit it out. You make it wrong, you made it right because there are now values in the instructor type column. So it cannot be not now. What you can do is you can update column, set a value to it so that it's not now anymore. And here we are running an update to set the column type equals to T without a where clause. By not adding a where clause, we are doing this update for all table, for all rows in the table. As you can see, four rows updated, all of them. Now, if I update, if I alter the table to change the instructor type to chart 10 and not now, it will work, right? So, so much is for outer table, add, modify. And the one thing to note, if you ever want to use a drop column, then you will need to use drop column instead of just drop. This is a little bit trick, trick, uh, trick in Oracle. So let's go back to the slide and the review a little bit. We talked about drop, delete, and alter. And students constantly got confused when they first encountered these, uh, these uh, statements. Drop removes the whole table, the whole table definition. It will just drop the whole table from the database. And because of this, we are not specifying column list and we won't use the where either because drop is removing the whole table. Doesn't matter what condition you meet in each row, the whole or every row is gone. Neither is a column list, neither will column list matter because the table, whole table is gone, every column is gone. So the drop syntax is simply drop table, table name. Delete removes row but the table structure is not changed and the table is still there. After delete, table will still exist. Even if you delete without where, which deletes every row, the table is still there with the whole proper structure. It's just that it's empty. So delete its own row. It's not about the column list. It's not deleting column away from rows. It's deleting the whole row. That's why you do not specify column list. That's why it's delete from a table without specifying any column list. But it can have where to specify which row it is. And the author table drop column removes a column. Because if it removes the column from the table, every row is affected. There's no where. So let me quickly write down the proper syntax here. So this is author table, you will drop table, the drop column, excuse me. This is the drop column syntax, your authoring table, you don't add where clause. For drop table, there's no column list, no where clause, you just drop table instructor. 
students sometimes put a star here, thinking that they are removing everything, which is wrong. You don't add anything. Drop table is one key phrase. And similarly, delete from. Delete from, there's no star here. I believe some student got confused with select, so they add a star or a column list here, but no. Because delete is not deleting on column list. It deletes rows. All columns are affected, so there's no need to specify a star or a, a, a column list. You just delete from instructor, but you can put a where to specify which rows is affected by this delete. So, so much is drop, delete, and alter. Let's also compare alter add and the select. So when we say we want to display something, we want to do a select as the column alias. What is the difference between this and the uh, alter table add? Alter table add actually adds a column to a table, whereas selects, that's an instructor, name as something from, as, let's say I name, for example, I name from instructor. Instructor, In case doesn't matter, but I just type there so that it looks better. Select instructor as, is a, uh, instructor name as I name. It's not creating a new role. It's just uh, displaying it for your, for, for your convenience. Displaying that with the title for your convenience. Other table actually add a table to, to this select, All right? So, so far so much for <coughs> all the uh, table changing, including table data changing and uh, structure changing. And the next lecture, we are going to take a deep, deep dive into the where clause and see how we can best utilize all the versatile functionalities of a where class. I'll see you there. In this lecture, we are going to go through where class different options. So we already worked with a where class before. We use that in select, delete, and update statements. Basically, we use the where clause to identify a subset of data which meets a certain condition, which we call filtering conditions. DBMS will then go through each row and apply SQL action on the rows that meet the where condition, whether it's a select or delete or update. These conditions can include the comparison between original columns. It can also be computed columns, for example, in this work class, we have an actual tuition times 1.1 is a 10% increase greater to 500. That will tell us who, uh, which registration will, uh, will have an actual tuition more than 500 if we have a 10% increase. The comparisons can be done by utilizing these comparison operators for you know, equals to, and there are two not equals to. The first one is a standard SQL way of doing not, uh, not equal to comparison. Some databases also use the second one, the more C languages uh, look like uh, not equal to sign. In our course, we will simply use the standard SQL not equal to. <clears throat> then we, of course, we have a greater than, greater than equals to, less than, less than or equal to these operators. We can also combine single or comparisons together to form a compound comparison. We use and or not, which we call a logical operator to, to, to connect two different, uh, compound, uh, to, two different con conditions together. For example, tuition greater to 500 and the sales to less than 200. If both conditions are met, then this will, will be met. If any of them is not true, then the whole condition is not true. Similarly, for OR, any one of the conditions is met, then an OR condition is met. 
for example, tuition greater than 500 or sales less than 200. If sales less than 200, then the condition is true. And similarly, we can have a not. Remember, for this and or not, if each and and or not, the whole where clause is evaluated on one row, on the same row. So for example, this uh, actual tuition times 1.1 greater to 500 and the student name equals to Luke Skywalker is evaluated on one row. If this row have an actual tuition greater to 500, meanwhile, the student name equals to Luke Skywalker, then it will be true. It does not mean that you will choose two rows and these two rows will have a different conditions. This is not the case. The case is uh, all this, the whole where clause condition is applied on a single row, row by row. So there's other, another op option of where clause, which is between end, where you will just put a column name <coughs> or column computation and uh, put, put a between end keyword with lower bound and upper bound. It, meaning, it means the column computation or column value must be greater, to, greater than or equal to the lower value and less than or equal to the upper value. Remember, this is inclusive. So for example here, where actual tuition between 200 and 400? If the actual tuition is 200, it meets the condition. If the actual tuition is 400, it also meets the condition. If actual tuition is anywhere between that, it also meets the condition. Unless it's like 199, then the condition is not met. And another common mistake is, we need to put lower bound, be lower than upper bound. Here you have to be between 200 and the 400. You cannot put between 400 and the 200. If the upper bound is, lower, is less than lower bound, then the condition will always be false. So let's, let's go to Oracle Live SQL and uh, try some quick, where's the, where's the class? So I'm copying this here and let's select from registration table without where class first so that we know what's in there. There are two rows, both from Luke Skywalker. Uh, another is the uh, actual tuition is 198, another is uh, now. So if I run, <coughs> there's actual tuition greater to 150, the first row will return. The second row won't because uh, the, first, the second row's actual tuition is not greater to 150. And now let's do this end. And value means it has to be actual tuition times 1.1 greater to 150. At the same time, the same row, student equals to Luke Skywalker. But the how about or? Or returns two values. <coughs> so here, <coughs> if a student name equals to still, uh, equals Luke Skywalker and the actual tuition times 1.1 is greater to 150, this row meets the condition. And for the second row, as long as student name equals to Luke Skywalker, then the condition is met. This is the definition of or, and you can compare contrast with and. So in this case, for this particular or where clause, both rows meet the condition. We can also put a not additional uh, actual tuition times 1.1 greater to 150. And uh, we can also have this where uh, actual tuition between 100 and 200, which will give us the first row. Now, remember we talked about inbound and upper bound. If I put 198, will the first row still be selected? And the answer is yes. This 198 lower bound is, in, is inclusive. 
how about we put between 200, between 198 and 197, where the lower bound is uh, higher than upper bound. We're not receiving anything because lower bound cannot be higher than upper bound. However, there's no error message. So this is the something to pay attention to when you start using this word between. If lower bound happens to be higher than upper bound, you will not get what you think you will get. You will not get anything. However, you are not getting error message either. So it's difficult for you to, uh, to, to identify. This is something you need to always put in mind when you run uh, between n. So, so much is for numerical comparison for where clause. And we will talk about string comparison in our next, next lecture. I will see you there. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the string comparison for where clause. In comparing the string, we line uh, two strings side by side. For example, introduction versus introductory. We will compare character by character. First character first. Like for, for, for example here, i equals to i. So we compare to n, then n equals to n, and t equals t. We compare so and so forth until finally we reach i versus o. That's how we can tell, tell the difference. If a character, if a string finished earlier, then the string is considered smaller. For example, if I have an intro here, at the sixth digit, intro has no character anymore, but the other two have more, more things to come. So intro is the smallest, whereas the other one is bigger than intro. So how do we compare I versus O? We do character comparison is based on ASCII 2. ASCII 2 is a standard encoding for characters. So here is the US ASCII 2 code chart. And you can see that it starts from the left, upper left corner and goes down first. Then once uh, you finish one column, you start with the second one. So the nu numeric digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, start at the three, third column. And remember, this is hex, uh, hexmal. All these values are hexmal. And the fourth column is for uppercase, uppercase uh, characters. And the sixth column starting with the lowercase characters. In general, zero, less than one, less than two, all the way to A less than nine. And A less than B, B less than C, all the way to X, less than y, y less than z, so is the case for lowercase. Between the data sets, between the character sets, uppercase is greater than numerical values, numerical digits. Lowercase is greater to uppercase. So if you have a comparison between uppercase and lowercase a, lowercase a will be greater than uppercase A, and lowercase a will be greater than uppercase Z too. And also we can use logical operator and uh, between and end. So for example, where student name between A and F, it will start with a character, if someone's name is just A, then this condition is meet, it is in between A and F, then anything like A0, alpha, uh, Albert, Adam, all this will be meeting the filtering, uh, filtering criteria. Then anything start with the uppercase B, uppercase C, uppercase D, uppercase E, are all falling into this this character, this uh, condition, no matter how many characters they have after B, C, D, E. And finally, we have a single F, uppercase F. But anything, Starting with uppercase F with some more characters will be outside of the upper boundary. And remember, lower boundary has to be lower than upper boundary. So you cannot put like between F and A. That will give you nothing. So 
One thing to note, which we mentioned briefly when we introduced data type and in insert, some DBMS such as Oracle can do implicit type conversion. It can interpret the following, following as a numeric comparison because actual the tuition column is a decimal column. So Oracle will try its best to interpret, try to interpret what do you mean by decimal value greater to a string. It will try to convert a string into decimal. And in this case, it happens to be working. Our advice is don't trust it. If they can interpret this right, they can also interpret it wrong. DBMS cannot properly interpret it if you cannot properly write it. An example is 0, 090 0, and the comparison to 10. Is 0, 090 0 greater than 10? If you consider it a character, then the first character of comparison, 0 is less than 1. So the string of uh, 0, 090 0 is less than the string of 110, 10. But if you consider this as decimal value, then 0, 090, 0, which is 90, is definitely greater than 10. So just by interpreting them as different data types, you will have different results. That's why we said don't trust it. Always explicitly write your type. Don't put the single code around numbers. So another interesting topic about string, string is not about comparison, but more like pattern matching. We frequently run into questions like, oh, I want to look for someone's name starting with Luke. If you translate this request into a where clause, it basically means it's a, it's a SQL, it's a string starting with L-U-K-E followed by an unknown number of characters, right? Also, if you are looking for any SQL course on Udemy, what you are looking for is a course name starting with an unknown number of character. It can be zero. Then followed by the word SQL. Then followed by an unknown number of characters. It can be zero. So it can be fundamental SQL programming, which is starting with some fundamentals, an unknown number of characters, the SQL. Then a programming is another unknown number of characters or in our case, introduction to SQL. Uh, starting with unknown number of characters, introduction to, followed by SQL, then followed by zero characters. All these can be matching. And the, the, the similarity between these two requests is that we are looking for a way to combine a known character set with an unknown number of characters. The latter is called wild card. So it will be look plus wildcard. You are looking for something like look with a wildcard or something with a wildcard followed by SQL, SQL, then followed by another wildcard. And SQL provide this wildcard functionality in the like operator. Like will match string pattern containing wildcard. It use percent sign for multiple character wildcard an underscore sign for single character wildcard. Most of us today has experience with the star character, uh, star character wildcard. When you do Unix or DOS operations, it's a similar here, just that you are using percentage. That you're using the percent sign. So you are, if you are looking, there are, here are some examples. You, if you are looking for something starting with S, then it will be a star with the percent, which means starting with S followed by an unknown number of characters. <clears throat> and similarly, ending with T is starting with an unknown number of characters, then followed by a T, that's a percent T. And starting with S and ending with T is a S and T joined together with a percent in between with an unknown number of characters in between. Then containing the pattern SQL is wildcard first, an unknown number of characters, SQL, another set of unknown characters. This is containing a pattern. A common request is 
I want to find something with a word SQL, but regardless of case. In this case, we can use the upper or lower function. We can put the upper in the course name to convert everything into uppercase. Then we will compare, we will use this uppercase string for pattern matching for like percent SQL percent. Of course here, SQL has to be uppercase. And we also have a single character wildcard. If you remember that last character unknown, but it must be SQ, then you can put SQ underscore. Or the first name, first character unknown, but um, there's definitely one character there, followed by T-A-T, M-E-N-T, -E then you can do that. And you can also have multiple underscores, like last four charts unknown, but it must be starting with state that will be provide us with like statement or something. But uh, as you can see, if you use underscore, you have to make sure you really know the strength, the, the length of the string. This usually is not so desirable. So percentage sign is used much more than underscore sign. And the big difference between underscore and the percent is that underscore means there must be a character. So if I put a state, underscore, 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 that means there has to be four characters following. It has to be like statement or state space SQL. You cannot have states plural or staten, so three, three more characters, or something like state one, two, two more characters. None of this will match the four character pattern. While percent means there may be nothing or one or many characters. So I put a state percentage, 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 percentage here. All of this, including the one in top, state SQL statement, state XYZ, state, state space, they will meet this requirement. Uh, by the way, there's definitely no need to put a four percentage sign here. I, I, I put this for them together just to show you what it looks like. But uh, in reality, one percentage sign is enough. So let's run some SQL in Oracle Live SQL. So let me copy my code here. First thing we see here, <clears throat> We are comparing, we are trying to match any student, student name that's greater to H. So when we look at the name, student name Luke Skywalker, it starts with L, uppercase L, based on what you can remember, is higher than H. So any course selected by Luke Skywalker will meet this criteria. So we run this and we see the two rows from registration table. Similarly, when you compare this Luke Skywalker versus L, it's going to be L compared with Luke. And the first character, they equals to each other, but the second character, this one, uh, the L character, does, uh, the L string does not have any second character, whereas the Luke Skywalker has a U. So look Skywalker is larger than L, which means this statement also will return both rows from Luke Skywalker. Now, how about H? We know that L, uppercase L, is actually lower than lowercase, lower than any lowercase. It can be H, it can be A, It can be S, just what like we, what we see. So if I put A here, because L, uppercase L is less than lowercase L, this condition will not be met and we will not see anything from Luke Skywalker. And by the way, <clears throat> for illustration purpose, there are only two rows in the registration table. Uh, both belongs to Luke Skywalker. That's why you do not see anything else. And how about a bonus question? 
student name, name greater than zero. And of course, any character, any alphabetical character is larger than zero. So you will see anything that's starting with the alphabetical number, uh, not of the alphabetical char. And we talk about this briefly. Oracle can manage to interpret this as a numeric comparison, which it returns 180 properly, but you shouldn't rely on this functionality because here I will show you one zero is greater than zero nine zero, which is uh, which is true for everything in registration table. So it will return both rows from registration, right? So much is for character comparison. Now, let's talk about like. So I'm having a series of uh, like statements here, where course name, course name, like intro. What will it brings us? It will brings us introduction to something something right and which it does how about like percentage 101 it will return us all the courses ending with 101 the character 101 oh throw choking 101 and how about this percent force percent it will return to us every every course name containing force regardless where it located at. And you can even have something like a force 101 without any other character in, in from, or introduction to force, nothing, nothing followed by force, which is what it's trying to do, introduction to the force, nothing after F-O-R-C-E. And if you just want to check anything, that is, uh, regardless of the regardless of the case, you can use the upper. For example, if I find anything, try to find anything start containing an F, containing an F, you see farming, you see fighting, you see force. Uh, interestingly, they actually have all the uh, F in, in, in uppercase. How about I use the S? Any course containing an S, regardless of case, will return dummies. You have a uppercase surviving. You have a lifesaver. You have a ghost. Regardless of case, they were all selected because we convert course name to uppercase first. And similarly, you can do this. If you want to use the lowercase as here. Well, this is for demo purpose, but thinking if you are comparing two columns instead of comparing a known string, that's when you need to convert both to either upper or lower, right? So this is what I'm trying to do here. Well, returning the same value, everything contains S regardless of case and uh, for this purpose, for demo purpose, this is just a percentage sign, but you may need to use this to other columns where this will be where you, uh, or combination of columns where this technique will be very useful. Similarly, we can do a like with underscore, which only fits in one row. So instruction name like underscore ODA, of course it returns Yoda, Yoda. If you happen to have some constructor's name, instructor's name to be soda, it will get selected too. But what if it's a Yolanda or Yoloda? Then because it's more than one character, it won't be selected. And we talked about this. We have, a, I believe we have a course whose name is uh, Dagoba Surviving Camp. What will, re what will return from here? It gives us the Dagoba surviving camp, 
eight characters and uh, it's hard to tell here but there are one two three four five six seven oh I think I counted it wrong. It's a seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes. So that's exactly what it's returning. However, if you that that requires you to know that that planet's name is exactly seven characters. If you do not know, or you just think it was six, then it's not going to return anything in the second example. No data found because Dagoba is seven character, and you are doing. You're, you're doing a six character string uh, search. Whereas if you use a percentage, six percentage will still provide you with what is needed. Dagoba is here, right? So in, in general, or in, in this case, 1% is actually the same as 6%. So in generally, you need, uh, it's recommended using percent. Because the fact that you are using a string matching, a pattern matching, means you are not sure about the value. In this case, why would, why would you be so certain that it will be just one, missing one character? So it's why, that's why percent sign is uh, used more popular than underscore. So, so much for uh, string comparison and uh, pattern matching. I will see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to go through now handling in where class. We already talked about what now is. It means a missing value. And it's very important to understand. It means missing value is nothing. Because this explains the next topic we have, we're going to have is a Boolean logic with now. We already talked about conditions. Where class condition, it can be true or can be false. But once you involve now, there's one more is unknown because if it's missing how do you know whether this is true or false you don't it simply means it's not known any logical operation with now will return unknown like if you are measuring one greater to now it will be unknown and if you are measuring one less than now it's also unknown if you want to measure now in a now list it's, it's, not, it's not known either. Now is neither equal to nor not equal to now. The comparison between now equals to now or now not equals to now, both will return false. It's not going to give you any finite answer. I'm sorry, there was a mistake. The result of now equal to now or now not equal to now, both will be unknown you will not get any true answer from either. They are not mutually exclusive, simply because they are simply unknown. So the way you do detection the, to the test now is to use is now or is not now. These two are the SQL statement, the SQL keyword to detect whether it's a now or it's not a now. You cannot use equal to now or not equal now. The number one mistake I see in students involving now is this last name equals to now. A lot of students will write equals to now when they're supposed to write is now. And I do expect seeing more in this class too. So let's quickly run through some Oracle Live SQL. So let's play with some now equals now, now not equals now, now in now, not now in now. Or we haven't talked about in, but basically I believe you can guess what it means. It's a list where you can select from. So first one, select star from now, or let's just run all of them. Because we all know this, all of these will return unknown. So you are not going to, going to get anything. All of them are not, no data found. Now equals now. Now not equals now. No row will ever meet this condition. Or now in now. Or not, even you put not now. Because some people, some students will think, if now in one, two, three is not meeting the condition, maybe I can put a not. 
The truth is, this is not false. I think I made a mistake just now by saying that that was a false. It's not a false. It was unknown. So not unknown is still unknown. And I, the most creative way I saw a student did was that he tried to do uh, where not instructor name like Hassan. His reasoning is if uh, like percent basically will return you anything with a value, right? If it's a null, of course, there's no, uh, a null value will not give you any like percent, right? So this will return you any val anything with a value. And by putting a not, maybe he can get a null. But that's not true because if you have an instructor name equals now, you're going through this row by row for instructor name equals now, the now like percent is going to return you an unknown and not unknown or not now is still now. So you are not going to get away from that. The only way you can do it is by using is now. But the to, in order to show this is now, we need to insert certain values, or maybe I have already got a value. Let me check from instructor table. No, so let's do a insert first. Let me, let's insert over Lars, which, which, who is not associated with any affiliation. And now let's do equals now. Is there going to be NA equals to? Apparently not, because even for open Lars, now is not equals to now, right? How about equals to now enclosed by single quote? What it does, and I do see students doing this too, but what it does is it's creating a var chart, a char string of N U L L. So it's not now, instead, it's a string with value. Similarly, this affiliation equals to single quote, single quote. This gives you an empty string, a string with no value, uh, with empty value, but it's still a string. So e neither one will provide you with anything, with a matching of nouns, right? And we talked about like percent and not like percent just now. Neither will return anything. Oh, the first one, I'm sorry. The first one will return you all values, right? Because it's a like percent, but not, not percent will not, um, the first one will return you all non <coughs> now values. Whereas the open Lars, whose affiliation is now, will not meet this like percent criteria. However, by adding a not, you are not going to get Owen Lars 2. So the only way to get a now is using this is now. And then you can use a is not now to get all the now now values. Or you similarly, you can use a not is now, which will return the same number, the same rows. So, so much is now, and remember, is now, is now, is now. Do not use equals to now. Do not use any creative way trying to figure out what the now value is. All right, so, so much for now. I will see you in next lecture. In this lecture, <coughs> we are going to go through in and sub query in work class. We already see some examples of in, where you just put a where clause, you have a column name, followed by column name, and the in keyword, followed by a value list inside a parenthesis. For example, where instructor name in Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi. The only thing to pay attention to here is when you use characters, make sure that you're enclosing each character by single quotes not the whole list, 
like the one at the bottom. Some students actually put a single quote around the whole list, which what, what it does is actually asking DBMS to find an instructor name with the Yoda comma Obi-Wan Kenobi. So it's a whole string. It's no longer two separate strings. This is wrong. And so remember, each string should be enclosed by a single quote. And also, this in operator can be used on numerical value too. It will follow the same syntax where column in value list enclosed by a parenthesis. So in operator can be much more useful when you associate using subquery. So what is subquery? Let's talk about a very common usage pattern first. So a very common usage pattern is to use the result of a query in another queries in class. For example, I may want to, to find all the instructors affiliated with Jedi. Then I want to look for all the courses of this instructor. I have two ways of doing that. The first is to, I, I will run a one query, select instructor name from instructor, where instructor affiliation equals to Jedi. I will get a list of results of names, instructor names. I will put this into a select star from course where clause. So let's talk, let's show this in example in uh, Oracle Live SQL. I will run the SQL, run a small query. There are three of, uh, instructors affiliated with Jedi. So I'm copying this over. Instead of writing this down, I'm going to use copy and paste, which is some kind of uh, technical advancement. Then I will use this name list inside an in clause running against course table. And this is a valid SQL statement, which will return the right result. However, think about a university with 2000 instructors. There's no way you can dynamically select these 2000 names either by typing or copy and paste and the former SQL statement. So SQL provide another way of handling this process by putting the first query in parenthesis. Parenthesis, which is here, you put this into a parenthesis and place it in the second query inside this in. So you will have a main query with select from and the where column name in. Then inside this parenthesis, you have a subquery, which will return a, list, a value list. For example, right here, we can copy this subquery, put it inside the in, and run it, and it will return the same result. This is how you use in. Now, if you think further, deep, uh, further down, this subquery thing, it's returning a value list so that we can put this into in. What's the difference between manually typing a value list and uh, selecting something from a subquery and generate a list? The answer is no, there's really no difference. So if you even extend this idea even further, if I have a comparison, like uh, if I want to compare tuition greater to actual tuition, then I can even use subquery to return this one of the values. It will be a single value used using aggregation function like sum or average, or use a single value comparison under any or or prefix. <clears throat> so if you are using aggregation functions, for example, you can have a where tuition greater to 
the average tuition. And this course, this statement will provide me with all the tuitions, all the rows where tuition greater to the average tuition, right? And similarly, in the second statement, I'm going to select the maximum tuition first. I get an understanding of what is the maximum tuition. Then I can filter in the main query, find rows where the tuition equals to the maximum tuition. Let's try an example. In Oracle Live SQL. So I'm going to select star from course where tuition greater than the actual tuition of any fourth class, right? So this value, this subquery returns the actual tuition, the maximum actual tuition for any course that's a fourth class. So let's run the subquery first. And uh, the result is 180. And by applying this subquery, the select should return me any course whose tuition is greater to 180, which it does. And this example actually shows you how to write your own SQL when you encounter these kind of questions. You write the subquery first, run it, make sure the subquery is returning what you expect. Then you place this into the main query. And you can even use the placeholder first. Like I can put, oh, this will be maximum tuition. And once I finish developing my subquery, you replace it. Oops. Right? That's how you write this query by breaking that into smaller pieces. So this is relatively straightforward. Something can be confusing is the all and any prefix. So what or the any prefix does is that it's going to be the prefix of a subquery and it's going to tell DBMS how to handle the processing of the value returning from this subquery. So if it's all, then in this work class, the comparison has to be done after all comparison are done and there, result will be end together. If it's uh, any prefix, then comparisons will still dump row by row for all rows, but the result will be combined using or, which means as long as there's one row from a subquery meter condition, the any clause will, will, meet, will return true but you have to have all rows in the subquery meeting the condition for the all prefix to return true. Again, let's show this in an example. So let's see if all first. What is returned here? It's going to return two rows, 50 and 180. So when you are running this query, you will go through all rows in course, row by row. We talked about this before. All select statements are done row by row. So you have six rows here. Let's copy and paste, paste it here. For tuition greater to all, so DBMS will go through row by row for the first row it will go through the result of this query, which is 80, 180 and 50. It will compare 200 to 180 and to 50. Since both are, both are returning true, this is a good, good condition. This is a true condition where this will be selected. For number two, since the first 100 greater to 180 is raw false, it's false. So this row will be discarded. Similarly, this 99.99, 99, 999, 99 is greater than 180, 
as well as greater than 180 over 50. So the condition is true and it will be selected. And the fourth one is not less than 180. It's a false, so it will be removed. So we go on and on and on, and finally these four rows, they are greater than the value of the tuition in these four rows is greater than all of the actual tuitions from registration. And when you run the SQL, it should, you, it should return you all four. Right? It's returning all four. How about any? The word any means it will return if any of the row inside this subquery will return the value. Now let's see. Uh, let's go, go go get back whatever was there. So all these six rows. And the others, let's just focus in on two because the others are actually pretty similar. Only this one will give us a good example of how things are happening. So for this row, the actual tuition, the tuition is 100. So it will go through all these rows again, all the sub rows, 180 and 50. Is that greater than 180? No, you get a false. But is that greater than 50? Yes. So one of the rows in subquery meets this main queries the condition, which means this row will get a true. So this row will be selected. If you run this query, in addition to other rows, you will definitely get this row. Let's try. Right? So you get this 100 and the other, the rest of them. So this is the all and the any. And you can apparently see that there are some overlapping in functionality between max and all or minimum and any. And the greater to all is equivalent to greater to max and greater than any is equivalent to greater, to greater than minimum. And less, to, less than all is equivalent to less than minimum and less than any is equivalent to max. How to diagnose this is uh, required some deep thinking. So I would uh, leave that to you to go through the definition of all any and the aggregations. But uh, since they are overlapping each other, it's okay to use either and uh, you can feel free to use whatever you are more co most comfortable with. So much for where clause and uh, we will, I will see you in next lecture. Okay, in this lecture, we are going to have a review session. If it's a regular undergraduate or graduate student class, uh, it's a time for a midterm project or exam. Um, of course, there's no such thing as midterm in uh, online class, but still it's, it's going to be very helpful to review what we have learned so far and uh, put this into a big picture of uh, how SQL and uh, how data is used in the whole computer, computer system. So let's talk about data life cycle because eventually when you use a relational model, entity relationship model or SQL, the purpose is to manipulate data. How data exists in a computer system, we generally categorize them as um, four steps. It's a create, read, update, and delete, which is called the crude. In some, in some of the online documentations. This is a generic life cycle of data in any computer system. It's not SQL specific. If you write the Python or Java code, you will have to follow the same process. Although some of the process, in some of steps, you may not aware that uh, this is, uh, has been done. So the first step is create, and the corresponding SQL statement is to create table and the insert data. The second step, of course, once you create a data set, you need to read from the data set. And apparently this maps to the select statement. And then 
usually after you read, you don't just uh, read the data itself. You need to do more manipulation. For example, you need to update uh, or delete and insert, or sometimes you need to alter, add uh, more columns. And eventually, after you finish using this data set, you will drop the data or delete, or in SQL statement, you will drop the table. So this is the whole process or the whole life cycle of data in any computer system. And as you can see, we have already learned all the statements. So this is already a wrap up of uh, what we have learned in the first half. We learned all the statements. Um, the second half, we will go, uh, go deeper into Celeste statement. There are more in Celeste statement on how to read and organize data. So this is uh, so far we have done in midterm in the first half of our, our class. So if, as for the midterm project, we are going to give a real world scenario and we are going to put what you have learned to practice. We are going to go look at the insurance claim invoice. Um, I believe all of you have received some claim uh, insurance claim invoice like this. It has a date and there's a custom ID, a customer name, or in this case, customer is also called patient, and street address, address, city, street, uh, state, and zip code. And for each patient, there's a list of providers who charge you a fee, and there's insurance coverage, and coverage usually does not uh, pay 100% of the fee charged. So there's a balance remaining for the patient to pay. In this case, it will be provider, uh, fee charged, coverage, and the balance. And each provider can belong to certain kind of association. This association can be some hospital, some clinic, uh, some clinic, or so some other uh, healthcare organizations. So this is a claim invoice, and we want to put this into a database, a relational database. And some people, uh, without taking our class, has designed a data model where it has a patient ID, name, zip code, all the way to zip code, and claim, uh, claim uh, date. Let me quickly mark it. So first, they have a patient ID, patient name, patient street, and also they design the claim date exactly based on the, provide, uh, the invoice. And then they also set up this provider line item, provide the ID name, association, and the fee charged coverage and balance. So this is the model they design. And of course, you can immediately see there are issues with this design where you have a repeating groups and you have a data duplications, right? So, As the midterm project is concerned, there are two parts. First of all, you need to normalize the given data model to third normal form compliant. You need to describe it using shorthand representations and uh, draw ERD. You need to provide, create, and some insert statement for the tables involved. And uh, once you've done, you have done this create the insert part, the, there's a part two, I will provide you with a sample SQL to create and populate the tables. Then there's a series of questions asking you to write statements for insert, update, delete, select, and drop. So this is the part of questions for part one. And you will do this one, two, three, four, five. Five questions about normalization, shorthand representation, create statements, draw ERD, and insert into data. And then part two of the, the project, I will provide you with a create and insert. Then there are 20 questions that you need to answer. Find out associate names, find out associate ID, update, add a column, change column, Basically, you, uh, as I go through these questions, you should be thinking of uh, SQL statements that you, that you are going to use. And eventually, after go through all these find out, find out, find out, you will drop all the tables. 
So these are the questions that we are going to have. And uh, good luck with the project. In this lecture, we are going to go through a solution to the midterm project part one. Remember, this is just my sample solution. And the data model is a mapping from real world. So there might be many different by the, by the both correct answers. Your answer may not be the same as mine, but it still can be correct. I'm just providing my view of how to resolve this issue. Okay, let's start by first question, normalization. How do we normalize this design into third normal form compliant? We all know that if you want to do third normal form compliant, you need to become first normal form compliant first, then second normal form for a uh, second, and then you can achieve third normal form. Let's start by first normal form. First, let's copy this over and remove this comment line to make it look better. The problem with this design is that it has repeating groups. And in order to remove repeating groups, we need to move relations inside this repeating group out into the parent relation. So by, remo my, by removing the parenthesis and the designate, both patient ID, which is the original primary key, and the provide ID, which is the repeating group's primary key, as both of the primary key for the new relation, that's how we achieve first normal form. And if you are drawing a picture of table, you will see this part will become one row at a time, and uh, this part will be repeating for each row, each new row. This first normal form compliant. How about second normal form? Second normal form specify we need to remove partial dependency. So for patient name, street address, address to, city, state, and zip code, all these are dependent on parent, uh, patient ID, right? So these should be moved out. Let me copy this over. So these should be moved out together with their original key, which is patient ID, into a separate, into a separate relation. However, this patient ID primary key should still remain inside claim. Similarly, what is dependent on provider ID should be moved out, and the provider ID should still remain inside the claim table. However, there are three columns that we need to mentioning, fee charged, coverage, and balance. All three were a part of the repeating group. But if you, once you put this into a claim table and you examine the functional dependency, you can see they are actually dependent on both patient ID and provider ID. Um, the provider uh, definitely will charge different amount for different patients based on their, whatever diagnosis they have, right? This is a, so these three should, be moved to the claim table, whereas the provider ID and its dependencies should be moved to moved to a different uh, separate table. And now let's put uh, both provider ID and the patient ID as a primary key of a claim. And there's no partial dependency in claims anymore which means it is second more form compliant. As for patient and provider, oops, here, per, per, patient and provider, we now need to create their own and, uh, entity. And don't forget parenthesis for both new relationships. Now we have a second normal form compliant design where there's no partial dependency. However, as you can see here, association name is functionally dependent on association ID. And association ID is not a key, which means there is a transitive dependency here. So in order to remove this, in order to achieve certain normal form compliance, we have to 
move association ID and its dependency, uh, associate ID and its dependency to a separate table, separate relation, and remove the dependent columns away from the provider table. So here we have association, we have association ID. This is a new relation and we need to designate the primary key. All right, so this is the way we design, uh, we're doing third normal form design. By going through one, uh, one normal form at a time, we re gradually remove repeating groups and the redundancies and uh, make sure there's no data redundancy and that there's no, <coughs> no unnecessary repeatings. And sec question number two asks us to identify entities and the layer, layer relationships and their primary key. In fact, by doing normalization, we pretty much have gone through this and identify the entity relationships and the primary key. We may want to see the relationship types. Um, for claim, it apparently have a many to one over patient, patient and the provider. So patient, one patient can have multiple claim, right? And one provider can have multiple claim. So it will be patient versus claim will be one too many. And similarly, provider versus claim will be one too many. And the uh, provider association, uh, let me, re let's remove, uh, re uh, let's name it the provider association just to make the clearer. Association and the provider is also a one-to-many relationship here. So this is how we define their, identify the relationships between each entity. And now let's start to write the SQL create statement. How do we convert a shorthand representation into a SQL create statement? Let's start by handling patient. If you still remember the process, First, you start by writing the create tables keyword, and then patient, and everything else, then adding a semicolon as a best practice, adding a semicolon to the end. The parent, the parentheses are there. So we already get the basic structure of the table. Now the next step is to fill in the table content. Just um, SQL, does not require you to add all the line break. I add line break to here just so that we can see it better. It looks better and easier for us to handle and add in some tabs. These are non-essential, but uh, I'm just making that so that we can see it better. Now the next step, we want to create column by column. We want to make sure column by column, it's a uh, SQL compliant. First things first, to make a name a valid name, we need to remove the space or replace it with underscore. So make all the names of compliant to Oracle's naming standard. And then we add the column data type. So for ID, it's a int. For name and address, let's use varchar because they, their length can change. And the, the length of the varchar depends on your exact application. Here we assume no name, no address will go beyond 100 characters, right? So this is address and name and city name. For state and the zip code, we pretty much know state will be two character, right? And zip code will be five character, a five digit. But um, if you want to use a full zip code, then you can define yours as a nine digit or 10 digit, depending on your data format. Let's put char two here for the state. And now let's put char five for zip code. Remember when we talked about um, the social security number, it's a all digit, but uh, if it's a not, aggregatable, you don't, you cannot sum or average or the sum or average, it makes no sense. Then you should put them as char. 
for better display. Similar, uh, similarly, for zip code, because there's no meaning of sum or average, so you should put them as char. Otherwise, if you have a zip code like in, in New York City or uh, in New Jersey or in Massachusetts where the zip code starts with zero, you may have a four digit zip code if you define them as decimal or int. So in this case, because zip codes are not aggregatable, uh, or the, there's no meaning to the aggregation, you should define them as char. Now, once we finish the column definition, let's check the uh, primary key. Since there's only one primary key, let's remove the star and add primary key constraint as a column definition, a part of column definition. So now you have the patient definition. Now let's do one more for claim. Similarly, we have the shorthand representation. Starting with a create table keyword, wrap it up by adding a semicolon, and let's uh, put it row by row, column by column, I'm sorry. Now, I intentionally put claim date first because I want to let you know that primary key can be any of the column. When you define tables, the best practice is always put the primary key as the first few columns, but it's not necessarily the only way to do it. You can put other, key, other, table, other columns as the first column. But let's make the names naming uh, compliant to Oracle's naming convention by changing all the uh, space to underscore. And then let's add data type column by column. Claim date apparently is a date. Int ID is an int and it's an int, ID is an int. Fee charge, coverage and balance, they all should be decimal. And because it's money, Let's put the A and two, two as a scale, because uh, we assume no charge will be lower than one, uh, lower than one cent, right? So everything is decimal A2. Now, last thing, last thing, last primary key. Because this is a combo primary key, we need to use a table constraint, which we'll put here, primary key, and let's remove the star. We don't patient key, uh, patient ID and the provider ID. And there's no comma after this. So, so much is for creating create a table claim and the patient. We talked about data type selection and we talked about primary key definition. Let me also, let me copy the other two table, my definition of the other two tables here. Basically, we will follow the same process of creating these tables. These are the create segments that I created. You can compare this to your answer and uh, see what's the difference. Again, there are multiple ways, many different ways to approach the same result. And your definition may be different, but uh, they can equally be right. Make sure you understand what you are working on and uh, what are the principles behind your decision. Question number four, draw ERD. And let me bring up the one that I draw, okay. So this is the ERD I draw. As we just discussed, patient have a one-to-many relationship with claim. Provider has a one-to-many relationship with a claim, and the provider association had one-to-many relationship with provider. Basically, that's how you draw a ERD with a crawl foot. Question number five is insert. Insert into provider table, and the, the way you, you do insert is you start by writing insert into keyword, followed by the table name provider, followed by values. Now, you can add a column list here, or you can ignore a column list and we will insert by default order. Let's try 
the ignore for uh, ignore column list first for the first one. So it will be one and add Maria. Remember, for characters, you need to add single quote, right? Single quote, then adding the association ID. We add this three according to the table definition, the columns in the table definition. So it's a provider ID, provider name, and association ID. You can also create insert statements based on a column list. In this case, you will add a column definition here. Provide the ID first. Right here. Comma. Provide the name. Right here. And the association ID. Last where we will insert values to name is Rachel. Remember to have the single quote around it and the 102. Now, the third one, it says we do not know his association ID yet, which means it will be a now. There are two ways of doing this. You can either, without a column ID, insert new ID, bill and the now. This is one way of doing that. You can also using a column list but without specifying association association. And you put a three and the bill without the association ID. This way the association ID by default will go to now. You can use either one of them, but remember because the primary key is three, so you can only insert one of them. You cannot insert both. Okay, so much is for the answers to part one of midterm. We will talk about solutions to part two in our next lecture. I'll see you there. In this lecture, we're going to go through the answers to the second part of midterm project. So this, in this uh, midterm project, uh, in this part, we are going to create some tables first, inserting some sample data, and then eventually we will go <coughs> into answer a series of SQL questions. So let's bring up Oracle Live SQL first. This is Oracle Live SQL. Let me copy the create statements and the insert statements and uh, execute these test statements. So while it's uh, running, all tables created and all the rows selected. And let's see what data we have. We have two providers, three, uh, we have two associations, two provi uh, three providers, and uh, some, some claims from this uh, provider. I haven't uh, populated patient, but uh, it won't affect our SQL. I'm not going to ask questions regarding uh, data in the patient table. So that's enough to inserts. First question, find which association's name is Central City Dentistry. So when you try to do a find out, it always be select star from. And where do we have the association's name? It's from provider association table and the where association name equals to central city dentistry. And don't forget the semicolon as a best practice. Run this, you will get the result. Similarly, <clears throat> the second question asks, which provider's association ID is missing? So we are going to look at uh, select star from provider where association ID. And now it says ID is missing, which means we are going to find some, some of providers where the association ID is now. 
we cannot do equals now because equals now will return you nothing. Equals now, nothing is uh, nothing equals to now, and it will return it, not anything. So let's run this, and you will see no data was returned. You have to use is now to identify to properly identify the row with the association ID of now. Right? Remember, this is the number one issue students have when they handle where clause for now. Is now is the only way to do it. Now, update the association IDs uh, for to 101 for the missing association, which is this row we just selected. Okay, let's do uh, uh, sorry, it should be update keyword followed by the table name provider set association ID equals to 101, where, and uh, we can copy the where clause here. This is how we do question number three, and uh, let's run. <coughs> and one row updated. If you select star from provider now, there's nothing, there's no row with association ID equals now, and uh, if you just run select star, you can see that for Bill, the association ID has been changed to 101. Question number four, change the state column of patient A table to not allowing now. <clears throat> so it will be author table keyword, followed by the table name patient, modify state, to what we desire, not now. Let's run this. Let's check schema. It takes a while to bring that up, but once it's up in the patient table, for state column, the now bow attribute, the now bow definition is not, is no. All right, so let's go back to SQL worksheet and go back to the question number five. So it says add a column called patient deductible to claim table. So it will be author table again, author table, claim table name, add, what's the column name? Patient deductible. It says it must have six digits in which two are decimal points. What does that mean? That means it has to be a decimal, six and two. And now let's add this column. If we go to schema again, check claim table. And now have a new column called patient deductible, right? Okay, let's go back to question number six. There is an old table patient 2018 which have the same structure as patient. Copy all its data into the patient table. So let's go back to, because the, uh, because the question says this new table has the same structure as patient. So let's create it by copying the definition of patient. And this time it will be called patient 2018. Let's insert some fake data. Insert into patient 2018 values, parenthesis. So we have a patient ID, let's put 99001. Patient name is, is uh, let's put the June. And street address, let's just use a now, but uh, now um, uh, this is uh, address one, address two, address three, and uh, let's put the uh, address, uh, there's a state, and zip code is 10001. Remember, this state is still not, uh, is still now. Right? So if I insert this into the 
patient 2018 table. Oops. Oh, we haven't, sorry, I haven't created this table yet. But let's create a table and insert. So patient 2018 has a value where state is this value. Now, what if I try to insert this, the, the data in patient, in patient 2018 to patient? Remember, we defined the patient's state column as not now. So there are two questions. First, how to insert? Insert. And the second question is, uh, let's put A and B. Now, handling, or is there any now handling? Okay, so let's do insert first. Insert into patient. And I believe you still remember this. Let's do select star from patient 2018. It says cannot insert now into patient state column. This, this is now, you cannot insert this now into patient 2018. Now, I know you will ask why this is interpreted as a now in Oracle. This actually is a feature in Oracle Live SQL. It's not a standard, but um, so it should have been now in order for uh, in standard SQL. But uh, Oracle can handle this differently. Uh, Oracle is handling this differently. Um, anyway, the, the, the main point here is, if I put, a, let's say New York here, and uh, let me delete all the data from patient. I'm going to delete all the, uh, the existing data from patient 2018 and then reinsert with some data that has a value in the state column and we insert. Now every time, every, everything is good. So the key point here, one, Oracle manages to convert this quote, this uh, quote, quote, empty string into now, which is the Oracle feature, not a standard SQL. As long as you understand that, that's fine. And two, how to insert into a, another table by using select, you see the statement here. And third, if a column is defined as now, as not nowable, then you cannot insert the data into this column. You cannot insert now into this column as we just see, right? So question number seven, remove all data from patient 2018, but the table should still be there for future use. Remember we talked about how to change data and the difference between drop and the delete. Drop will, delete, will remove the whole table, including the table definition, the table structure, everything will go, go away. This is apparently, it's not we are asking, we are asked here. Delete will remove the rows. However, the table structure is still there, right? So that's what we are going to do here. We are going to delete from patient 2018, where there's no where because it says remove all data. So we don't need any where. Let's delete and uh, the only row should be removed. We actually have already used this statement just now. But this so much is for patient uh, for question number seven, and uh, let me move it up a little bit so you, you know what to pay attention to when you review this, uh, this SQL. And now delete from claim table where fee charge is greater than 5,000. If you still remember, we have selected, we have inserted the one record where fee charged is five, uh, more than 500. So, Right now, we are going to delete from, there should be one row, delete, removed, where fee charged greater to 500. And uh, it says one row deleted. All right, now, 
more select. Find from clean table which record has a fee charge of 200 and the provider number is one. I think there's no call, uh, the, it should return zero because there's no fee charge equals to 200. But uh, what is this, what if I change this to, I believe there's a 120. So in fact, I think I, that, that was a typo from my side. But anyway, select from claim where fee charged equals to 120 and and provider ID equals to one. Run this and it returns, yes, it returns this row. So the question, this question asks you how to use the logical operator of end. And the next question is asking a similar question. It has uh, ask you for rec records, have a fee charged less than or equals to 200, but greater than or equals to 100. Remember these two criteria has to be met at the same time, which means we should use the end operator. So it will be select star from claim where fee charged greater or equal to 200 and fee charged, oh sorry, less than or equal to 200, greater than or equal to 100. I believe there should be two rows returned. Both of them are like between 100 and 200. Now, if uh, the question is between 120 and 200, how many should be returning? Because of the equal sign, it's still fee charge equals to 120, it's still selected, right? So question 12, uh, number 11, find from provider table of records belonging to provider Maria and the bill. What we are going to do is we are going to select star from provider. Now, when each record, each provider can have only one name, right? So a provider can not be called the Maria and the bill at the same time. So apparently this question is asking you to find providers, either the name is Maria or the name is Bill. Because of this, the where clause will be provider name equals to Maria. It can only be one at a time. Or Bill, right? And remember to put single quote around characters. Let's run this and we will see both Maria and the bill. Question number 12, find out what fee charge will be after 20% uh, increase. What is a 20% increase? It means your time fee charged with 1.2, right? So you are going to select fee charged times 1.2. The new value should be called new fee charged. This is a table alias. Table alias so that we need to apply. So it will be as from claim. But when we run this, we will see all the fee chart, uh, new fee charged. But the problem comes in that you do not know which fee charge belongs to which provider or patient. So in, for a question like this, or in real world, when you type in select something, a value, a, a digital, a numerical value, usually I would say 99% of time, you need to put some labels, which means the descriptive columns in the same table so that people know what you are referring to. In this case, you will put a provider ID and the patient ID so that uh, whoever checking your SQL result knows which one it belongs to, which patient ID and which provider it belongs to. That is how you are supposed to write it. 
Question number 13, find out all providers whose names start with B. What does this tell you? It means you have to find uh, uh, the names starting with a B, followed by an unknown number of characters. And that brings up to the like class. Select R from provider. where provider name like B percent and we have to sort it by association ID descending. So it's order by association ID descending. No, semicolon. Who we'll start with the B? It's a bill, right? And because we have only one row, so order by is not a, 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 a applicable here. But uh, if you have more than one row, then it should uh, the order by should be applied, and you can see it's ordered. Question number fourteen: Find out all providers whose name contains E. This is similar. Just that uh, containing E means it starts with an unknown character, unknown number of characters, followed by E, then followed by an unknown number of characters. So in this case, it will be started by like percent E percent, then ordered by Provider name. All right, set star. And we have this E here. Question number 15 find out all provider numbers in the claim table, each showing only once. What does that mean? It means you need to select distinct, as simple as that. Provider ID from claims. And in, if you remember, we have a uh, column pro provider ID one showing up twice, right? If I'm going to select without a provider, uh, without distinct, and uh, let me run both at the same time, so you can see the difference. One shows up twice and uh, here we are only select once. So now, find out all associations whose association name contain D and T regardless of case. So find out all association means select star from provider association where association name contains dent. It will be like percent D and T percent. But it says, regardless of case, which means we need to convert both sides either to lower or upper. Let's use lower here. And don't forget semicolon. And we have all those D and T and D and T. Um, in this particular case, D and T has the same pattern. But if we we'll talk about like C for the character of C, association I101 only have capital C and association 102 only have lowercase c. So if we put a C here, is that the SQL still going to give us both for both the uppercase and lowercase? The answer is yes. It returns both uppercase C and lowercase C. Let's put this back to that. And uh, question number 17, find out all claims whose fee charge is lower than the average fee charged. 
And this apparently, when you see like average or total or minimum or maximum or count, it requires aggregation function. So there are two, two steps that we need to apply. First step is to get the average uh, the fee charged, which will be select AVG fee charged from claim. And the second step will be select star from claim, where fee charged less than whatever value we, we can get from here. Now, if I run this first step, it will be 96.96, 96, so it's 96.667. Right. So if I run this, it will return me one column, uh, one row. Now, we mentioned how we can, instead of typing a value, using a subquery. So this is how we are going to do it. We are going to copy this over this query, place it into a parenthesis, and use the subquery in the main query. Let's see whether the result is still the same. And the answer is yes. The result is still the same. Okay, now question number 18 and 19 is use a different approach for question 10 and 11. Let's go back to 10. What is it? It says find claim table which record has the charge less than or equal to 200, but greater than or equals to 100. For this question, we will be able to use a between and end. So it will be fee charged between 200 and the 100. Now, do you see any question with this statement? If you haven't seen it, if you haven't seen the issue, let's run this. No data found, but we did have data returned before, right? What is the reason? The reason is lower bound is greater than the upper bound. So we need to change this, revert it to between 100 and 200. This will bring us the right number. Question number 11. Question number 11 is select from provider whose name is Maria or Bill. Okay, and uh, in this case, we can use a uh, in, in clause. Remember for in class, each separate value has to be enclosed by a quote. And uh, each value is uh, separated from others using comma. No and, no or inside this parenthesis. And this is another common mistake I see students making. They put a series of uh, values, Maria, Bill, whatever, and then put an or inside which makes it wrong. So this is the result for number 11, and for number 19. And finally, we're going to drop all the tables. Let's start with provider association. Remember it's drop tables, no star, no column name. Provider dropped, and patient, and for patient, remember to drop this 2018. And also drop claim table. Drop all these five tables. And this completes our data life cycle. We create it, we insert it, we do some ransom select and update. And finally, we drop the table, delete the data and drop the table. So, so much is our data life cycle, and that wraps up our midterm project. Uh, in the midterm project, we actually go through, <coughs> in, in the whole midterm, we actually go through um, the whole CREOD life cycle, create, read, update, and delete. Um, <coughs> in the next, in the second half, 
we are going to go deeper into select. There are more information that we can achieve. Uh, we can retrieve from tables by using different variations of a select, a SQL select style statement. And so we will start this uh, in next lecture and I will see you there. In this lecture, we're going to talk about group by. So what is group by? We have already learned aggregation functions, sum, average, minimum, maximum, count. They all describe some statistic characteristics of a data set, like a sum or total or average or minimum. The need is always that we need to divide a table into smaller groups for research. For example, in a grade course, uh, in a course grade table, you may want to check the average grade of one course versus average grade in another course, instead of just checking the average grade for all uh, off school, all course. Similarly, for weather data, in addition to knowing the national average is 50 degree, mm -hmm. you may also want to know what's the average uh, weather, uh, what's the average temperature in New York City and what's the average temperature in Miami. If the national average is 50, but the New York City is the temperature is 10 and Miami is 90, then the average 50 really doesn't help you much unless you know the local weather. Similarly, stock price may have different patterns in different sectors and so on and so forth. There are many examples of that. And group by is designed to serve this purpose. So let's say we have a bunch of tables, uh, data, data rows here, marked with a red, blue, green. If I want to get the certain characteristics of a certain type of color, for example, I want to see the average across green rows and across blue rows and across red rows. So there will be red, blue, green. And what I need to do is I need to specify I'm grouping those tables, these rows, by color. In this case, I will put all those um, green rows together and calculate their group by, their average or total. I will also put blue row together and red row together and calculate, calculate their average. And the average will be per color. Either it's a green or it's a blue or a red. To be more specific and writing this in SQL, this is the group by syntax. We should put the group by keyword after the front clause. And uh, we will put the group by columns, which is the attributes we use to characteristic data, group them by them like color or city in our weather example. Then we also need to provide the aggregations that we want to perform on the group by data set. So it will be select group by columns and aggregation functions uh, from some table, and then we specify the group by keyword followed by the group by columns. The order in group by does not matter. The order in select will, <laughs> will provide you with whatever is displayed. And here, the aggregated column can even come before the group by columns. But one thing to note is that select column must either be a group by column or an aggregated column. And we will discuss why very soon. So for the group by example, is a select student some actual, uh, actual tuition from registration and group by student name. What does this do? It will group different rows in the registration table and map them to student name by student name. Within the same student name, we will calculate the sum of total tuition. For example, Luke Skywalker have uh, two courses registered. Each of that have a uh, actual tuition, one is 180 and 100. Then the sum of this tuition, actual tuition is 80. For another student, Leah Skywalker, she also has two rows and the actual tuition for each row is 200 and 500 and the sum of this student is 700. So that's, this is how you calculate, how you do the group by, group by is by student name and how you do the aggregation which by sum.
we mentioned all columns in select must either be in group by or be in aggregation. That's because non-aggregation columns that are not in group by are returned as a repeating groups, which won't be first normal form compliant. So SQL does not allow selecting groups directly without group by. We will use an example to explain this. So here we have the select student name, course name from registration, group by student name. And course name is not in group by. So if you do the select here, you will see that for each student name, there are multiple course names. And if you are putting this into one single statement, into one single table, it will result in repeating groups for each student name, which is a one group by. So this is not in the first normal form compliant. Because of this, every Select, uh, select statement, uh, every select columns must be either group by or aggregation. Now, so if the student only have one course each, then it is possible that there may not be repeating groups based on data, but it will be all rely on your data, what the data look like. So SQL choose to enforce one first normal form by default. It will not allow you anything like this to happen, just to make sure every, every select will generate one first normal form compliant table. So this is the select with the aggregation. Aggregations do not need to be in group by, because these functions will only return one value per group. Thus, it's the first normal form compliant. So in this uh, slide, you see the student name, you see the sum, these two are whatever selected by group by. Remember, each group by, each value in the group by column will return one row, as we show before here. Each group by value will return one row, one row, another row, right? So in this case, each student name returns one student name plus his or her sum. This is the meaning of group by, and this is why you can only have group by columns and uh, aggregation functions in the select class. You can also group by multiple columns. For example, you can also group by student name and the course name. In this case, we still need to make sure all select columns are either in group by columns or is an is a aggregation function. And uh, in this case, because we have a, we are we are selecting student name and course name, and because they are because of the nature of our data, student name and the course name happens to be equivalent of our primary key. So when group by is on a primary key or a candidate key, it will be the same as a normal select without group by. But this is basically uh, is for your convenience. When you want to calculate aggregation, do not assume the data will provide you with uh, any convenience. If you need to calculate average or sum or any of the aggregations, always use group by. Group by can also be combined with order by. Basically, the result set of group by is a series of rows. Each of the group by column value returns one row. So you can still do, be ordered by the columns in this result set. But the, because all the by only sees the result of the group by, not the data result in the detailed data set. All the by can order only order the columns in the group by or aggregation functions. It cannot order by the columns in original data set if the columns are not selected in the result set. So this is the simplified group by syntax. You will select group by columns and the aggregate, aggregated columns from some table, 
you will group by the column, group by columns, and you can order by the subset of columns in select class. You cannot select columns that's not that is in the original table, but not in a select class. And of course, once you see a select from, you will have a question whether we are going to have a where class or not. And we will cover this in our next lecture. But before that, let's use Oracle Live SQL, run some sample data, some data sample SQL to enhance our learning today. So this is the first one. We will, we will run this query, which is in our class slide. It shows you the student name, the actual tuition, the sum of actual tuition from registration, grouped by student name. Now, the second one is you can group by multiple column. In this case, like we said, it's actually returning each and every row because this uh, student name and course name combination happens to be equivalent to the primary key, which is the student ID and course ID, and thus it's a candidate key. But what will happen if we remove course name from here? Then course name is not in group by, but it is in select by. It tells us course name is not a group by expression. It has to be in group by, or it has to be aggregation. And finally, let's see the order by class, where you can order the order the result by course name. And if you remember, I believe a course ID is also. Oops. In the registration table, what if we try to order by course ID? We get an error because it's not in group by and it's not in the aggregation function. However, if you want to group by uh, order by aggregation function, that will work. All right, so, so much is for this uh, group by introduction. In next uh, lecture, we are going to talk about where and having which is the applying filter conditions to the group by result. In this lecture, we are going to go through where and having in group by. And simply put, that means we are going to go through how to apply filtering conditions to group by. So when, you, when we go through this uh, group by, from a table exercise, naturally a question will come up. What if I want to apply certain filters to the group by process? There are two places where we can apply the filtering condition. First place is here on the detailed data set, the, on the original table. You can apply filters like uh, if I want to see only certain course, only a certain student or some other patterns. And also, another place to apply filtering conditions here. In the, <coughs> at the end of a group by, once you get the group by result, I want to see maybe for, only for the students whose total actual tuition is higher than 600. Or in the retail scenario, I may want to only see clients who has paid me $500 or more in total. Right, this is uh, the, my best customers and I want to probably give them some uh, discount or some coupons so that they will, they will come to me again. So these are very legitimate questions and the worry we, we run the, into these questions every day. But there are some difference between these two uh, filtering conditions. The, the filtering on the left are against the original table. So they will not see the aggregation value. You cannot apply um, a filter like a where, you cannot apply a filter like on the two total tuition here because at this point, the total tuition hasn't been calculated yet, right? Whereas here, it, after aggregation, you do have the aggregation functions uh, results, but you don't have all the details. You only have the group by columns and the, the aggregation functions. 
if uh, some column in the original data set is not selected in group by, you will not see those in the aggregated function. So in order to distinguish between these two different uh, kind of uh, conditioning, group by introduced two levels of uh, filtering. One is the original where, same as before. Another is the having. Having is a condition that only apply to the aggregated data set or the data set after group by. So I'll give an example of this. If we have a having condition of some actual tuition greater than 600, it only applies after this student and the sum calculation is done, not in, not here. Oops, I need to clean this up and redraw. Having is not applied here. Instead, it's applied here and here for whatever has been selected. So in this case, because this 280 is uh, less than 600, it got filtered out. And this 700, is good. Hopefully you make some sense out of my all the weird drawings, but uh, the idea is pretty clear. Having is applied on aggregation functions on the aggregated data set, and it cannot go inside these two columns because these two columns are not in the aggregation. Thus, having cannot see these two columns. Right, let's uh, move to the next page. This is an example of having, which we will use in Oracle Live SQL very soon. Let's bring up Oracle Live SQL and uh, This is the student name where uh, student and the sum of uh, actual tuition. Now, if you remember, we have two rows returned before without having one uh, as a sum of uh, 200 something, which is uh, less than 600, so it's filtered out. Now, what if I put where? Remember, where has to be after from. What is the error? It says group function is not allowed here, which means group function is not allowed in the where clause. Why? Because where is applied in a detailed data set and let at the time of a where application. This sum, this group function has not been calculated yet. So it's not available, right? <clears throat> but what if I want to apply A where clause like a course name equals to introductory to the force. This is doable because course name is available at the time when you apply where to the detail table, to the original table, right? There's no data found because each single one is less than. Now let's do great to. This will return some data to show you the. Uh, what I mean. What if I want to put a course name filter to having? The answer is not a group by expression because course name is not in select class. So you cannot apply having the, uh, when by the time DBMS executes having class, it cannot see this course name. That's why you get this error message saying it's not a group by expression, right? So, so much is this having examples. And let's uh, go give a formal definition of having. Having class, in order to apply a having class, you need to write the keyword having after the group by class, then followed by the filtering conditions. Conditions will, must be applied to the aggregated data set 
and only data in the aggregated data set should be used. It, that means it is, it's a either aggregation function or a group by column. And that's how it looks like having is after group by, and there has to be an aggregation, some data in the aggregated data set. And having versus where, where is applied on the original data set. It cannot operate on aggregated data set, which means it has not access to the aggregation functions. You cannot have a where sum something or where average something. Having is applied on the aggregated data set on the other hand. So it cannot see the columns that is not in the aggregated data set, even though the columns may, may be in the original data table. And for those in the group by column, you can actually use both where and having. In this case, you, can use, you should use where whenever possible. For example, you can filter on the student name in, either in where class or in having class because it exists in both the original table and in the group by column. But we always want to filter before any processing. That's why we always try to put the filters into where class as early as possible. Having finished the uh, having class, we, have, we are already done with all the group by uh, statements, all the group by functionalities in the CLS statement. And the execution order of group by is done in four steps. The first start from the from where class and continued with uh, select and group by, then having an order by. So here is uh, an example. When you write a select statement, it will always be select something from a table where with some Boolean expression and group by a group by columns, then apply having and order by. What would you do here is the uh, DBMS will start with a from where class. It will pull the data first, pull the data set first, then it will group by the columns and calculate the aggregation columns. Then it will apply having condition to the aggregated functions, uh, aggregated data set. And then it will sort it, the, the sort of data from following the group by order, order by order. For example, in this select, we have a from registration where registration date greater to something, uh, October 1st, 2019. At step, step one, DBMS can find the registration date, this column in table. So this uh, filter can be properly applied. Then we will group by student name and sum of uh, actual tuition. At step three, DBMS can only see student name and sum from the group by data set because at step two, group by already form its own aggregated data set. So as to step two, three and four, Having an order can only apply to the student name and the sum columns. It cannot go into the registration date anymore. And uh, on the other hand, because where clause is applied in the first step, at that time, sum has not been calculated yet. Sum which is calculated in step two. So you cannot put sum in the where clause. So a quick summary, where is on detailed or original data table level and can use all source columns, but not the aggregated columns. Having is on aggregation level and can use all select columns, but cannot use other columns in the original table. All right, we, we are done with the group by and we'll go into data, uh, data set operation in our next lecture, I'll see you there. In this lecture, we are going to talk about data set operation. So far, all our works has been focused on single table, but apparently there are more to uh, in SQL than just uh, working on one table each time. And you need to do a lot of data blending, which means mi mixing data from two tables or even more together. There are two types of data blending. One is called vertical, another is horizontal. Vertical blending 
also called as um, set operations, means simply combine rows from two tables together. Like in this example, table one, table two, you are simply mixing their, row, their rows row by row. And horizontal blending, on the other hand, mix columns together. So this table plus this table, you will get the same amount of rows, but it's a mix of two set of columns. We will talk about this horizontal blending, which also is called join in the later session, actually in section 11. But for this one, this particular session 10, we are going to talk about set operation. First session, first uh, set operation we're talking about is union. We are going to link two statements, the two CLAS statements with the union keyword, which will return us the rows in either of the data sets. For example, student registered in 2018 or student registered in 2019. If a student registered in 2018, but not in 19, or the other way around, if a student registered in 2019, but not in 2018, both students should be selected from this union. What if a student exists in both 2018 and 2019? In that case, we should see him or her only once. This is the union clause. And uh, the requirement of union is that uh, the column list from both select must be the same. We talked about union uh, returns on a distinct value, like uh, one student registering both select uh, 2018 and uh, 2019 will be only returned once. But sometimes you may want to see all occurrences in, like uh, you want to see the student account, uh, shows up twice. This can be helpful if you are doing a count. To show all occurrences, use union all. It has the same structure, just a different uh, keyword, adding an all after union. So it will still be the union all between two select statements, and these two select statements must have the same column list. So we are, for union and union all, both are just merging data together. There's also intersect and minus. Intersect means data in both of the data sets. For example, student registered in both 2018 and 2019. If a student registers only in 2018 or only in 2019, he or she should not be included. This is what the intersect means. And again, column list must be the same, otherwise we won't be able to properly intersect. And also there's also a minus, which means data in one data set, but not in the other. For example, student registered in 2019, but not in 2018, they will be selecting from 2019 table minus student, uh, minus the select from the 2018 table. And we can explain this with a chart. If uh, each circle is a data set, and the overlapping part means the data that exists in both cases. That means we <coughs> union is to combine them together. It's the, to the left part, the whole area of uh, both uh, cycles, both circles. Intersect is the overlapping part of the two circles. And minus is just one, it's just um, one circle minus the overlapping side. Let's try to, show this in Oracle Live SQL. So this is Oracle Live SQL. And uh, we are going to use an example to explain what we mean on all these uh, union and uh, intersect and the minus. We're going to create two tables and insert some of the data here. Two tables with a different uh, structure, but in the first table, we have a one and a one and two and a three. In the second table, we have three and 
and four. But ID, there are two ID equals to one. There are two ID equals to one. And there's an overlapping of three. So if we do a union, what will happen? And we're only selecting column one and two, column one and two, column one and two. So you will see that ID equals to one will only show up once, ID equals two show up once, ID equals three show up once, and ID equals two, four show up once. Basically, it's getting all these six occurrences, but only display the, 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 the unique result. What if we do a union all? Because union all will return all combinations. So all six columns, uh, six rows will show up. You see two ID equals one here and uh, two ID equals three here. How about intersect? Intersect will show the result that shows up in both places which means it's just ID equal to three, right? So let's run this intersect. And it shows only ID equals to three. And the last but not least, minus. Minus means everything in subset one, but not in subset, excluding everything that's in subset two. So we are going to do this minus, and it's one and a two, and three is not in subset two, right? So this is what we mean by all these set operations. And starting next lecture, we're going to talk about join, and I will see you there. In this lecture, we're going to talk about table joining. Table joining is a very important feature of SQL statement. We already talked about data blending, and uh, we talked about vertical blending, meaning putting two tables together row by row. We haven't, what we are going to talk about right now is horizontal blending, uh, aka join. That means place two tables side by side, having the same amount of rows, but uh, add their columns together. List the columns one uh, side by side. So, why do we do a join? Because sometimes we need to look up a value from another table. For example, in the course table, we have course name and instructor name. But what if I want to see which instructor affiliation is associated with uh, each course? Instructor affiliation is only available in the instructor table. In this case, because both course table and the instructor table has a column called instructor name, we should be able to search the value by matching the instructors. So for example, the course introduction to the force, we can look at the instructor name, Obi-Wan Kenobi, find the same instructor name in the instructor table and identify the abbreviation, which is Jedi. Thus, we can confirm course name is associated with the instructor affiliation Jedi. And this is how we will do it. But in DBMS, it's the same way as uh, what we have been doing for all the CLS statements. We are going to do it row by row for both tables. So for each row in one table, for example, course table here, we will go over each row in another table, which is instructor here, to find the rows with matching values. For example, the first row of course table is an introduction to the force. For this row, we will go through instructor table and we run into Obi-Wan Kenobi first, which matches the instructor name. So we, we have a match here, instructor instruction to the force matches instructor affiliation. The second row, however, in instructor is the Dacidius. And Dacidius instructor does not match Obi-Wan Kenobi. So we have a no match for this row to row match then we completed all rows in the instructor table. We go to the second row of a course table. And then we go to the third. Like for example, in the third row, throw choking, 101, that's serious. When we match for the first row in instructor table, Obi-Wan Kenobi does not match that serious. 
thus it's a no match. And uh, the second one, second row in instructor table, the instructor name is Dacidius. It matches with the instructor name in the course table. So throw choking 101 matches with the instructor affiliation, this, that's a match. So by going through this row by row, the result is a list of uh, identical instructor names matching with each other. The end result is equivalent of applying a where clause of the uh, following instructor dot instructor name equals to course table dot instructor name. And this is how we are going to write a join. We are going to link two tables by matching common columns. We will list two or more table names in the front class separated by comma. And uh, this separated by comma is important because a lot of students, when they first write join, they forgot about it. Then the second step is add join condition to the where class. So officially the SQL will be select instructor affiliation from instructor comma course where instructor dot instructor name equals to course dot instructor name. And there is a problem with though. You can see that we have instructor name in both tables. That's why we need to put a table name in front to fully qualify the name. If I do not put the, the table name in front, we will run into an error message. For other, other columns like instructor affiliation, it only shows up in the instructor table. So there's no need to put the instructor dot qualifier in front of it. However, it's recommended that you add this qualifier in front of every column to make sure your readers, your users, understand where this uh, comes from. This is especially helpful when you have multiple tables joining with each other. The other thing will come up is, as you are writing all the qualifiers, this can be really long, thinking about the names like the instructor, instructor affiliation, course, this can be extremely long. So there's a way of simplifying this SQL statement by adding a table alias. So you will add an alias after the table name and use this alias throughout the SQL query. For example, in here, we put an I after instructor. And then wherever we used to use instructor, we use an I dot as a qualifier. Similarly, we have a course C. We use a C can represent course. Thus, we can use a C dot as a qualifier instead of course dot as a qualifier. Now, how to naming the alias is a personal uh, personal preference. I personally like to use the first letter of the table name, or first two letters to identify the table. And some people like to use, simply use A, B, C, or some people use A1, A2, A3. All these are perfectly fine. It's uh, your preference. Just make sure that you and your users can, can understand it easily. So, so much is for join. Let's do some Oracle Live SQL to help us better understand the joining context. So this is our Oracle Live SQL session. First, let me bring up the join statement. This is the one that we have a select instructor affiliation from instructor and course. And where instructor course name, instructor name equals to course dot course name instructor name. So let's run this query. And it brings us instructor affiliation of the five five courses that we have. Now, if I add course name, we are going to have course and instructor affiliations row by row. Now, we also talked about adding qualifiers in front. We can put the instructor qualifier in front of uh, instructor affiliation and we can put the course 
qualifier in front of a course name. What if I put the instructor name without qualifier? What will happen? You will get the error message saying column ambiguity defined because there are two instructor names in two different tables. And you have to add, for example, course dot instructor name. Of course, because we have this equal sign, so these two columns are actually identical. You can either add either table, both will be fine. Let's run that and it will come up. And now, what if I add a uh, alias as a C and I? So we will replace all the C uh, course, course table name with C and all instructor table name with I. Now let's run and we get the same result. Okay, so much is for joining the table. Now in next structure, in next lecture, we are going to talk about another form of a writing join statement, which will be much more easier to understand. I'll see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to talk about joining using the join, the join keyword. So we already talked about using joining condition in the where clause. But uh, the problem with this approach is that we also put filtering conditions in the where clause. So if I have the same joining statement as the, uh, we talked about in last lecture, and I want to add a filter where course name contains the word force in it, that will be the statement you will look at. Select something from something where instructor name equals to instructor name and course name like percentage force percent. Now we only have two tables and the one join condition and one filtering condition. Imagine you have 12 tables joining with each other and uh, 13 for filtering conditions. And this happens a lot in the real world. In that case, you will have 25 separate courses in the where, where portion of the select. It will be mixed with each other and it's hard to identify where is the joining condition, which table joins which which one, and what's the filtering condition. To resolve this issue, SQL introduced the join on keyword to separate the join from filtering conditions. What it does is it, uh, it removes the joining condition from where clause into this specific join on keyword. So the same old <coughs> filter, the same old joining from instructor course where instructor name equals to instructor name becomes from instructor I join course C where both tables shows up one in front, another in join and the join condition will be on their own clause where it says on i dot instructor underscore name equals to c dot instructor dot underscore name. And if you have where clause, the where clause will solely contain the filtering condition. There will be no, no longer mixed with the joining condition. So let's see the official syntax. You should put one table in the front class, only one, and together with its alias. Then you put a keyword join, J-O-I-N, following the front class, followed by a table name, another table name. Again, only one table. Then you followed by the own keyword, followed by the joining condition. If you have more tables, then you will add more join and add more own. Each table joining as a one join and one own. So this is the official join syntax. And next, we will use some SQL example in Oracle Live SQL to show you how to, how to write a proper join. So this is the SQL we just used. And if you still remember, this is the join course. This is the, the join statement we just wrote. How to convert this into a join table, uh, a table joining? So instead of comma, let's write a J-O-I-N, 
remember one serious join there's only one table in each class do not use comma then this join condition should be in the own class right after the join class and then everything used to belong to the where class still belongs to the where class which is the filtering condition now let's run both together and compare their results side by side you will see that they are actually returning the same result so much is for join um, because of this uh, join advant advantage of uh, this joining uh, it's a simpler and it's easier to understand um, most mo modern dbms are supporting this and this is the syntax we are going to use we will not use a joining where where class we will always use a joining where join class and as we go introducing more tables and the more joining conditions you will you will see how adventurous it is comparing to the where class okay in next lecture we are, that's exactly what we are going to do we're going to introduce multi-table join and i'll see you there In this lecture, we are going to talk about multi-table join. So we already show you how to join two tables together. What if I have more tables than two? So if I have uh, three tables joining here and the center around one table, it's called a star join. Of course, this doesn't look like a star, but imagine there are five tables joining into the same table in the center. Then they will look like a star, right? That's why this is called star join. Star join means join from one table to multiple tables. For example, here, we have this registration R and joining both student and the course. In this case, we are going to write the registration in the front and then from, from this R, we will write one join at a time. Each join is a join table alias on join condition, followed by another join another complete join table name table alias on join condition and if you have five tables you will repeat this join on five times you have uh, 12 tables you repeat it 12 times that's what we call star join another possible scenario is called chain join where we join from one table to another and uh, then this uh, second table join to the third table what we are going to do is um, we are going to select from registration table, join course, then the course table C will then join an instructor table. In this case, we're still starting from the first table, write the complete join, <coughs> the join class, where you have a join table name table alias on join condition then followed by another join clause where you have the join table name table alias on the condition so essentially this chain join follow the same way as in star join where you have one table called from you're using in the from and each full table added is in another join with the own clause of a join condition one thing to note is that in chain join, you need to avoid looping join. For example, here, this table is joined with uh, table one and table two. Then both table one and table two joins with table three. What's the problem with this? The problem is, in real world, if uh, such a loop join happens, usually it's because table one and table two are coming from two different sources. And usually there will be data inconsistency between these two data sources. And when you do a loop join, the data consistent inconsistency will cause you to lose data. So even though your data source may have different, uh, different data or data inconsistency, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't try to uh, overcome that by doing a looping join 
you should always do either one way of join or the other way of join, but not both. Okay, so much for looping join. We talked about chain join and the star join. If we mix them together, oops, let me clear my drawings. And you can see here, we have, uh, okay. we have a looping join, uh, we have a <laughs> chain join here, chain join here, chain join here, and another chain join here. The only difference, uh, and if you are ignoring these chains, each chain is actually a star join of itself, joining the fact table. So this is the, actually the most common usage of SQL query, because this looks like a snowflake where the star has more stars. We usually call it a snowflake join. You may be wondering, why would you do all the join, especially when you think about the all the normalization we do? Didn't we break a big table using normalization? Why do we want to join the tables back again? The reason is there are two types of data usage. One is the operational or transactional, where you are writing some single entries to the table. You want it to be fast. You want it to be simple. But meanwhile, you want to maintain integrity when you add or update new data. This requires, <coughs> this requires normalization to avoid complexity and redundancy. But once you write all the data into the table, you want to read it out to, for analysis, analysis. This is the analytical side of data operation. You want to read through the historical statistics involving a, a variety of information. In this case, you need to join data from multiple places to perform complex transformation calculation. Now, because analytical needs are usually more time tolerant, you can run, it can run slower whereas uh, the operational side requires faster access. So when you design data model, you tend to uh, emphasize more on the fast side. That's why you want to always break the data into smaller pieces, break the table into smaller pieces to make sure it's fast and it's simple. And then when you need to read data, you can use join. It's slower, but it will serve the need. So this is a joint versus normalization, and hopefully this will explain a little bit on why we need to join. Now let's run some SQL in Oracle Live SQL to show you how this uh, join works. So first we have a star join where the registration table join the student table and the course table. Both joins come from registration table. And that's how, we, how that looks. We have a course, we have a student. This shows us which student registered inside each course. We can also have <coughs> a chain join where registration R joins course C, then course C joins the instructor. This will provide us with a list of regist registered course name and uh, their instructor affiliation. And finally, we have our favorite topic, the snowflake join, where you will have registration joining student and the registration joining course. And on this course branch, we have a chain join of course joining instructor. And this is what we are going to get for the student and the course name and instructor affiliation. All right, so much is for this lecture. We'll see you in next one. In this lecture, we are going to go through select statements with a join and group by. So right now with a join and group by, we have learned everything of a select statement. This is the full syntax of a select statement. You will select from a qualified column list. 
from one table, join another table on a join condition, possibly repeating the join on multiple times. And then we have the where clause to screw a filter on the detail level. Then the from join where forms a detailed data set. And from there, we do a group by. After the group by, we have a aggregated data set where we will do a having on top of the aggregated data set and order by this aggregated data set. The execution order of a CLS statement is exactly like what I just described. We will start from join where, which creates the detailed data set. Group by on top of this detailed data set will form an aggregated data set over the join tables. Then we use having to filter on aggregated data set and use order by to sort the result. Why this is important? Because this, this is going to be the same way, same order that you write a comp a complex CLS statement. There's a lot of questions from students then how to join, how to write a CLS statement. A lot of question was, uh, I, I see the question, I know I need to pick from this table, this table, but I do not know how to put all these questions into a CLS statement. And this is what we are going to talk about. So we have these four steps from join where, which forms the base the fundamental the detailed data set. Group by forms the aggregated data sets, having filter on the aggregated data set and order by, sort the end result. And that's exactly how to write a CLS statement. First of all, we need to find the tables involved. For each column required, the question will always ask you to select, to find, to identify some columns. We need to uh, find for each column required the source table of the column. Once you have all the tables, the source table, once you have the source tables, you will start from a from. You will usually find a table with most join keys in the from class. Usually it's also a table with lowest level of detail. You have a one table in the from class, then we do a from from join join. You will add other table names in the join class, then add join key in the on class. For each new table, we add the independent join on class. So we have a from join on, join on, join on, etc. Eventually, this from join will form the big data set. Then we will add a where condition. And this 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D forms the detailed data set. From there, we apply aggregation by add group by for each, for each. In a question, you always ask for each something, like uh, for each student, give me the total tuition. For each course, give me the total registration. This for each is a group by. Each for each, for each is a group by. Once you have a group by, you have a group by columns, you add the same column to select. And then you add the required aggregation functions to select. After that, you can add having and order by. This is how you write a join sta a CLS statement. Now let's use Oracle exam uh, as a Oracle Live SQL as an example. So let's say we have this question. Find the instructor affiliation for each course and identify the student count. How many columns do we, do we have here? We have the instructor affiliation. We have the course where we can just say it's course name. And we have a student count. So you need to count student ID. Apparently student account is a count of student ID. And which will be from claim table. And we, we know that we have a course name in claim, but assuming there's no such table, that we need to go to course table for this information. And the first is uh, instructor affiliation. Apparently, this is instructor table. Instructor table. All right. So Claim table apparently have the most detail, lowest level of details. So let's do from claim. Then we do 
join course. You can, of course, join instructor, but there's really no, nothing related between claim and instructor. So we need to join from course, from claim to course. I just put CR on C dot course ID equals to CR dot course ID. Then from course, we will join instructor I on C dot instructor name equals to I dot instruct name. And if we have any where class required, we should have put it here. For example, for course, where C course name like percent force. This is just an example. Let's just say that. So this is the detailed data set. If you run a Celeste star right now, you will see that it's actually giving us oops, Oh, I forgot to create a table. Okay. Now I already created the original table. Let's try. If you run the Celeste star So if I, uh, I think I accidentally type in claim as a instead of registration. Now that it's corrected, if you run this with a select star, you will see every column from every table and all the rows of the joint result. This is the detailed data set, right? But of course, we are not only interested in this detailed data set. We are also interested in, for each course, so this is a group by. CR dot course name. And once you have the CR cross course name in the group by, we do a select. Uh, and now count. This should be registration table. This is the group by. So now let's run this and we will have a count. Of course, you can add having and an order by if you ever want it. But uh, basically, that's the way we write a SQL statement. You will start from from. You will start from by identifying the tables involved and the re their relationship. Start from writing a from. Add a table at a time, which is a join and own. Uh, apply where. Thus, you get the detailed data set. Then on top of that, you add select and group by to get the aggregated data set. On, the th on top of the aggregated data set, you apply having, and you apply <coughs> order by. No matter how many SQL you have, how many tables you have, this is the way you should write a complex SQL statement. All right, so much for writing a SQL statement. I will see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to talk about advanced joining we are going to talk about the columns used in joining. So far, within this course, all joins are performed on one column with same names from different tables. For example, when we join course and instructor, the join key on both tables are called jo uh, instru instructor name. When we join course and the registration, the join key on both tables are called course ID. This actually makes sense because the definition of a join is to match different entities on their common attribute. And uh, if it's a common attribute, they should have uh, the same name within two different tables. This is called natural join. SQL can also join tables or multiple columns or 
columns with different names or both. And this is more common in real world. For example, joining on multiple columns, here we have a one table joining another. And in the join in, uh, in the own class, we have matching column one equals to matching column one and the matching column two equals to matching column two. If you have more columns in the join key, you can add more end, but the own still remain the same. And remember, this is the one key that uh, <coughs> when you pay attention to for each on class, there's only one on. Everything else, all the uh, equals here are linked by end operator. The other common scenario is SQL can match tables on columns with different names. We will follow the same syntax from table one join table two on a join condition. The only difference here is in the join condition, the two columns names can be different. Now, because the table names can be different, we do not necessarily need table qualifier. However, it is still a best practice to use table alias on all columns. Table name can be different just because of the description, how they were named, and they can still be meaning the same thing. For example, you can join student ID with another table's student number. These two may be the same, just that they are called differently due to historical reasons. Similarly, sometimes a course ID can be called course code or course session, and you can still join, although they have different names. There's another scenario of joining on different names, which is what we will call self-join, meaning one table joining itself. And like when it joins itself, it uses different keys within itself. When the table is referencing itself, for example, we have an employee table with an employee and a supervisor. Now supervisor itself is also an employee. So supervisor also have a supervisor. If I want to find the supervisor of supervisors, what can I do? Apparently, I need to place this supervisor as if they were employee, and I will match these supervisors against our own employee table, uh, employee column. So what I'm going to do here is to select something, select a supervisor from one employee table, join another employee table. And the employee table on the left is the employee's table, is the employee entity, and the employee table on the right is the supervisor entity, where all the employees in this right table are actually, are actually the supervisors. So here, we are matching the left table supervisor against the right table's employee. In this example, Alice matches Alice, and the bill through supervisor Alice joins to the supervisor of supervisor Rachel. That's how it works in self-join. In self so let's go to Oracle Live SQL and create some example. Let's create two tables first. Talking about joining on multiple tables and multiple columns, we have two tables, sample one and sample two. In sample one, we have one, one, two, two, three, three. And in sample two, we have one, one, two, 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 three, and four, four. Now, what if we join them on both ID one and ID two? Creating the table, insert the, insert the data, and let's see. So one one matches one one, two two matches two two. This is one matching, this is another matching, and uh, here, two three, three three and two three doesn't match, two two and two three doesn't match. That's why this is not selected, and four four or three three has no matching in the other table. 
And that's the result of one, 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 and a two, 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 two. That's a multi-table, multi-column join. Let's also go through an example of self-join. Within self-join, let's create an employee table that we just show in the PowerPoint. Employee and the supervisor, and we insert Bill, Alice, Tom, Alice, and Alice, Rachel. Now, if we align employee table E, let's see E dot S and S dot star. From one employee table, which provides the supervisor matching supervisor tables employee, what is going to be showing? And you can see here, this is from the employee table and this is the employee supervisor table. Bill supervises Alice. So as an employee, Alice supervisor is Rachel. If we remove this, to the, this one and this one, then we have a matching between employee and the supervisor supervisor. That's Bill and Rachel and Tom and Rachel. So much is for self-join. All right, I will see you in next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to talk about join on key. So, so far we have been talking about all the regular joins, either through the same table or column name or through a different table or column name. The similarity is there's always this on clause where you define which column to match the other when you do the join, when you put two tables together. Now, what if we forgot we forget the own class. It will become Celestar from course join instructor. Remember we talked about how join is performed. We will match each row in one table to each row in another table. This will be a mathematical product of this, uh, or we call Cartesian product between two tables where each row meets the other one. If the first the table have M rows, and the second table has n rows. The result will be m times n rows table, right? And if your m or n is big, you can result in a huge table. Because of this, modern DBMS usually don't allow this. They won't allow you to do a from course join without their own. However, you can still do it with where. If you put a from table comma table, Without the where clause, you can still result in a Cartesian product. That's another reason we always want to do a join because we don't want you to accidentally write some, write some Cartesian join and returning a million rows. But there's another scenario in which if you are joining on multiple columns, if you're supposed to join on multiple columns, but only join on one of them. So then neither side is unique, uh, neither side is unique. That will happen a partial cross join. For example, if the instructors join itself or affiliation, we know there are multiple affiliations, uh, uh, multiple Jedi and multiple Sis, then for each Jedi, they will join with other Jedi. For each this, they will join in with all other this. This is still based on sum of condition, which means there's still a join between affiliations. So it's not a completely Cartesian join. That's why it's called partial cross join. This can be helpful if you want to find the matching to, to form a pair of Jedi's or a pair of cis. An example here, Table one and table two, both table one and table two have an ID one twice, but two only two only once. So when table one joins table two, the two ones in table one will match with the two ones in table two. The first one in table one will first join the this one. Let me try to mark it so it looks easier. So the first one 
will try to join this first, this one first, then it will go through one and this one more. Now let's change the color. And this is the second row of one, which is one more. It will join this one once. Then it will join this one one more. That's when you have four rows, which is two times two equals to four. This is a part uh, partial cross join. Because of this, we will usually require a join has to be on key, otherwise there will be duplicated value. The join key usually should be the primary key of one of the two key tables, or at least the candidate key. Otherwise, there will be duplicated values, and the, the duplicated values from two tables will cause a partial cross join. If the, if the join key is the primary key of one table, it's a called foreign key on the other table because from the other table side, the, side, the key comes from a foreign table. So this is called foreign key. You can add certain column constraint or table constraint designated some columns to be foreign key. And once you add the foreign key constraint, all the values in this column must be coming from the other table. This is used to restrict the value in the foreign table to the foreign table. All values must be valid. Let's try do some joins using Oracle Live SQL. First, let's see what if I'm trying to join without the own. So now I'm having a select star from one table, separated by comma, and uh, another table. Normally, I should have a where clause specifying a join, but uh, right now I forgot about it. So I run it. You can see that for each and every row call course ID, one, two, three, four, six, it matches one instructor. For another one, two, three, four, five, six course ID, it matches another instructor, and so on and so forth. For Yoda, for Darcidius, this is what we call cross join uh, or a Cartesian join, Cartesian join, Cartesian uh, product join. Now, if you have a very justified reason to do this, you can specify cross join. you will get the same result, 24 rows. So SQL specifically asks you to put a cross here if you really want to do a cross join. If you do not specify a cross, SQL would think you made a mistake for getting the own and would not allow you to do that. This is the protection mechanism SQL placed in case you made a mistake because you, there are rarely any opportunity that there will, a cross-joining will happen. That's why SQL think it's easier to restrict you on the cross-joining side than allowing you to do that. But still, if you really want to do that, you have to specify, you can have to explicitly put a cross there and tell in SQL, you do want to do it. Okay, so much is for cross-joining. Okay, let's do some partial cross join. Let's create some table first. So this is the sample table that we created with two IDs and the first column uh, one, 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 right? Now, if I run all of them, 
and I join them on ID one. What will happen? You can see that for one, one on one, it joins twice. And for 102, it joins twice because there are another tables one and one. Or from the other table side, this one and 101 joins the other two, color, uh, two rows once. And uh, this row one and 102 joins the other table twice. And that's forming a two by two equals to four rows table. So these are the partial cross join and the Cartesian, uh, Cartesian product join. Remember, try to avoid it, always join on key. Unless you have a very justified reason, you should always join on a primary key of one table. All right, so much is uh, for join on key. I will see you in next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to talk about outer join. So let's re again, re let's review regular join. When we match course with an uh, instructor, we need to match inst uh, instructor name by instructor name. If an instructor name does not appear in another table, there will be no match and this will not show in the, <coughs> in the end result. For example, instructor with no course in course table will be ignored. Result is the common set between the two tables, which is called inner join. What if we want to see all instructors, even for those with no course? For example, we know Anakin Skywalker is in his instructor's um, the list, but uh, he doesn't teach any course. Do we want to, what if we still want to show him and probably with the uh, now or zero in the course name field? In order to do that, to preserve all data from a certain table during join, we use what we call outer join. So in this example, for the two tables, original table blue, original table blue and original green. If a blue joins green and only these three rows match, then this is inner join. Inner join only keep these three that uh, we have common, common join key in the two tables. If we want to do a left outer join from this side and keeping all in the blue rows in the blue table and only the common ones in the green table. This is called left outer join where we preserve all data from the left table. And uh, if there's no data, it will be now. The opposite of left outer join is right outer join, where you keep everything in the right table, whereas the left table only kept the common tables and the common rows. And if there's no data in the left, table, we will place now there. And combining left join and outer join, right join, we get a full outer join. Full outer join means preserve the data for, from both left table and the right table, right? So let's see an example. If we are selecting from instructor, left outer join course. <clears throat> the syntax will be from table one, left outer join table two. That's a left outer join. And uh, all the column, all the rows in table one will be preserved. All the instructors will showing up in the, in the end table, in the end result. Whereas from only the common tables, the common rows, from course where instructor name exists in instructor will show up for course. We can also simplify this join key, join key keyword as left join. 
which is okay too. Now to note, this left and right is based on front join. If you move this up, instructor on the left and the course on the right, the order in the own class does not matter. Repeat, left and the right is based on the front and join clause. The order in the own clause doesn't matter. So once we do this, select from instructor, outer join, left outer join the course, data from left table will be preserved, all instructors will show up. If there's no matching data from the right table, this course name will show now. This comes from right table, right? If there's no matching instructor in the instructor table, this course will show, uh, if there's no matching course name for the instructor, this field will show now. There are three types of auto joins, and left, right, and full. And when you do this, either left or right, you just, or, or full, you simply replace the word left with right or full from the format which is discussed before. You just replace this with right or full in order to get your type, uh, type of auto join. One thing to note is left auto join and the right auto join are actually reversible. T1 left join T2 equals to T2 right join T1, right? So these are the things that we want to pay attention to. Now let's look at some examples from life sequel. So let's first compare the result of this. First, let's get uh, whatever we show in the in a PowerPoint. Now, note here is a left auto join, left from instructor to course. So every data from instructor should be re should remain, and uh, only the common data in course will will be will be remaining. And if an instructor does not have a course, then this course name from right table will show us now. And the order is defined by from and the, jo and the join. Whatever order in the select statement, in the select course, or in the own co class does not matter, right? You can see this here, course is on the left, here course is on the left, but doesn't matter. The left auto join is based on the from class and the join class, so the left table is in instructor. Let's run it. And you can see Anakin Skywalker as an instructor doesn't have any course. So it shows as now. Now let's perform another left auto join, but this time it's from course to instructor. What will happen? Every course will show up and only those Instructors with courses will show up here. So Anakin Skywalker should not show up anymore. But instead, some courses that without instructor that defined in this table will have a now instructor name. For example, there's moisture farming for dummies. There's no Jedi or Sith teaching. So there's no instructor belonging to here. That's the the other right, the other way of joining. Now we also talk about left auto join and the right auto join. If you are in this example, we are left auto join from instructor to course, which means if we are right auto join from course to instructor, we should see the same thing, right? So from here is a course, right auto join instructor. And these two should be equivalent. Let's run both. And the answer is yes. They are the same. All right. So much is for auto join. I will see you in next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to talk about how to filter from another table. So we already have uh, done this before in the in sub query. How do we use the result of a query in another query's in class? 
we will put the first query in parentheses and place it in the second query. We, <clears throat> so here we have this select from course where instructor name in select instructors from instructors affiliation equals to Jedi. That basically gives us all the courses taught by Jedi affiliated instructors, right? So how do you associate? Now that we have learned join and we can think from a way of uh, two, how two tables are interacting with each other. How do you associate data from one table to another? When you associate data from one table to another, you always need to do it via a common column. So here, this one is instructor. Instructor here from a course and the instructor here from instructor. And we match them by using uh, in select. And that's exactly what join does too, which means for in subquery, we can always convert it into a join. And this is what we do here. And if we compare this one against the other one, this is the course instru uh, instructor name. And we keep it here in the own class. And this is the instructor instructor name. And we put it here also as another condition of the in, in class. And the where condition, now becomes a part of the mainstream, the main query where. So this is how we associate two tables, either by joining, by joining with the own class, you associate two tables through own class, or you join them by using an uh, in select subquery, where you put these two associations before and after in. And there are three ways actually to filter data using another table's data. The first method is use the where in subquery clause, which we covered just now. The, other, the second method is join two tables together and filter on the join data set. And the third method is use where exists. Exists check the result of a correlated subquery, subquery with a correlation condition between, two, uh, between main query and subquery. Still, it's the same that you are using a condition to associate two tables. It will be same as the own clause in join between the two related tables. So here, this is how exists is defined. You will do a where exists Select star from one table. How do you associate these two tables together? You will associate them by defining a where clause inside the exists query, where one table's column equals to another. So there are, as you can see, these are matching records. There are matching columns and patterns that you can use to convert among these three. It's the same process in execution where the outside query or the join, uh, join slab table will be executed row by row. For each row in the outside query or the join table, DBMS will go through the inner query or join the table row by row matching outside queries, current row, and apply where clause. So there are similarities in execution. There are matching values in another table. If a select contains information from both tables, you have to use join, because when you do select, you cannot select from subquery, right? So join is the only way where you need information from both tables. But uh, if you are only select from one main table, you can use either in or exist or join. In most cases, if you use in or exist, you can also use join. How about the performance? Which one should you use? Which one should you use is based on logic and uh, the performance. So logic, if, if logic is identical, performance is the only thing you need to consider, but the reason that we have these three 
listed all together is because there's really no significant difference between each of them. The performance really depends on your DBMS setup. So you have to use trial and error to determine which one to use. Let's use an example to explain. So we have Oracle Live SQL. We have this uh, select. Let me make it more readable by adding indents. So it's a select from course where instructor name in select instructor name from inst instructor. I can run this, no problem. If I want to join, so how do we trans transform this? We will still have a select from course. Now, we want to join on this <coughs> on the second tip. <coughs> and then we already know it's associated through this instructor name column. So we will do on. Of course, we need to add C and I. And finally, we will put a where clause. Now that this where clause is applicable to the outside call, the outside query, so you will put like I dot affiliation equals Jedi. So this is how we do it. We move the inner query into join and we put the association, the column association into the on clause as a join condition. <coughs> If I run all, both at the same time, it's actually returning similar things, same rows, but it's also returning information from instructor table. That's what I mean by if you want to see the table, the, the, the information from both tables, you need to use join because in when you are using the subquery, the outside select will not see whatever is in subquery. It only sees whatever is outside in the main query. Now let's do a select exist. Similarly, we will do select from course where, this is where it different, exists. And again, we have a Parent, uh, include everything in parentheses, that's a subquery. And you can already foresee that this, this uh, select, without running that, you can foresee that uh, this select will only return the course table columns, right? Now, for this exists, we want to select star from the same table. Add this where which is the original condition. And let's add the, uh, the association columns where it should be, if I put a C here and I here, or you can use the table name if you want, but the, basically the association table, uh, associate column association is the same. Uh, I should uh, run all three, all, all three at the same time. So that you can see, first, in and the select returning the same thing, and the uh, second one returns both tables, right? So they are equivalent in execution. As uh, SQL goes more complex, you, as you involve more tables <clears throat> and more where conditions, you may need to choose among in or exist or join. Um, but I, like we said, you need to choose based on performance and sometimes you need to try an error. There's no universal answer on which one you should choose. All right, so much for filtering from another table. I will see you in next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to talk about non-equal join. Non-equal join, as the name suggests, means when you join, you are not using the equal sign for the join condition. So you will associate two tables with non-equal operators, greater two or less than between an end. 
non equate join can be uh, is applicable in many different uh, scenarios. Frequently, most frequently scenario is in slow changing dimension, which means values change over time. For example, a coupon may have a effective date and the termination date. So if you want to check transaction, whether you apply the coupon or not, you may want to use an, first of all, you need to join on a coupon ID, make sure the transaction is actually using this coupon. Then you want to confirm the transaction date is between the effective date and termination date. Similarly, you might also be using greater than or less than, depends on your scenario. We're not going to cover much about this because this is uh, this non-equal join as, as we can see is a scenario by scenario, but basically when you see non-equal join, you, you do it, you analyze it the same way as we analyze the normal join. Remember, it's always select from one table, row by row, pick the row, pick one row at a time, and match it with every row in another table. And then here you apply the join condition the same way as you apply where condition, where clause. Both uh, matching on coupon ID and the matching on transaction date and the other two dates. This is how you handle non equal join. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, you can leave a message and let me know. Otherwise, we will go to the next question, next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to introduce view. So we are already using subqueries in work clause, and uh, basically subqueries returns you a list of items of a, uh, of rows. <clears throat> a set of rows and columns, which is uh, based uh, fundamentally a small table. Now, subqueries can also be used in the from join clause too, as the data set to be selected from. For example, in this, in this SQL, we have a subquery, select star from instructor, where instructor affiliation equal to Jedi. Inside the parenthesis with the S Jedi instructor, <laughs> this table alias. So you can do select instructor name from this to the, this the table. And you can also run other SQL queries when you put this parenthesis and subquery inside the other SQL queries. You can put this in the from and you can put this into join. Now naturally the question comes up, what if I want to use this in many different places? What if I want to reuse this subquery? SQL provides this functionality to define a view, to store a select statement and make it easier to remember and use. It's also a way to reuse subquery. <coughs> so you will do by starting with a create view keyword, followed by a view name, and the op optionally you can have a column list, defining which columns are in this view, followed by the S keyword, and then your subquery. Your, your sub column list is used to define column names. You are not supposed to put the data type there. And views can be altered and dropped too. <clears throat> Another topic is uh, updating view. In general, you should avoid updating views and some DBMS don't even allow you to update. But there are scenarios where you only you can only see views. You cannot only see, you cannot see the underlying table. In this case, you may want to update. If you want to update a, a view that's based on one single table, that's doable. If a DBMS allows it, you can update the row and column. And if you update some columns, that if you update some columns in the view, other columns that's not in the view will be populated with now. You can update in join based views, but this can cause confusion on which table to update. Because if I'm updating, for example, instructor name, what is the table that's containing this instructor name? If I use both course and instructor in the view, so this is not recommended. It won't, uh, won't always work. Similarly, you are not supposed to update aggregation views because 
aggregation views, the result comes from aggregation. If I'm updating, I'm trying to update the sum of a tuition. Where should I update it to? Should I update it in one column, uh, one row, and make all the change there in that row? Or should I spread the change over all the rows involved in this group by? There's no fixed question, fixed definition on that. So in general, you should avoid updating views and uh, you should always avoid updating join based views or aggregation views. Let's try one example of creating view in Oracle Live SQL. So this is the query we talked about, select star from instructors, where instructor affiliation equals to Jedi. We will create a view. This is a keyword. This is a table. This is a view name, Jedi instructor S. Run it, and the view is created. You can use the same you can use the view same place as in the other tables. I can select star from this Jedi view. Oops. And once I select them, I may want to wear instructor name equals to or like Yoda percent. And it's returning only Yoda. Now, you can use all the uh, where, group by, join, having, order by on a view, same as if they are table. The difference between a view and table is that view, as you can see, is based on a query. You are not inserting data into view. View is just a query sitting there. Every time you run to select something from a view or update something from the view, or a DBMS will run the query and fetch the data. And as if it's actually something running inside. For example, here, if you think about how DBMS execute that, DBMS actually will replace this view name with a view definition. I'm not sure whether you can run this. I believe you have to have an S something. Oh, so Oracle actually can, can accept it, right? So it's a select star from, in some, in some DBMS, you have to have an alias. In that case, it will be a dot. Select where. So this is what the view is, uh, and how Oracle or D, in DBMS in general parses view. They will just replace the view definition, the view name with a view definition and the star try to run this SQL. In this case, it will be this simple subquery. All right, so much is for the view. I will see you in next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to go through non-permanent table. So when you run Oracle SQL or actually any DBMS, when you run the SQL, sometimes you need to store temporary data somewhere in your user session. And that's when you need to use a permanent table. Oracle provides the functionality called temporary table. Now actually, all DBMS provide this functionality of temporary table, which exists only for the user session. You log in, you create a table, it exists until you log out. Once you log out, DBMS will automatically drop this temp table. So it is only used for you to do some temporary storage. If you want to keep the data after you log out in the database, you need to use a regular table. However, the syntax 
on creating temporary table is vendor specific. Oracle's syntax may not be working in SQL Server and vice versa. That's why we are just going to briefly introduce the idea of this temporary table. If you want to use that, you need to consult to your uh, DBMS vendor manual on how to create that. In Oracle, it will be create global temp table. Instead of create table, you add a global temporary in front of, between create and the table. Then the rest is the same. The rest is the same as regular create table statement. You will call it the my temp table or whatever. You can even call it my permanent table. But if you have a global temporary definition there, once you log out, this table will be dropped. Another interesting topic is common table expression or CTE. Common table expression is uh, created as a part of query. It's actually a subquery. For example, here we have two CTEs. Both are subqueries. You define them as a part of the query. So this CTE and CTE2, CTE1 and CTE2 are both defined before the main query, where in the main query, you will use CTE1 and CTE2 as subquery. This is actually very similar to the definition of view. And the Oracle will, uh, or DBMS will handle it the same way as view. It will co uh, copy this CTE definition into here. And uh, this query definition, this, uh, uh, this uh, CTE definition into here. When they start running this uh, main query. So it's uh, the difference between CTE and the view is that it's created a as a part of a query. So it's effective only for a specific query. Once you stop running specific query, this CT definition is gone. But why would you want uh, some uh, temporary query? There are multiple reasons for it. Sometimes you don't have the authority to create the view. Sometimes you're, you have a huge query where the same definition of a query is used again and again. As the same subquery is used again and again in multiple places. And sometimes, and the other reason is sometimes you want to use a recursive data set. How to use uh, CTE and uh, how to create, how and why to create recursive data set is uh, beyond scope of uh, this course. If you are interested, you, you can Google that. It should be easier for you to understand based on all the uh, SQL fundamentals we have already learned. All right, so much is for the non-permanent tables. We will, I will see you in next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to go through stored procedure. Stored procedure is a very important component of SQL. I would estimate half of the SQL usage is stored procedure. It basically put a series of SQL statements together in order and uh, execute, uh, execute them one by one to achieve a certain functionality. But uh, as important as it is, we won't cover that in depth in this course because first of all, it's essentially a combination of simple SQL statements, everything we have already taught in this class before. Also, the syntax of defining a store procedure is highly vector, uh, vendor specific. But the, luck, the good thing is the basic logic is the same. So we are going to go through some store procedure examples so that you know what it is and how to use them. And uh, in case you need to use them, you need to consult your owner's specific manual to have an understanding of uh, the store procedure function and the syntax in your particular DBMS. So, so when you use stop procedure, you basically define a series of SQL statements. You also need to define parameters. This parameter, some of the parameters, you will pass in so that the SQL statement can run against a certain value. Some of the parameters will be out so that it will return a value you can use once the source procedure is completed. 
stop procedure usually is done you doing some select or update or insert functionality. You can also do create and drop or delete in these procedures. However, you should avoid creating permanent objects in store procedure. If you have to create some tables, remember to use the temporary tables. So let's go to Oracle Live SQL again. And let's bring up some store procedure examples. This is the first store procedure we will introduce. It basically have two components. One is a select statement. Second is that this put line is similar to print. So the procedure have two parameters. One is the input parameter, of course ID. Another is the output parameter, of course name. When you run this stop procedure, you specify the course ID, the input value. And in the first statement, select statement, DBMS will select course name from course table where course ID equals to your input parameter of course ID. And uh, whatever course name you find out, it will be saved into the V course name output variable for your for you to use and also it will also print out the v course name now let's create a procedure and uh, let's create generate a sql statement to run this stop procedure and as you can see when you run this stop procedure you specify one, which is the course ID. You also specify R, which we declined, uh, we declared before, as a <coughs> as a course name. So after execution, R in this variable R, we will have the course name returned, which mapping to the course ID one. But in our case, we are not using this R. We just uh, run this procedure and uh, check the put line, the, uh, the print output. Let's run this stop procedure. And that's what you see, introduction to the force. So this is a select, select the, <coughs> the procedure, which will select things into certain values. A more common usage of stop procedure is to update a table. And in this particular case, we create this procedure and have an input of course name, course ID, and the course name. Both are input parameters. We will update course table, set the course name equals to the course name you specified, where the course ID equals to the course ID you specified. So this update course will update course table on the row where course equals to your input parameter and update the name per your request. So let's create the start procedure and let's run this by using a begin end. In this update, we will change course ID one course name to my new course. So once we are done with running this, procedure, let's select star from course and look at the, the row where course ID equals to one. So now the row ID equals to one have my new course. All right, so much is for store procedure. Just remember it's important, but uh, due to it's a highly <laughs> vector vendor specific, we're not covering that, but uh, you should know what it is. It's a combination of uh, SQL statements. Uh, and the, what it does is it can run these statements per your input. Okay, I will see you in next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to talk about cursor. So let's talk about procedural processing of data. So far, all SQL statements that we have learned work on data sets. And when we talk about sets, set, all set-based algorithms cannot handle processing between rows. 
for example, you want to get um, the difference between this row versus the other. Because there's no such thing as order between objects in the set. So you still need to have a procedural processing capability if you want to do row by row calculation. In SQL, in traditional SQL, this is done using cursor. Cursor will go through, will define a data set and process one row at a time. And this is the cursor definition. And just like a store procedure, cursor definition is highly vendor specific, but the basic logic is the same. We should define cursor based on query. Usually, it uh, comes with an order by, so that you know which, uh, or which row you should be expecting. Then you will start or initialize the cursor. Literally means loading the data into the cursor. Then you will loop through each row in the cursor to process each row. And usually, you will store previous rows in variables inside the processing, if necessary. Let's go to Oracle Live SQL, and uh, we will do some experiments. So this is the cursor example. What it does, this is the declaration part. You have the select star from course, ordered by course ID. So it's uh, ordered by primary key, getting every, each and every row from course. This is your dec declaration. And within, oops. oh, I shouldn't select only because the beginning part, beginning and end is the part of this cursor execution. And this cursor is actually defined on top of this beginning end. But uh, once you have the cursor, you can go through for a course, each course in the C course cursor, it loops through and the print out the course name. So let's run this cursor, this begin end. And that's exactly what it does. My new course, which we changed in our previous section, moisture farming, da 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 da, all these things, right? So much of this is for cursor. Um, cursor is useful if you want to process row by row. Of course, here we are just printing out the course, uh, course name. But if you want to have a variable containing the uh, holding previous course names and doing comparison, that's, that's perfectly fine. And that's exactly what uh, people have, have been using this for. But note, uh, there are two things to note. First of all, cursor provides you a procedural pr pr processing power, but you do not necessarily need to have this power. A lot of people, a lot of students, they try to use, uh, they come from a Python or Java programming background. So they tend to think all of the data processing are, are procedural row by row, which is not true. When you do processing, always think first from a set operation part, using regular SQL to do set processing, it will be much faster and much simpler. Only when you need to do row, row by row processing, comparing between rows, that's the only time you need to do cursor. Which brings up our second topic, that cursor is used less frequently, less and less frequently these years. And the reason is because there's another powerful tool coming up, which is the window functions, which we'll cover in next lecture. I'll see you in next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to talk about window functions. What is the window function? Window functions return one value for each input row and a set of rows affiliated with that row, usually ordered. This set of rows is called a window. That's how window functions get its name. So comparing to aggregation functions, aggregation functions return one row for a set of rows, Whereas the window function return one row for each input row. But of course, this input row has some, has a set of rows associated with it. Let's use an example, which is rank. We are trying to identify for each student, what's the highest, 
what's the rank of tuition on, on course? Or I should say, for each student, what's the rank of course based on tuition? So what we are doing here is we have a partition by student name. This partition by student name basically defines the windows. The window is divided by student name. Each window has one student name. And within this window, we have a course name and the tuition. We will rank all the course based on tuition descending. This is how you get a rank for each student. This rank is probably the most useful window function. There are more to window functions. And in general, we have a series of row level window functions. Number one is row level, uh, row number, which will return. Once you order, it will return the ID in which you increment row by row, starting maybe usually by default start with one, so that you know which row you are in if you want to perform row calculations between rows. Then you have rank we just talked about, and we have dense rank. Dense rank differs from rank in, on how it handles equal values when it does ranking. We have n tile, which will separate a data set into n groups based on the <coughs> ranking. And similarly, we have percent rank, and we also have lag and lead, which calculate between different rows. So these are the row level window functions. They handle differences between rows, like rank or percentage. There's also something called running or moving calculation. A running calculation start from the beginning of the data set window, data window. For example, a running sum for inventory. Inventory start usually starts with zero. Then once you have an increase or decrease, you keep on adding up from the beginning of time. This is the, what we call running sum. There's also something called a moving sum or moving average. A very useful financial indicator is a moving 10-day average or moving 5-day average. This means a sliding 5-day window in which you calculate your average. The moving average, the moving 5-day average of yesterday starting from 6 days before today and with uh, one day before today which is yesterday. Then the moving five day average of today, starting with five days before and ends today, which is the zero day before today. Then the moving average of tomorrow, starting with uh, four days before today and one day after today. This is how we calculate the moving average. Let's use a rank example. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the window function example. Let's go to live SQL. Then this is the student name and this is the course name. We partition by student name, which uh, uh, defines the window. All the course name and the tuition pairs of each student. Then we order by tuition. Course will be marked with a rank. And here is the result. For Leos Skywalker, there are two rows. Properly speaking, has the highest tuition. Introduction to the fourth has the second. And similarly for Luke. So you divide it, your, the window is based on each student. Within this window, you have two rows calculating the rank and or three rows calculating the rank. That's how Windows work, the function works. All right, so much for Windows function. I will see you in next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to go through DBMS operations. These are the operations. In addition to SQL query execution, the DBMS performs in order to make that system up and running and available and secure. These operations are highly vendor specific. 
for this reason, we're not going to go into, into depths on how to perform each, uh, each functionality. However, we are going to tell you what it is and what it covers. So the first topic we cover is system catalogs. There's a central location in any DBMS to store all related information in DBMS, like uh, what tables do we have? What tables have you created? What are their definitions? How many columns we have? If you remember Oracle Life SQL, there's a schema, a schema tab in way, from which you can see how many tables and uh, each table structure. All these comes from this system catalog. In addition to table definition, system catalog also checks user. How many users are there? Who can access them? What is the last time someone read or, from or write to this table? All these activities are logged into system catalog. If you are a database administrator, you will rely heavily on system catalogs. But the name, the table name of system catalog differs from DBMS to DBMS. So you will need to consult your owner's manual in order to understand your own DBMS. The next question we talked about is security. Security controls who can do what action to which object. And in our database's specific case, who is the identity? It's the user. You log in as yourself. Someone logging as himself or herself. And uh, what you can do? Maybe the administrator can do drop table and a normal user can only do select table, select from. And which means access. I can see all the tables as an administrator, while the other student can only see his or her own tables. He, cannot, he or she cannot see other students' tables. This is access. That means that who can do what to which object. We, do, we control the security by, use, by creating users and the grant or deny access to or from objects. For example, I can grant select on certain table to, to myself or revoke delete on certain table to student one. These are the securities you need to control. And this is the part of uh, administrator's daily work. Another thing administrators always does is to define index. What is index? Index is a, is a lookup list for row entries to speed up SQL execution. By default, all tables are indexed by primary keys. If you want to define on other index on other columns, you need to explicit, uh, explicitly define them. And usually, index are commonly defined on foreign keys to help join. Now, index is more art than technical in most cases. But uh, these years, as artificial intelligence picks up, we see more and more databases claim they can do, they can, they can do query optimization without indexing. So again, you need to go consult your own DBMS yes, manual to see what you can do or what you cannot do on this index front. And finally, we have this integrity constraints, which will control what can be placed into a column. You can have primary key, which means this column is a primary key, and you can have a not now, which means this column cannot contain any now, which these two we already covered. And you can also have others like unique, means the value in this column has to be unique. And the foreign key means this column should uh, have the same value as the primary key of another table. And check is more flexible. You can define value range. You can define something like like or between and. All this, you can check on your owner's menu and make sure how this works in your system. All right, so much is for DBMS operations. We will not go into, like we said, we are not going into detail because these are highly vendor specific. Make sure you consult your owner's manual and understand what, what is going on. 
Okay, and in next lecture, we're going to talk about a final project and uh, I'll see you there. In this lecture, we're going to have a quick final review. We're going to review what we have learned and we're going to lay out a plan for the final project. So we talked about SQL in this throughout this course. We talked about data life cycle. Um, how data exists in computer system. It starts with the create, then followed by read and update, and ends up with delete. And we have a corresponding SQL statement for each of this stage. We have a create and state statements for the create stage. We have a select statement for the read stage. We have alter, update, insert, and delete for updating data. And finally, we have a drop statement for delete. This is the general life, generic life cycle of data in any computer system. We just use our corresponding SQL statement to make this functionality available in a relational database. As for the final project, we will still use the same insurance claim invoice example, but this time because we already go through the midterm project of creating table and the populating data, I will give you a set of SQLs to create and populate the tables. You just need to write statement for insert for a plot of a select statements. So this is the original data and we have a claim invoice with a customer, which is a patient and the provider. Provider also have a provider association associated with it. And this is a data model of a patient is a one-to-many parent of claim. Provider is a one-to-many parent of claim and provider association is one-to-many parent of claim. And we will go through the questions too. So here I already provide you with the create tables statements and the delete statement and insert statements. There are 20 questions in total. All of them are some kind of a select. You will get a list of the providers. You will check how many claims and find out this and find out that. And eventually, you will go through all the group by and join statements we talked about in the second half of the discourse. And finally, you will do a one window function and the one stop procedure. All right, have fun with this project. So in this lecture, well, I'm going to go through my sample answer to the final project questions. And again, data modeling is a part of art, part, of, part of technology. So there might be many different answers to the same question, whereas the, all the answers may be correct. I'm just showing you what I think is correct, what the, the way I look at the question. Uh, and feel free to come up with your answer. And if you think my answer, my question, my answers are not correct, feel free to raise it. So first of all, let's create tables and insert data. This already provided in the question in the text file. So let's create the tables, insert the data. Now let's start working on the questions. So the first question is, get the list of all providers, ID only, provider ID, in claim table. That means, what, select provider ID from claim. And it says each date, each data only show showing once, uh, that's a typo, but uh, you get what it means. So what should we use? We should use select distinct. That's right. And apparently it works. So the second question says, check how many claims the claim table contains, which will bring up select 
count. And we can use count star because this in within this claim table, each row is a claim. So here we can use a count star. If we have a claim ID as a primary key, then yes, you can also use select count claim ID. Count star is basically the same as count primary key because primary key will not be now. And let's run this. And it works as four rows. Now questions number three, find out the highest coverage of patient for each provider. So coverage is one field. Highest coverage means maximum coverage. Of course, you need to do select. But it says for each provider, what does that mean? If you still remember how to write a SQL, we mentioned that for each provider it means you should group by. Provider ID, right? So we will also put whatever is in group by call uh, to group group by to a select. Uh, I missed the L. That's why it's the color is not right. So we run this, and for each provider, we get a maximum of a coverage. Question number five: For each provider, find out the patient count. Oops. I didn't really this down. And the question number four, for each provider, find out the unique patient count. What does unique count, uh, patient count mean? That means it's a count distinct patient ID, right? It should be from claim. Only That's the only place where provider and the patient meets. And we already said it's uh, for each provider. So it's group by per provider ID. And whatever you put in the group by, don't forget to put it into the select. So number question number five, it says, same thing for each provider, find out the patient counting history. However, it does not mention it's a unique patient. So in this case, we will just use a regular count instead of a count distinct. You want to run this. What if we run both? So the first row is returns 211. The second row also returns 211. So because that's due to our data, there's no duplicated patient for each provider. Now, question number six. For each patient with total fee charged less than 200, total fee charged means the sum of, to of uh, fee charged. Sum of fee charged less than 200, what does that mean? It means it must be in the having clause. And the once you see having, and you also see for each patient, that means it's a group by patient ID, which should also be in Select. And it's apparently it's a from claim table. It says find the total balance, right? So that means for each patient, you need to find the total balance. Total means sum. So there's only one patient with a fee charge less than 200. And for this particular patient, the sum of balance is 30. Question number seven, list all provider association names with the count of their provider. That means it's a provider association. This is from this table. 
where you have the association name, right? You also need to count provider, right? That means you are counting provider name or ID, let's just put ID. But uh, once you see this provider ID, it comes from provider table, which means you need to join these two tables. So if you still remember, once you identify the tables involved, you need to put a one off the front and let's put a PA as the alias and join, let's put a PA alias. And once you have all join, of course you will have own PA dot association name, I think. Association ID actually equals to Once you have this join and you have association name and the count provide ID, you also need to group by association ID name and put select. That will list all association names with the count of their providers. All right. So question number eight, find out the provider association in which claim count is more than one, sorted by registration count and hide this first. Okay, so that means find out the provider association. You need to group by provider association in which claim count, because basically you have a count, right? That means the count star, For each provider, there will be association. Association name count. And apparently, association comes from, association name comes from association table. And the count comes from claim table. So you need to join from claim to provider association table. However, there's no way we can join these two because they don't have common columns. That means we need to find some other table in the between so that we can join. And we all know this should be provider table. So C joins P first. So, so P and then P can join PA. Let's copy this over. Now, once you have a group, uh, this will be select. And don't forget PA dot PA association and count star. Now, once you have this join and group by, don't remember, don't forget which claim count is more than one. And uh, that brings up having and uh, you need to sort it. Remember to put order by. I see students using sort by or sorted by. Order by is the only one. And the once you want to use order by, you need to order by count first. And because height is first, it should be descending. And I believe I made a mistake here. It's not registration count, it's claim count. I copy this from my my data academy, the data force academy questions. 
So this is how we do it. Let's run. And that's the result. Okay. Question number nine. List all patient names and each patient's total balance. So there will be total balance is sum of balance which comes from claim table and the patient name. And patient name comes from patient table. So there's the claim and the patient, right? Then we also be asked about provide the association's name starting with C, which means we will need to go into the association table. That means we will have a claim table, patient table, provider table, and the provider association table. So let's put the uh, patient that we use PT. C and there will be PT dot <clears throat> there will be from claim join patient on C dot patient ID equals to PT dot then this becomes a star join, or we can even say that's a snowflake join because now we have a provider ID equals to P dot provide ID. Now we have a chain join here from provider to provider association. We have the from and join, and we need to have a where, right? Where association name is it comes from PA. So, association name star with C, like C percent. I hope you still remember why we are doing this. And now you need to group by patient name. And don't forget to select. So this brings up a snowflake join with where cross. Where from join on and where forms the detailed data set and the group by will give you the aggregation. This is how you get it. Okay, question number 10. List all patient names and each patient's total balance for patient with balance more than 10. Patients with balance more than 10 that apparently comes from claim table. And then you have a patient name. And you also need to list the patient names and uh, total balance, sum of balance, right? So once you have this, this column and table, you know you should start with the from, joining patient, let me copy this over, don't need to type this anymore, uh, again, and uh, it will be PT dot patient name is where I want to group by. And uh, make it more complicated is that uh, for patients with balance more than 10 that will bring up having, because it's a total balance more than 10 for each patient. That's why it's having, it's not a where. More than 10. And we do a select.
and it, yes, uh, balance is 30 and 111. Now, number 11, list all providers' name with their provider association names. If the provider association's name does not exist in provider association table, show now for the name. What does that mean? That means it's the outer join. Show now for it, for, for, for the missing name, right? So we will do a provider, joining provider, um, ADSP, joining provider, association, PA, be from, is that left join or right join? Because it says if the provider association name does not exist, that means the provider, all the information in provider must be showing where provider association's name can be different, can be missing. So it's a left join from provider to association. Uh, we can still copy this join on. And we need to select p dot provider name and the pa dot association name. Right? So let's run this SQL and we will see some nows. Yes, we see only one, right? Now the next question, number 12 says, redo question number 11 using different approach. And the way I mean that is that we should use, uh, we can use right join. Instead of left, but uh, once you change that to right join, you need to switch these two tables so that you are still joining from provider and keep all the data in provider. And uh, for missing data in provider association, you can use now, right? And we're getting the same data. Okay, question number 13, list all provider names if a provider association name starts with C. Provider name and this provider association name come from two different tables. So you are displaying data from one table filtered by data from another. And the first thing come to your mind should be join. Where well, let's do a front join again. I just copy this over and remove the left of the join. This is the two tables joining and uh, we need to check for where ga dot association name like C percent. Again, if you don't know why we use this like C percent for question like starting with C, you need to go back and review the where cost session. Okay. Now the question comes, redo question number 13, use a different approach. And here we can use in. And how do we use in? We will select from provider where something in, in, right? What's this something? It will be what do we associate these two tables with, which is the association ID. And accordingly, we also need to specify select PAs association ID from this PA table. And don't miss this where clause. 
Oops. And question number 15 asks the same question using a still a different approach, which certainly brings up where it exists. So we will, what we are going to do is here, we will do where exists. And by doing exists, the first thing you do is to select star from another table, which is the provider association. And you need to apply the where clause first. And now you need to associate main query and sub query next. That's where you have the end. Now let's run all these three together at the same time and see the result. So the first one returns Maria, second one returns Maria, all of them return the same res result. So we know they are equivalent. This is question number 15. Question number 16, want us to create a view based on result of question number 16. Oops, I think I actually means number 15. Uh, not 16. Uh, actually, it was a high, high balance. That means it's uh, number 10. This is the, someone with the high balance. Which means the sum balance is greater than 110. Uh, okay, let's create a view. High balance patients, and because it has two columns, you can, you can just do things like the S. You can also, Add a column list, patient name, patient balance. And uh, that's how you define the view. View created. Number 17, find patient with a claim from provider one, but not claims, but no claims with provider two. So you will select patient ID, not JD, from claim where provider ID equals to one. And the other set is provider ID equals to two. So you should have someone from this one, but not this one. So you do that by adding minus. And when you run the result, when you run the SQL, the result will be this person, he or she only have one record in the claim table, which belongs to provider ID one. The other uh, patient in the claim table has both data from provider ID one and the provider ID two. So the question now is, redo question number 17, use a different approach. And by doing this, what I mean is, you can also use two where clauses. Uh, I mean, one same where clause, but you can use the and not operator between two tables, between two select in from subqueries. So that will be where patient ID in, this will be patient ID with a claim from provider one. And not patient ID equals to uh, select patient ID where provider ID equals to one, uh, equals to two, oops, two. 
So let's run both together and see the result. Oh, I think I missed, oh, I missed the patient ID in. So let's run this two statements together. Both return the same value, right? So question 19, you want to rank provider for each patient based on their balance highest first. So I'm going to just copy because this rank is a little bit, uh, you requires more typing. I'm just going to copy what uh, I have created before. It basically comes from the same rank function I introduced in the PowerPoint slide, where you have select patient ID uh, for each, uh, because you have this partition by, you have the patient ID, and you're breaking this into provide ID, uh, into, you're breaking the data set by patient ID. For each patient ID is a window. Within this window, you list the provider ID with the uh, balance, and order by balance, thus you get a balance list based on provider ID. Let's run this. For, for zero, zero, 001, providers three have the highest balance, provider two has the second high, highest balance, and provider one is lowest. Similarly, for number 20, so we just select and create table and create the stop procedure. Stop procedure created. Let's run stop procedure. It says user saw procedures to provide a 10% decrease to all the balances. Now, remember, this is the balance line. So it's a 19101 something. Let's run the update and let's select again. All these are updated, right? And the reason that it's updated is because in here, in this procedure, we have update claim set balance equals to balance times percent. This percentage is what we pass in. In this particular case, we're passing 0 0.9, meaning we want to have a 10% decrease. Okay, so far, this is all for our final project. In next lecture, we're going to give a really quick overview of where we are and where to go next. And that will sum up the whole lecture. I'll see you in next lecture. So by going into this lecture, you have already completed the whole content of this course. You have already learned all seven different SQL statements. And uh, now you will be able to write simple SQL queries against these particular questions. So what's your next step? Your next step should be putting your hands on more SQL questions and have more practice. SQL is a highly practical, highly hands-on skill. If you don't use that, you will forget very soon. So I recommend you either try to use it in your, at your work or you should find some other project to keep yourself fresh. All right, so much is for this course. Thank you and good luck.